The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 3, The Guillotine. Book 1, September. Chapter 1, The Improvised Commune. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Peter Dan. Book 1, Chapter 1. THE IMPROVISED COMMUNE Ye have roused her then, ye emigrants and despots of the world. France is roused. Long have ye been lecturing and tutoring this poor nation like cruel, uncalled-for pedagogues, shaking over her your ferulas of fire and steel. It is long that ye have pricked and filliped and affrighted her, there as she sat helpless in her dead cerements of a constitution, you gathering in on her from all lands with your armaments and plots, your invadings and truculent bullyings. And lo, now, ye have pricked her to the quick, and she is up, and her blood is up. The dead cerements are rent into cobwebs, and she fronts you in that terrible strength of nature which no man has measured, which goes down to madness and toffet. See now how ye will deal with her. This month of September, 1792, which has become one of the memorable moments of history, presents itself under two most diverse aspects, all of black on the one side, all of bright on the other. Whatsoever is cruel in the panic frenzy of twenty-five million men, whatsoever is great in the simultaneous death defiance of twenty-five million men, stand here in abrupt contrast near by one another. As indeed is usual when a man, how much more when a nation of men, is hurled suddenly beyond the limits. For nature, as green as she looks, rests everywhere on dread foundations, were we farther down and Pan, to whose music the nymphs dance, has a cry in him that can drive all men distracted. Very frightful it is when a nation, rending asunder its constitutions and regulations which were grown dead cerements for it, becomes transcendental and must now seek its wild way through the new, chaotic, where force is not yet distinguished into bidden and forbidden, but crime and virtue welter unseparated in that domain of what is called the passions, of what we call the miracles and the portents. It is thus that for some three years to come we are to contemplate France in this final third volume of our history. Sanscalotism reigning in all its grandeur and all its hideousness, the gospel, God's message, of man's rights, man's mights or strengths, once more preached irrefragibly abroad, along with this, and still louder for the time, and fearfulest devil's message of man's weakness and sins, and all on such a scale and under such aspect, cloudy death birth of a world, huge smoke cloud, streaked with rays as of heaven on one side, girt on the other as with hellfire. History tells us many things, but for the last thousand years and more, what thing has she told us of a sort like this? Which, therefore, let us too, O reader, dwell on willingly, for a little, and from its endless significance endeavour to extract what may, in present circumstances, be adapted for us. It is unfortunate, though very natural, that the history of this period has so generally been written in hysterics. Exaggeration abounds, execration wailing, and on the whole, darkness. But thus too, when foul old Rome had to be swept from the earth, and those Northmen and other horrid sons of nature came in swallowing formulas, as the French now do, foul old Rome screamed execratively her loudest, so that the true shape of many things is lost for us. Attila's Huns had arms of such length that they could lift a stone without stooping. Into the body of the poor Tatars, execrative Roman history intercalated an alphabetic letter, and so they continue T-A-R-T-A-R-S, a fell Tartarian nature to this day. 
Here, in like manner, search as we will in these multiform, innumerable French records, darkness too frequently covers, or sheer distraction bewilders. One finds it difficult to imagine that the sun shone in this September month, as he does in others. Nevertheless, it is an indisputable fact that the sun did shine, and there was weather and work, nay, as to that, very bad weather for harvest work. An unlucky editor may do his utmost, and after all, require allowances. He had been a wise Frenchman who, looking close at hand on this waste aspect of a France all stirring and whirling in ways new, untried, had been able to discern where the cardinal movement lay, which tendency it was that had the rule and primary direction of it then. But at forty-four years' distance it is different. To all men now, two cardinal movements or grand tendencies in the September world have become discernible enough. That stormful effluence towards the frontiers, that frantic crowding towards townhouses and council halls in the interior. Wild France dashes in desperate death defiance towards the frontiers to defend itself from foreign despots. Crowds towards town halls and election committee rooms to defend itself from domestic aristocrats. Let the reader conceive well these two cardinal movements and what side currents and endless vortexes might depend on these. He shall judge too whether, in such sudden wreckage of all old authorities, such a pair of cardinal movements, half frantic in themselves, could be of soft nature as in dry Sahara when the winds waken and lift and winnow the immensity of sand. The air itself, travellers say, is a dim sand air, and dim looming through it the wonderfullest uncertain colonnades of sand pillars rush whirling from this side and from that, like so many mad spinning dervishes of a hundred feet in stature, and dance their huge desert waltzes there. Nevertheless, in all human movements, were they but a day old, there is order, or the beginning of order. Consider two things in this Sahara waltz of the French twenty-five millions, or rather one thing, and one hope of a thing. The commune, municipality of Paris, which is already here, the national convention, which shall in few weeks be here the insurrectionary commune which, improvising itself on the eve of the 10th of August, worked this ever-memorable deliverance by explosion, must needs rule over it till the convention meet. This commune, which they may well call a spontaneous or improvised commune, is, for the present, sovereign of France. The legislative, deriving its authority from the old, how can it now have authority when the old is exploded by insurrection? As a floating piece of wreck, certain things, persons and interests may still cleave to it. Volunteer defenders, riflemen or pikemen in green uniform or red nightcap of Bonnet Rouge defile before it daily, just on the wing towards Brunswick, with the brandishing of arms, always with some touch of Leonidas eloquence, often with a fire of daring that threatens to out Herod Herod, the galleries, especially the ladies, never done with applauding. Addresses of this or the like sort can be received and answered in the hearing of all France. The Salle de Manege is still useful as a place of proclamation for which use indeed it now chiefly serves. Vigneault delivers spirit-stirring orations, but always with a prophetic sense only, looking towards the coming convention. Let our memory perish, cries Vigneault, but let France be free. Whereupon they all start to their feet, shouting responsive, Yes, yes, Paris, notre mémoire, pour vous que la France soit libre. This frocked chabot abjures heaven that at least we may have done with kings, and fast as powder under spark we all blaze up once more, and with waved hats shout and swear, Yes, nous le jurons plus de roi! All which, as a method of proclamation, is very convenient. For the rest, that our busy brissots, rigorous Rolands, men who once had authority and now have less and less, men who love law and will have even an explosion explode itself as far as possible according to rule, to find this state of matters most unofficial, unsatisfactory, 
is not to be denied. Complaints are made, attempts are made, but without effect. The attempts even recoil and must be desisted from, from fear of worse. The sceptre is departed from this legislative once and always. A poor legislative, so hard was fate, had let itself be hand-jived, nailed to the rock like an Andromeda, and could only wail there to the earth and heavens. Miraculously, a winged Perseus, or improvised commune, has dawned out of the void blue and cut her loose. But whether now it is she with her softness and musical speech, or is it he with his hardness and sharp falchion and aegis that shall have casting vote? melodious agreement of vote, this were the rule. But if otherwise, and votes diverge, then surely Andromeda's part is to weep, if possible, tears of gratitude alone. Be content, O France, with this improvised commune, such as it is. It has the implements, and has the hands. The time is not long. On Sunday, the 26th of August, our primary assembly shall meet, begin electing of electors. On Sunday, the 2nd of September, may the day prove lucky, the electors shall begin electing deputies, and so an all-healing national convention will come together. No Marc d'Argent or distinction of active and passive now insults the French patriot, but there is universal suffrage, unlimited liberty to choose. Old constituents, present legislators, all France is eligible. Nay, it may be said, the flower of all the universe, de l'univers, is eligible, for in these very days we, by act of assembly, naturalise the chief foreign friends of humanity, priestly, burnt out for us in Birmingham, Klopstock, a genius of all countries, Jeremy Bentham, useful jurist consult, distinguished Payne, the rebellious needleman, some of whom may be chosen, as is most fit for a convention of this kind. In a word, 745 unshackled sovereigns, admired of the universe, shall replace this hapless impotency of a legislative, out of which it is likely the best members and the mountain in mass may be re-elected. Roland is getting ready the Salle des Saints Suisses as preliminary rendezvous for them in that void palace of the Tuileries, now void and national, and not a palace, but a caravansera. As for the spontaneous commune, one may say that there never was on earth a stranger town council. Administration not of a great city, but of a great kingdom in a state of revolt and frenzy, this is the task that has fallen to it. Enrolling, provisioning, judging, devising, deciding, doing, endeavouring to do. One wonders the human brain did not give way under all this and real. But happily human brains have such a talent of taking up simply what they can carry and ignoring all the rest, leaving all the rest as if it were not there. Whereby somewhat is verily shifted for and much shifts for itself. This improvised commune walks along, nothing doubting, promptly making front, without fear or flurry, at what moment soever, to the wants of the moment. Were the world on fire, one improvised trickler municipal has but one life to lose. They are the elixir and chosen men of sanscolotic patriotism, promoted to the forlorn hope, unspeakable victory or a high gallows, this is their mead. They sit there in the town hall, these astonishing trickler municipals, in council general, in committee of watchfulness, de surveillance, which will even become de salut public of public salvation, or what other committees and subcommittees are needful, managing infinite correspondence, passing infinite decrees. One hears of a decree being the 98th of the day. Ready is the word. They carry loaded pistols in their pockets, also some improvised luncheon by way of meal. Or indeed, by and by, traiteurs contract for the supply of repasts to be eaten on the spot, too lavishly, as it was afterwards grumbled. Thus they, girt in their trickler sashes, municipal notepaper in one hand, firearms in other. They have their agents out all over France, speaking in townhouses, marketplaces, highways and byways, agitating, urging to arm, all hearts tingling to hear. Great is the fire of anti-aristocrat eloquence. 
Nay, some, as Bibliopolic Mamoro, seem to hint afar off at something which smells of agrarian law and a surgery of the over-swollen dropsical strongbox itself, whereat, indeed, the bold bookseller runs risk of being hanged and ex-constituent Buzo has to smuggle him off. Governing persons, were they never so insignificant intrinsically, have for most part plenty of memoir writers, and the curious in after times can learn minutely their goings out and comings in, which as men always love to know their fellow men in singular situations is a comfort of its kind. Not so with these governing persons now in the town hall. And yet what most original fellow man of the governing sort, High Chancellor, King, Kaiser, Secretary of the Home or the Foreign Department, ever showed such a face as, as Clark Talion, Procureur Manuel, future Procureur Chaumet, here in this sand waltz of the twenty-five millions now do? Oh, brother mortals, thou advocate Pani, friend of Danton, kinsman of Santerre, Engraver Sargion, since called Agate Sargion, thou Huginin, with the toxin in thy heart. But, as Horace says, they wanted the sacred memoir writer, Sacrovate, and we know them not. Men bragged of August and its doings, publishing them in high places, but of this September, none now or afterwards would brag. The September world remains dark, fuliginous, as Lapland witch midnight, from which, indeed, very strange shapes will evolve themselves. Understand this, however, that incorruptible Robespierre is not wanting. Now, when the brunt of battle is passed in a stealthy way, the sea-green man sits there, his feline eye is excellent in the twilight. Also understand this other, a single fact worth many, that Marat is not only there, but has a seat of honour assigned him, a tribune particuliere, our change for Marat, lifted from his dark cellar into this luminous, peculiar tribune. All dogs have their day, even rabid dogs. Sorrowful, incurable, Philoctetes Marat, without whom Troy cannot be taken. Hither, as a main element of the governing power, has Marat been raised. Royalist types, for we have suppressed innumerable du Roussois, Roy Yu, and even clapped them in prison. Royalist types replaced the worn types often snatched from a people's friend in old ill days. In our peculiar tribune we write and redact placards of due monetary terror, Ami du Peuple, now under the name of Journal de la République, and sit obeyed of men. Marat, says one, is the conscience of the Hôtel de Ville. Keeper, as some call it, of the sovereign's conscience, which surely in such hands will not lie hid in a napkin. Two great movements, as we said, agitate this distracted national mind. A rushing against domestic traitors, a rushing against foreign despots. Mad movements both, restrainable by no known rule. Strongest passions of human nature driving them on. Love, hatred, vengeful sorrow, braggart nationality also vengeful, and pale panic over all. Twelve hundred slain patriots, do they not from their dark catacombs there in death's dumb show plead, O ye legislators, for vengeance? Such was the destructive rage of these aristocrats on the ever-memorable tenth, Nay, apart from vengeance and with an eye to public salvation only, are there not still in this Paris, in round numbers, 30,000 aristocrats of the most malignant humour, driven now to their last trump card? Be patient, ye patriots, our new High Court, Tribunal of the 17th, sits. Each section has sent four jurymen and Danton, extinguishing improper judges, improper practices, wheresoever found, is the same man you have known at the Cordeliers. With such a minister of justice shall not justice be done. Let it be swift, then, answers universal patriotism, swift and sure. One would hope this tribunal of the 17th is swifter than most, Already on the 21st, while our court is but four days old, Colino d'Angremont, the royal enlister, Crimp, Embouchure, dies by torchlight. 
For lo, the great guillotine, wondrous to behold, now stands there. The doctor's idea has become oak and iron. The huge cyclopean axe falls in its groove like the ram of the pile engine, swiftly snuffing out the light of men. Mais vous, Gualsh, what have you invented? This? Poor old Laporte, intendant of the civil list, follows next, quietly, the mild old man. Then Durasoy, royalist placarder, cashier of all the anti-revolutionists of the interior. He went rejoicing, said that a royalist like him ought to die of all days on this day, the 25th or St. Louis' day. All these have been tried, cast, the gallery shouting approval and handed over to the realised idea within a week. Besides those we have acquitted, the galleries murmuring, and have dismissed or even have personally guarded back to prison as the galleries took to howling and even to menacing and elbowing. Languid, this tribunal is not. Nor does the other movement slacken, the rushing against foreign despots. Strong forces shall meet in death grip, drilled Europe against mad, undrilled France, and singular conclusions will be tried. Conceive, therefore, in some faint degree, the tumult that whirls in this France, in this Paris. Placards from section, from commune, from legislative, from the individual patriot, flame monetary on all walls. Flags of danger to fatherland wave at the Hotel de Ville, on the Pont Neuf, over the prostrate statue of kings. There is universal enlisting, urging to enlist. There is tearful boasting, leave-taking, irregular marching on the great northeastern road. Marseillais sing their wild two arms in chorus, which now all men, all women and children have learnt, and sing chorally in theatres, boulevards, streets, and the heart burns in every bosom. Aux arms, marchons! Or think how your aristocrats are skulking into covert, how Bertrand Molleville lies hidden in some garret in Aubrey Le Boucher Street with a poor surgeon who had known me. Dame de Stael has secreted her Narbonne, not knowing what in the world to make of him. The barriers are sometimes open, oftenest shut, no passports to be had. Town hall emissaries with the eyes and claws of falcons, flitting watchful on all points of your horizon. In two words, tribunal of the 17th, busy under howling galleries, Russian Brunswick over a space of 40 miles with his war tumbrils, and sleeping thunders and Briarian 66,000 right hands, coming, coming. Oh heavens, in these later days of August he is come. Durasoy was not yet guillotined when news had come that the Prussians were harrying and ravaging about Metz. In some four days more, one hears that long we, our first strong place on the borders, is fallen in fifteen hours. Quick, therefore, O ye improvised municipals, quick and ever quicker, the improvised municipals make front to this also. Enrolment urges itself, and clothing and arming. Our very officers have now wool epaulets, for it is the reign of equality and also of necessity. Neither do men now monsieur and sir one another. Citoyen, citizen, were suitable. We even say thou, as the free peoples of antiquity did. So have journals and the improvised commune suggested, which shall be well. Infinitely better, meantime, could we suggest where arms are to be found. For the present our citoyen chant chorally to arms and have no arms. Arms are searched for passionately. There is joy over any musket. Moreover, entrenchments shall be made round Paris. On the slopes of Montmartre men dig and shovel, even though the simple suspect this to be desperate. They dig, trickle as sashes, speak encouragement, and well speed ye. Nay, finally, twelve members of the legislative go daily, not to encourage only, but to bear a hand and delve. It was decreed with acclamation. Arms shall either be provided, or else the ingenuity of man crack itself and become fatuity. Lean Beaumarchais, thinking to serve the fatherland and do a stroke of trade in the old way, has commissioned sixty thousand stand of good arms out of Holland. Would to heaven for fatherland's sake and his they were come. 
Meanwhile, railings are torn up, hammered into pikes. Chains themselves shall be welded together into pikes. The very coffins of the dead are raised for melting into balls. All church bells must down into the furnace to make cannon, all church plate into the mint to make money. Also behold the fair swan bevies of citoyenne that have alighted in churches and sit there with swan neck, sewing tents and regimentals. Nor are patriotic gifts wanting from those that have aught left, nor stingily given. The fair Viom, mother and daughter, milliners in the Rue Saint-Martin, give a silver thimble and a coin of fifteen sous, sevenpence halfpenny, with other similar effects, and offer, at least the mother does, to mount guard. Men who have not even a thimble give a thimble full, were it but of invention. One citoyen has wrought out the scheme of a wooden cannon, which France shall exclusively profit by in the first instance. It is to be made of staves by the coopers, of almost boundless calibre, but uncertain as to strength. Thus they, hammering, scheming, stitching, founding, with all their heart and with all their soul, two bells only are to remain in each parish for toxin and other purposes. But mark also, precisely while the Prussian batteries were playing their brisket at Longwy in the northeast, and our dastardly Lavergne saw nothing for it but surrender, southwestward in remote patriarchal Lavende, that sour ferment about non-during priests after long working is ripe and explodes at the wrong moment for us. And so we have 8,000 peasants at chatillon sur sevre who will not be balloted for soldiers, will not have their curates molested, to whom Bonchamp, La Roche Jacqueline and seigneurs enough of a royalist turn will join themselves with stofflays and charrettes, with heroes and shoe and smugglers and the loyal warmth of a simple people blown into flame and fury by theological and seigneurial bellows so that there shall be fighting from behind ditches, death volleys bursting out of thickets and ravines of rivers, huts burning, feet of the pitiful women hurrying to refuge with their children on their back, seed fields fallow, whitened with human bones, 80,000 of all ages, ranks, sexes, flying at once across the Loire, with wail borne far on the winds, and in brief, for years coming, such a suite of scenes as glorious war has not offered in these late ages, not since our Albigenses and Crusadings were over, save indeed some chance palatinate, or so we might have to burn by way of exception. The 8,000 at Châtillon will be got dispelled for the moment, the fire scattered, not extinguished. To the dints and bruises of outward battle there is to be added henceforth a deadlier internal gangrene. This rising in La Vendée reports itself at Paris on Wednesday the 29th of August, just as we had got our electors elected, and in spite of Brunswick and Longwy's teeth were hoping still to have a national convention if it pleased heaven, but indeed, otherwise, this Wednesday is to be regarded as one of the notablest Paris has yet seen, Gloomy tidings come successively, like Job's messengers are met by gloomy answers. Of Sardinia rising to invade the southeast, and Spain threatening the south, we do not speak. But are not the Prussians master of Longwy, treacherously yielded, one would say, and preparing to besiege Verdun? Clairfay and his Austrians are encompassing Thionville, darkening the north. Not Metzland now, but the Clermonté is getting harried. Flying Houlans and Hazars have been seen on the Chalon Road, almost as far as saint Manahoud. Heart, ye patriots, if ye lose heart, ye lose all. It is not without a dramatic emotion that one reads in the parliamentary debates of this Wednesday evening, past seven o'clock, the scene with the military fugitives from Longwy. Way-worn, dusty, disheartened, these poor men enter the legislative about sunset or after, give the most pathetic detail of the frightful pass they were in, Prussians billowing round by the myriad, volcanically spouting fire for fifteen hours, we, scattered sparse on the ramparts, hardly a cannoneer to two guns, our dastard Commandant Lavergne nowhere showing face, the priming would not catch, there was no powder in the bombs, what could we do? Mourir! Die! answer prompt voices, and the dusty fugitives must shrink elsewhither for comfort. 
Yes, mourir, that is now the word. Be long we a proverb and a hissing among French strong places. Let it, say the legislative, be obliterated rather from the shamed face of the earth. And so there has gone forth decree that long we shall, were the Prussians once out of it, be raised and exist only as ploughed ground. Nor are the Jacobins milder, as how could they, the flower of patriotism. Poor Dame Lavergne, wife of the poor commandant, took her parasol one evening and, escorted by her father, came over to the hall of the mighty mother and reads a memoir tending to justify the commandant of Longwy. Lafarge, president, makes answer. Citoyenne, the nation will judge Lavergne. The Jacobins are bound to tell him the truth. He would have ended his course there, terminé sa carrière, if he had loved the honour of his country. End of Book One, Chapter One The French Revolution, A History by Thomas Carlyle Volume Three, The Guillotine Book One, September Chapter Two, Danton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book One, Chapter Two, Danton but better than raising of Longwy or rebuking poor dusty soldiers or soldiers' wives, Danton had come over last night and demanded a decree to search for arms, since they were not yielded voluntarily. Let domiciliary visits with rigour of authority be made to this end. To search for arms, for horses, aristocratism rolls in its carriages while patriotism cannot trail its cannon to search generally for munitions of war in the houses of persons suspect, and even, if it seem proper, to seize and imprison the suspect persons themselves. In the prisons their plots will be harmless, in the prisons they will be as hostages for us, and not without use. This decree the energetic Minister of Justice demanded last night and got and this same night it is to be executed. It is being executed at the moment when these dusty soldiers get saluted with mourir. Two thousand stands of arms, as they count, are foraged in this way, and some four hundred head of new prisoners. And on the whole, such a terror and damp is struck through the aristocrat heart as all but patriotism, and even patriotism were it out of this agony, might pity. Yes, monsieur, if Brunswick blast Paris to ashes, he probably will blast the prisons of Paris too. Pale terror, if we have got it, we will also give it, and the depths of horrors that lie in it, the same leaky bottom in these wild waters, bears us all. One can judge what stir there was now among the thirty thousand royalists, how the plotters, or the accused of plotting, shrank each other closer into his lurking place like Bertrand Mauville, looking eager towards Longwy, hoping the weather would keep fair. Or how they dressed themselves in valet's clothes like Narbonne, and got to England as Dr. Bollman's famulus. How Dame de Stael bestirred herself, pleading with Manuel as a sister in literature, pleading even with Clark Tallien, a prey to nameless chagrins. Royalist Peltier, the pamphleteer, gives a touching narrative, not deficient in height of colouring, of the terrors of that night. From five in the afternoon a great city is struck suddenly silent, except for the beating of drums, for the tramp of marching feet, and ever and anon the dread thunder of the knocker at some door, a trickler commissioner with his blue guards, blackguards, arriving. All streets are vacant, says Peltier, beset by guards at each end. All citizens are ordered to be within doors. On the river float sentinel barges, lest we escape by water, the barriers hermetically closed. Frightful. The sun shines serenely westering in smokeless mackerel sky. Paris is as if sleeping, as if dead. Paris is holding its breath to see what stroke will fall on it. Poor Peltier! Acts of apostles and all jocundity of leading articles are gone out, and it has become bitter earnest instead. 
polished satire changed now into coarse pike points hammered out of railing, all logic reduced to this one primitive thesis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Peltier, dolefully aware of it, ducks low, escapes unscathed to England to urge there the inky war anew, to have trial by jury in due season, and deliverance by young Whig eloquence, world celebrated for a day. Of thirty thousand, naturally, great multitudes were left unmolested, but, as we said, some four hundred designated as persons suspect were seized, and an unspeakable terror fell on all. Woe to him who was guilty of plotting, of anti-civism, royalism, foyantism, who, guilty or not guilty, has an enemy in his section to call him guilty. Poor old Monsieur de Cazotte is seized, his young loved daughter with him, refusing to quit him. Why, O oh Cazotte, wouldst thou quit romancing and diable amoureux for such reality as this? Poor old Monsieur de Sombroy, he of the Invalides, is seized, a man seen askance by patriotism ever since the Bastille days, whom also a fond daughter will not quit with young tears hardly suppressed, and old wavering weakness rousing itself once more. Oh, my brothers, oh, my sisters. The famed and named go, the nameless if they have an accuser. Nicholas Lamotte's husband is in these prisons, she long since squelched on the London pavements, but gets delivered. Cross the Morand of the Courier de l'Europe, hobbles distractedly to and fro there, but they let him hobble out, on right nimble crutches, his hour not being yet come. Advocate Maton de la Varenne, very weak in health, is snatched off from mother and kin, Tricola Rossignol, journeyman goldsmith and scoundrel, lately a risen man now, remembers an old pleading of Maton's. Juniac de saint Maillard goes, the brisk Frank soldier. He was in the mutiny of Nancy in that effervescent regiment du roi on the wrong side. Saddest of all, Abbe Sicard goes, a priest who could not take the oath, but who could teach the deaf and dumb. In his section, one man, he says, had a grudge at him. One man, at the fit hour, launches an arrest against him, which hits. In the Arsenal quarter there are dumb hearts making wail with signs, with wild gestures. He, their miraculous healer and speech-bringer, is rapt away. What with the arrestments on this night of the 29th, what with those that have gone on more or less day and night ever since the 10th, one may fancy what the prisons now were. Crowding and confusion, jostle, hurry, vehemence and terror. Of the poor Queen's friends who had followed her to the temple and been committed elsewhere to prison, some, as governess to Tourzel, are to be let go. One, the poor Princess de Lamballe, is not let go, but waits in the strong rooms of La Force there. What will be tired further? Among so many hundreds whom the launch to rest hits, who are rolled off to town hall or section hall, to preliminary houses of detention, and hurled in thither as into cattle pens, we must mention one other, Caron de Beaumarchais, author of Figaro, vanquisher of Mappio parliaments and Gertzmann hell-dogs, once numbered among the demigods, and now? We left him in his culminant state. What dreadful decline is this when we again catch a glimpse of him? At midnight, it was but the 12th of August yet, the servant in his shirt, with wide staring eyes, enters your room. Monsieur, rise, all the people are come to seek you. They are knocking, like to break in the door. And they were, in fact, knocking in a terrible manner, d'une façon terrible. I fling on my coat, forgetting even the waistcoat, nothing on my feet but slippers, and say to him, and he, alas, answers mere negatory incoherences, panic interjections. And through the shutters and crevices in front or rearward, the dull street lamps disclose only streetfuls of haggard countenances, clamorous, bristling with pikes. And you rush distracted for an outlet, finding none, and have to take refuge in the crockery press downstairs and stand there palpitating in that imperfect costume, lights dancing past your keyhole, tramp of feet overhead and the tumult of Satan for four hours and more. 
and old ladies of the quarter, started up, as we hear next morning, rang for their bonds and cordial drops, with shrill interjections, and old gentlemen in their shirts leapt garden walls, flying, while none pursued, one of whom unfortunately broke his leg. Those sixty thousand stand of Dutch arms, which never arrive, and the bold stroke of trade, have turned out so ill. Beaumarchais escaped for this time, but not for the next time, ten days after. On the evening of the twenty-ninth he is still in that chaos of the prisons, in saddest wrestling condition, unable to get justice, even to get audience. Pani scratching his head when you speak to him and making off, Nevertheless, let the lover of Figaro know that Procureur Manuel, a brother in literature, found him and delivered him once more. But how the lean demigod, now shorn of his splendour, had to lurk in barns, to roam over harrowed fields panting for life, and to wait under eaves drops and sit in darkness, on the boulevard amid paving stones and boulders, longing for one word of any minister or minister's clerk about those accursed Dutch muskets and getting none, with heart fuming in spleen and terror and suppressed canine madness, Alas, how the swift, sharp hound, once fit to be Diana's, breaks his old teeth now, gnawing mere windstones, and must fly to England, and returning from England, must creep into the corner and lie quiet, toothless, moneyless. All this let the lover of Figaro fancy and weep for. We hear without weeping, not without sadness, wave the withered, tough fellow mortal our farewell, his Figaro has returned to the French stage, nay, he is at this day sometimes named the best piece there. And indeed, so long as man's life can ground itself only on artificiality and aridity, each new revolt and change of dynasty turning up only a new stratum of dry rubbish and no soil yet coming to view, may it not be good to protest against such a life in many ways, and even in the Figaro way? End of Book 1, Chapter 2《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 1, September Chapter 3, Du Maurier This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 1, Chapter 3, Du Maurier such are the last days of August, 1792, days gloomy, disastrous, and of evil omen. What will become of this poor France? De Maurier rode from the camp of Mould eastward to Sedan on Tuesday last, the 28th of the month, reviewed that so-called army left forlorn there by Lafayette. The forlorn soldiers gloomed on him were heard growling on him, This is one of them, Sir Blank La that made war be declared. Unpromising army. Recruits flow in, filtering through depot after depot, but recruits merely, in want of all, happy if they have so much as arms. And Longwy has fallen basely, and Brunswick and the Prussian king with his sixty thousand will beleaguer Verdun, and Claire Fay, an Austrian, press deeper in over the northern marches, a hundred and fifty thousand, as fear counts, 80,000, as the returns show, to hem us in, Sumerian Europe behind them. There is Castri and Brolier chivalry, royalist foot in red facing and nankeen trousers, breathing death and the gallows. And lo, finally, at Verdun on Sunday, the 2nd of September, 1792, Brunswick is here, with his king, and sixty thousand glittering over the heights from beyond the winding Meurs River. He looks down on us, on our high citadel and all our confectionery ovens, for we are celebrated for confectionery, has sent courteous summons in order to spare the effusion of blood. Resist him to the death? Every day of retardation precious? How, O General Beaurepaire, asks the amazed municipality, shall we resist him? We, the Verdun Municipal, see no resistance possible. Has he not sixty thousand and artillery without end? 
Retardation and patriotism is good, but so likewise is peaceable baking of pastry and sleeping in whole skin. Hapless Beaurepaire stretches out his hands and pleads passionately in the name of country, honour, of heaven and of earth, to no purpose. The municipals have, by law, the power of ordering it, with an army officered by royalism or crypto-royalism, such a law seemed needful, and they order it, as pacific pastry cooks, not as heroic patriots would, to surrender. Beaurepaire strides home with long steps, his valet entering the room sees him writing eagerly and withdraws. His valet hears then, in a few minutes, the report of a pistol. Beau Repair is lying dead. His eager writing had been a brief suicide farewell. In this manner died Beau Repair, wept of France, buried in the Pantheon, with honourable pension to his widow, and for epitaph these words, He chose death rather than yield to despots. The Prussians, descending from the heights, are peaceable masters of Verdun. And so Brunswick advances from stage to stage, who shall now stay him, covering forty miles of country. Foragers fly far. The villages of the northeast are harried. Your Hessian forager has only three sous a day. The very emigrants, it is said, will take silver plate by way of revenge. Clermont, saint Menehou, Varennes, especially ye towns of the Knight of Spurs, tremble ye. Procureur Sauce and the Magistry of Varennes have fled. Brave Boniface Leblanc of the Bras d'Or is to the woods. Mrs. Leblanc, a young woman fair to look upon with her young infant, has to live in Greenwood, like a beautiful Bessie Bell of song, her bower thatched with rushes, catching premature rheumatism. Claremont may ring the toxin now and illuminate itself. Claremont lies at the foot of its cow, or vache, so they name that mountain, a prey to the Hessian spoiler. Its fair women, fairer than most, are robbed, not of life, or what is dearer, yet of all that is cheaper and portable, for necessity on three halfpence a day has no law. At St. Menahou the enemy has been expected more than once, our nationals all turning out in arms but was not yet seen. Postmaster Drouet, he is not in the woods, but minding his election, and will sit in the convention, notable king-taker and bold old dragoon as he is. Thus on the north-east all roams and runs, and on a set day, the date of which is irrecoverable by history, Brunswick has engaged to dine in Paris, the powers willing. And at Paris, in the centre, it is as we saw, and in La Vendée, south-west, it is as we saw. And Sardinia is in the south-east, and Spain is in the south. And Clairefay with Austria, and Cise Thionville is in the north. And all France leaps distracted, like the winnowed Sahara waltzing in sand colonnades. More desperate posture no country ever stood in. A country, we would say, which the majesty of Prussia, if it so pleased him, might partition and clip in pieces like a Poland, flinging the remainder to poor brother Louis, with directions to keep it quiet, or else we will keep it for him. Or perhaps the upper powers minded that a new chapter in universal history shall begin here and not further on, may have ordered it all otherwise? In that case, Brunswick will not dine in Paris on the set day, nor indeed one knows not when. Verily, amid this wreckage, where poor France seems grinding itself down to dust and bottomless ruin, who knows what miraculous salient point of deliverance and new life may have already come into existence there and be already working there, though as yet human eye discern it not. On the night of that same 28th of August, the unpromising review day in Sedan, Dumouriez assembles a council of war at his lodgings there. He spreads out the map of this forlorn war district. Prussians here, Austrians there, triumphant both with broad highway and little hindrance all the way to Paris. We, scattered helpless here and here, what to advise? The generals, strangers to Dumouriez, look blank enough, know not well what to advise. 
if it be not retreating, and retreating till our recruits accumulate, till perhaps the chapter of chance turn up some leaf for us, or Paris at all events be sacked at the latest day possible? The many counselled, who has not closed an eye for three nights, listens with little speech to these long, cheerless speeches, merely watching the speaker that he may know him, then wishes them all good night, but beckons a certain young Tuveno, the fire of whose looks had pleased him, to wait a moment. Tuveno waits. Voila, says Polymatus, pointing to the map, that is the forest of Argon, that long strip of rocky mountain and wild wood, forty miles long, with but five, or say even three, practicable passes through it. This, for they have forgotten it, might one not still seize, though clear-faced it so nigh? Once seized, the champagne called the hungry, or worse, champagne poileurs, on their side of it, the fat three bishoprics and willing France on ours, and the equinox reigns not far, this Argonne might be the Thermopylae of France. O oh, brisk Dumourier Polymatus, with thy teeming head, may the gods grant it. Polymatus, at any rate, folds his map together and flings himself on bed, resolved to try on the morrow morning. With astucity, with swiftness, with audacity, one had need to be a lion fox and have luck on one side. End of Book One, Chapter Three The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 1, September Chapter 4, September in Paris This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 1, Chapter 4, September in Paris At Paris, by lying rumour which proved prophetic and veridical, the fall of Verdun was known some hours before it happened. It is Sunday, the 2nd of September. Handiwork hinders not the speculations of the mind. Verdun gone, though some still deny it. The Prussians in full march, with gallows ropes, with fire and faggot. Thirty thousand aristocrats within our own walls, and but the merest quarter tither them yet put in prison. Nay, there goes a word that even these will revolt. Sieur Jean Julien, wagoner of Vaugirard, being set in the pillory last Friday, took all at once to crying that he would be well revenged ere long, that the king's friends in prison would burst out, force the temple, set the king on horseback, and, joined by the unimprisoned, ride roughshod over us all. This the unfortunate wagoner of Vaugirard did bawl at the top of his lungs. When snatched off to the town hall, he persisted in it, still bawling. Yesternight, when they guillotined him, he died with the froth of it on his lips. For a man's mind, padlocked to the pillory, may go mad, and all men's minds may go mad, and believe him, as the frenetic will do, because it is impossible so that apparently the knot of the crisis and last agony of France is come. Make front to this, thou improvised commune, strong Danton, whatsoever man is strong. Readers can judge whether the flag of country in danger flapped soothing or distractively on the souls of men that day. But the improvised commune, but strong Danton, is not wanting each after his kind. Huge placards are getting plastered to the walls. At two o'clock the storm bell shall be sounded, the alarm cannon fired. All Paris shall rush to the Champ de Mars and have itself enrolled. Unarmed, truly, and undrilled, but desperate in the strength of frenzy. Haste, ye men, ye very women, offer to mount guard and shoulder the brown musket. Weak clucking hens in a state of desperation will fly at the muzzle of the mastiff and even conquer him by vehemence of character. Terror itself, when once grown transcendental, becomes a kind of courage, as frost sufficiently intense, according to poet Milton, will burn. Danton, the other night, in the Legislative Committee of General Defence, when the other ministers and legislators had all opined, said it would not do to quit Paris and fly to Saumur, that they must abide by Paris, and take such attitude as would put their enemies in fear. Fair peur! 
a word of his which has been often repeated and reprinted in italics. At two of the clock, Beaurepaire, as we saw, has shot himself at Verdun, and over Europe mortals are going in for afternoon sermon. But at Paris all steeples are clangoring, not for sermon, the alarm gun booming from minute to minute, Champ de Mars and Fatherland's altar boiling with desperate terror courage. What a miserere going up to heaven from this once capital of the most Christian king. The legislative sits in alternate awe and effervescence, Vernio proposing that twelve shall go and dig personally on Montmartre, which is decreed by a claim. But better than digging personally with a claim, see Danton enter, the black brows clouded, the colossus figure tramping heavy, grim energy looking from all features of the rugged man. Strong is that grim son of France and son of earth, a reality and not a formula, he too, and surely now if ever, being hurled low enough, it is on the earth and on realities that he rests. Legislators, so speaks the stentor voice, as the newspapers yet preserve it for us. It is not the alarm cannon that you hear, it is the pas de charge against our enemies. To conquer them, to hurl them back, what do we require? Il nous faut de l'audace, c'est encore de l'audace, c'est toujours de l'audace. To dare and again to dare and without end to dare. Right so, thou brawny titan, there is nothing left for thee but that. Old men who heard it will still tell you how the reverberating voice made all hearts swell in that moment and braced them to the sticking place and thrilled abroad over France like electric virtue as a word spoken in season. But the commune enrolling in the Champ de Mars, but the commune of watchfulness become now committee of public salvation, whose conscience is Marat? The commune enrolling enrolls many, provides tents for them in that Mars field, that they may march with dawn on the morrow, praise to this part of the commune. To Marat and the committee of watchfulness, not praise, not even blame, such as could be meted out in these insufficient dialects of ours, expressive silence, rather. Lone Marat, the man forbid, meditating long in his cellars of refuge on his stylites pillar, could see salvation in one thing only, in the fall of 260,000 aristocrat heads. With so many score of Naples bravos, each a dirk in his right hand, a muff on his left, he would traverse France and do it. But the world laughed mocking the severe benevolence of a people's friend, and his idea could not become an action, but only a fixed idea. Lo, now, however, he has come down from his stylites pillar to a tribune particulier, here now, without the dirks, without the muffs at least, were it not grown possible, now in the knot of the crisis, when salvation or destruction hangs in the hour? The ice tower of Avignon was noised of sufficiently and lives in all memories, but the authors were not punished. Nay, we saw a Jourdain coupe tête, borne on men's shoulders like a copper portent, traversing the cities of the south. What phantasm, squalid, horrid, shaking their dirk and muff, may dance through the brain of a Marat in this dizzy peeling of toxin miserere and universal frenzy, seek not to guess, O reader nor what the cruel Bior in his short brown coat was thinking, nor Sir Jean, nor yet Agat Sir Jean, nor Pani, the confidant of Danton, nor in a word how gloomy Orcus does breed in her gloomy womb and fashion her monsters and prodigies of events which thou seest her visibly bear. Terror is on these streets of Paris. Terror and rage, tears and frenzy, toxin miserere peeling through the air, fierce desperation rushing to battle, mothers with streaming eyes and wild hearts sending forth their sons to die. Carriage horses are seized by the bridle that they may draw cannon, the trace is cut, the carriage is left standing. In such toxin miserere, the murky bewilderment of frenzy, are not murder, arte, and all furies near at hand? 
on slight hint, who knows on how slight may not murder come, and with her snaky sparkling hand illuminate this murk? How it was and went, what part might be premeditated, what was improvised and accidental, man will never know till the great day of judgment make it known. But with a Marat for keeper of the sovereign's conscience, and we know what the ultima ratio of sovereigns when they are driven to it is, in this Paris there are as many wicked men, say a hundred or more, as exist in all the earth, to be hired and set on, to set on of their own accord unhired. And yet we will remark that premeditation itself is not performance, is not surety of performance, that it is perhaps at most surety of letting whatsoever wills perform. From the purpose of crime to the act of crime there is an abyss, wonderful to think of. The finger lies on the pistol, but the man is not yet a murderer. Nay, his whole nature staggering at such consummation. Is there not a confused pause, rather, one last instant of possibility for him? Not yet a murderer, it is at the mercy of light trifles whether the most fixed idea may not yet become unfixed. One slight twitch of a muscle, the death flash bursts, and he is it, and will for eternity be it and earth has become a penal Tartarus for him, his horizon girdled now not with golden hope, but with red flames of remorse, voices from the depths of nature sounding woe, woe on him. Of such stuff are we all made, on such powder mines of bottomless guilt and criminality, if God restrained not, as is well said, does the purest of us walk. There are depths in man that go the length of lowest hell, as there are heights that reach highest heaven. For are not both heaven and hell made out of him, made by him, everlasting miracle and mystery as he is? But looking on this Champ de Mars, with its tent buildings and frantic enrolments, on this murky, simmering Paris with its crammed prisons, supposed about to burst, with its toxin miserere, its mother's tears and soldiers' farewell shoutings, the pious soul might have prayed that day that God's grace would restrain, and greatly restrain, lest on slight hest or hint madness, horror and murder rose, and this Sabbath day of September became a day black in the annals of men. The toxin is peeling its loudest. The clocks inaudibly strike three, when poor Abbe Sicard, with some thirty other non-durant priests in six carriages, fare along the street from their preliminary house of detention at the town hall, westward towards the prison of the Abbe. Carriages enough stand deserted on the street. These six move on, through angry multitudes, cursing as they move. Accursed aristocrat Tartuffs, this is the pass ye have brought us to. And now ye will break the prisons and set Capet Vito on horseback to ride over us? Out upon you, priests of Beelzebub and Molog, of Tartuffery, Mammon and the Prussian gallows, which ye name Mother Church and God. Such reproaches have the poor non-durance to endure and worse, spoken in on them by frantic patriots who mount even on the carriage steps, the very guards hardly refraining. Pull up your carriage blind. No, answers patriotism, clapping its horny paw on the carriage blind and crushing it down again. Patience in oppression has limits. We are close on the Abbe. It has lasted long. A poor nondurant of quick temper smites the horny paw with his cane. Nay, finding solacement in it, smites the unkempt head sharply and again more sharply, twice over, seen clearly of us and of the world. It is the last that we see clearly. Alas, next moment the carriages are locked and blocked in endless raging tumults, in yells deaf to the cry of mercy, which answer the cry for mercy with sabre thrusts through the heart. The thirty priests are torn out, are massacred about the prison gate, one after one. Only the poor Abbe Sicard, whom one moton, a watchmaker, knowing him, heroically tried to save and secrete in the prison, escapes to tell. And it is night and orcas and murder's snaky sparkling head has risen in the murk. 
from Sunday afternoon, exclusive of intervals and pauses not final, till Thursday evening, there follows consecutively a hundred hours. Which hundred hours are to be reckoned with the hours of the Bartholomew butchery, of the Armagnac massacres, Sicilian vespers, or whatsoever is savagest in the annals of this world? Horrible the hour when man's soul in its paroxysm spurns asunder the barriers and rules and shows what dens and depths are in it. For night and Orcus, as we say, as was long prophesied, have burst forth here in this Paris from this subterranean imprisonment, hideous, dim, confused, which it is painful to look on and yet which cannot and indeed which should not be forgotten. The reader who looks earnestly through this dim phantasmagory of the pit will discern few fixed certain objects, and yet still a few. He will observe in this abbey prison the sudden massacre of the priest being once over, a strange court of justice, or call it court of revenge and wild justice, swiftly fashion itself and take seat round a table with the prison registers spread before it. Stanislas Maillard, Bastille hero, famed leader of the mean edge, presiding. Oh, Stanislas, one hoped to meet thee elsewhere than here, thou shifty riding usher with an inkling of law. This work also thou hadst to do, and then to depart forever from our eyes. At La Force, at the Châtelet, the Conciergerie, the like court forms itself with the like accompaniments, the thing that one man does, other men can do. There are some seven prisons in Paris, full of aristocrats with conspiracies, nay, not even Bicetra and Salpietra shall escape with their forges of assignats, and there are seventy times seven hundred patriot hearts in a state of frenzy, Scoundrel hearts also there are, as perfect, say, as the earth holds, if such are needed. To whom in this mood law is as no law, and killing, by what name soever called, is but work to be done. So sit these sudden courts of wild justice, with the prison registers before them, unwanted wild tumult howling all round, the prisoners in dread expectancy within. Swift, a name is called, bolts jingle, a prisoner is there. A few questions are put, swiftly this sudden jury decides, royalist plotter or not, Clearly not in that case. Let the prisoner be enlarged with viva la nation. Probably yea, then still. Let the prisoner be enlarged, but without viva la nation, or else it may run. Let the prisoner be conducted to la force. At la force again, their formula is, let the prisoner be conducted to the abbey. To la force then. Volunteer bailiff sees the doomed man. He is at the outer gate, enlarged or conducted, not into La Force, but into a howling sea, forth under an arch of wild sabres, axes and pikes, and sinks hewn asunder. And another sinks, and another. And there forms itself a piled heap of corpses, and the kennels begin to run red. Fancy the yells of these men, their faces of sweat and blood, the crueler shrieks of these women, for there are women too, and a fellow mortal hurled naked into it all. Jorniac de Saint-Maillard has seen battle, has seen an effervescent regiment du Roi in mutiny, but the bravest heart may quail at this. The Swiss prisoners, remnants of the 10th of August, clasped each other spasmodically and hung back, grey veterans crying, Mercy, monsieur, a mercy! But there was no mercy. Suddenly, however, one of these men steps forward. He had a blue frock coat. He seemed to be about thirty. His stature was above common, his look noble and martial. I go first, said he, since it must be so. Adieu! Then dashing his hat sharply behind him, Which way? cried he to the brigands. Show it me then. They open the folding gate. He is announced to the multitude. He stands a moment motionless, then plunges forth among the pikes and dies of a thousand wounds. 
Man after man is cut down. The sabres need sharpening. The killers refresh themselves from wine jugs. Onward and onward goes the butchery, the loud yells wearing down into bass growls. A sombre-faced shifting multitude looks on in dull approval or dull disapproval, in dull recognition that it is necessity. An Anglais in drab greatcoat was seen, or seemed to be seen, serving liquor from his own dram bottle. For what purpose, if not set on by Pitt, Satan and himself know best. Witty Dr. Moore grew sick on approaching and turned into another street. Quick enough goes this jury court and rigorous. The brave are not spared, nor the beautiful, nor the weak. Old Monsieur de Montmarin, the minister's brother, was acquitted by the tribunal of the 17th and conducted back, elbowed by howling galleries, but is not acquitted here. Princess de Lamballe is laid down on bed. Madame, you are to be removed to the Abbey. I do not wish to remove. I am well enough here. There is a need be for removing. She will arrange her dress a little. Then, rude voice answer, you have not far to go. She too is led to the hell gate, a manifest queen's friend. She shivers back at the sight of bloody sabres, but there is no return. Onwards. That fair hind head is cleft with the axe, the neck is severed. That fair body is cut in fragments with indignities and obscene horrors of mustachio grand lèvres which human nature would fain find incredible, which shall be read in the original language only. She was beautiful, she was good, she had known no happiness. Young hearts, generation after generation, will think with themselves, O oh, worthy of worship, thou king descended, god descended, and poor sister woman. Why was I not there in some sword balmung or Thor's hammer in my hand? Her head is fixed on a pike, paraded under the window of the temple, that is still more hated, a Marie Antoinette may see. One municipal in the temple with the royal prisoners at the moment said, Look out! Another eagerly whispered, Do not look. The circuit of the temple is guarded in these hours by a long-stretched trickler ribbon. Terror enters and the clangour of infinite tumult, hitherto not regicide, though that too may come. But it is more edifying to note what thrillings of affection, what fragments of wild virtues turn up in this shaking asunder of man's existence, for of these two there is a proportion. Note old Marquis Cazotte, he is doomed to die, but his young daughter clasps him in her arms with an inspiration of eloquence, with a love which is stronger than very death. The heart of the killers themselves is touched by it. The old man is spared. Yet he was guilty if plotting for his king is guilt. In ten days more a court of law condemned him and he had to die elsewhere, bequeathing his daughter a lock of his old grey hair. Or note old Monsieur de Sombroy, who also had a daughter. My father is not an aristocrat. O oh, good gentleman, I will swear it and testify it and in all ways prove it. We are not, we hate aristocrats. Wilt thou drink aristocrat's blood? The man lifts blood, if universal rumour can be credited. The poor maiden does drink. This Sombroy is innocent, then. Yes, indeed, and now note most of all how the bloody pikes at this news do rattle to the ground and the tiger yells become bursts of jubilee over a brother saved and the old man and his daughter are clasped to bloody bosoms with hot tears and borne home in triumph of viva la nation the killers refusing even money does it seem strange this temper of theirs it seems very certain well proved by royalist testimony in other instances and very significant. End of Book One, Chapter Four. The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume Three, The Guillotine, Book One, September, Chapter Five, A Trilogy. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 1, Chapter 5. A Trilogy. As all delineation in these ages, were it never so epic, speaking itself and not singing itself, must either found on belief and provable fact, or have no foundation at all, nor except as floating cobweb any existence at all, the reader will perhaps prefer to take a glance with the very eyes of eyewitnesses, and see in that way for himself how it was. Brave Journiac, innocent Abbe Sicard, Judicious advocate Maiton, these, greatly compressing themselves, shall speak each an instant. Journiac's agony of thirty-eight hours went through above a hundred editions, though intrinsically a poor work. Some portion of it may here go through above the hundred and first for want of a better. Towards seven o'clock, Sunday night, at the Abbey, for Journiac goes by dates, we saw two men enter, their hands bloody and armed with sabres. A turnkey with a torch lighted them. He pointed to the bed of the unfortunate Swiss, Reading. Reading spoke with a dying voice. One of them paused, but the other cried, Allons, don! lifted the unfortunate man, and carried him out on his back to the street. He was massacred there. We all looked at one another in silence. We clasped each other's hands. Motionless, with fixed eyes, we gazed on the pavement of our prison, on which lay the moonlight, chequered with the triple stanchions of our windows. Three in the morning. They were breaking in one of the prison doors. We at first thought they were coming to kill us in our room, but heard by voices on the staircase that it was a room where some prisoners had barricaded themselves. They were all butchered there, as we shortly gathered. Ten o'clock. The Abbé L'Enfant and the Abbé de Chape de Rassignac appeared in the pulpit of the chapel, which was our prison. They had entered by a door from the stairs. They said to us that our end was at hand, that we must compose ourselves and receive their last blessing. An electric movement, not to be defined, threw us all on our knees, and we received it. These two white-haired old men, blessing us from their place above, death hovering over our heads, on all hands environing us, the moment is never to be forgotten. Half an hour after, they were both massacred, and we heard their cries. Thus Journiac in his agony in the Abbey. Now let the good Maiton speak, what he, over in La Force in the same hours, is suffering and witnessing. This resurrection by him is greatly the best, the least theatrical of these pamphlets, and stands testing by documents. Towards seven o'clock on Sunday night, prisoners were called frequently and they did not reappear. Each of us reasoned in his own way on this singularity, but our ideas became calm as we persuaded ourselves that the memorial I had drawn up for the National Assembly was producing effect. At one in the morning, the grate which led to our quarter opened anew. Four men in uniform, each with a drawn sabre and blazing torch, came up to our corridor, preceded by a turnkey, and entered an apartment close to ours to investigate a box there, which we heard them break up. This done, they stepped into the gallery and questioned the man Cuisa to know where La Motte, Nicholas's widower, was. Lamotte, they said, had some months ago, under pretext of a treasure he knew of, swindled a sum of three hundred livres from one of them, inviting him to dinner for that purpose. The wretched Cuisa, now in their hands, who indeed lost his life this night, answered trembling that he remembered the fact well, but could not tell what was become of Lamotte. Determined to find Lamotte and confront him with Cuisa, they rummaged, along with this latter, through various other apartments, but without effect, for we heard them say, Come search among the corpses, then, for nom de Dieu, we must find where he is. At this time I heard Louis Badi, the Abbe Badi's name, called. He was brought out and directly massacred, as I learned. He had been accused, along with his concubine, five or six years before, of having murdered and cut in pieces his own brother. Auditor of the Chambre des Comptes of Montpellier, but had by his subtlety, his dexterity, nay, his eloquence, outwitted the judges and escaped. 
One may fancy what terror these words, come search among the corpses then, had thrown me into. I saw nothing for it now but resigning myself to die. I wrote my last will, concluding it by a petition and adjuration that the paper should be sent to its address. Scarcely had I quitted the pen when there came two other men in uniform, one of them whose arm and sleeve up to the very shoulder as well as the sabre were covered with blood, said he was as weary as a hodman that had been beating plaster. Baudin de la Chenay was called. Sixty years of virtues could not save him. They said, A la bay! He passed the fatal outer gate, gave a cry of terror at sight of the heaped corpses, covered his eyes with his hands, and died of innumerable wounds. At every new opening of the grate I thought I should hear my own name called and see Rossignol enter. I flung off my nightgown and cap. I put on a coarse unwashed shirt, a worn frock without waistcoat, an old round hat. These things I had sent for some days ago, in the fear of what might happen. The rooms of this corridor had been all emptied but ours. We were four together whom they seemed to have forgotten. We addressed our prayers in common to the Eternal, to be delivered from this peril. Baptiste, the turnkey, came up by himself to see us. I took him by the hands, I conjured him to save us, promised him a hundred louis if he would conduct me home. A noise coming from the grates made him hastily withdraw. It was the noise of some dozen or fifteen men armed to the teeth. As we, lying flat to escape being seen, could see from our windows, Upstairs, said they, let not one remain. I took out my penknife. I considered where I should strike myself but reflected that the blade was too short, and also on religion. Finally, however, between seven and eight o'clock in the morning, enter four men with bludgeons and sabres, to one of whom Gerard, my comrade, whispered earnestly apart. During their colloquy I searched everywhere for shoes that I might lay off the advocate pumps, pantoufle du palais, I had on, but could find none. Constant called Le Sauvage, Gérard, and a third whose name escapes me, they let clear off. As for me, four sabres were crossed over my breast, and they led me down. I was brought to their bar, to the personage with the scarf, who sat as judge there. He was a lame man of tall, lank stature. He recognised me on the streets, and spoke to me seven months after. I have been assured that he was son of a retired attorney, and named Shapi. Crossing the court called De Nouris, I saw Manuel haranguing in trickle a scarf. The trial, as we see, ends in acquittal and resurrection. Poor Sicard from the violon of the Abbe shall say but a few words, true-looking, though tremulous. Towards three in the morning the killers bethink them of this little violon and knock from the court. I tapped gently, trembling lest the murderers might hear, on the opposite door where the section committee was sitting. They answered gruffly that they had no key. There were three of us in this viola. My companions thought they perceived a kind of loft overhead, but it was very high. Only one of us could reach it by mounting on the shoulders of both the others. One of them said to me that my life was usefuller than theirs. I resisted. They insisted. No denial. I fling myself on the neck of these two deliverers, never was seen more touching. I mount on the shoulders of the first, then on those of the second, finally on the loft, and address to my two comrades the expression of a soul overwhelmed with natural emotions. The two generous companions, we rejoice to find, did not perish. But it is time that Juniac de saint Maillard should speak his last words and end this singular trilogy. The night had become day, and the day has again become night. Juniac, worn down with uttermost agitation, has fallen asleep and had a cheering dream. He has also contrived to make acquaintance with one of the volunteer bailiffs, and spoken in native Provençal with him. On Tuesday, about one in the morning, his agony is reaching its crisis. By the glare of two torches I now describe the terrible tribunal where lay my life or my death, the president, in grey coats, with a sabre at his side, stood leaning with his hands against a table, on which were papers, an inkstand, tobacco pipes and bottles. 
Some ten persons were around, seated or standing, two of whom had jackets and aprons. Others were sleeping, stretched out on benches. Two men in bloody shirts guarded the door of the place. An old turnkey had his hand on the lock. In front of the president, three men held a prisoner who might be about sixty. Or seventy, he was old Marshal Maillet of the Tuileries on August the 10th. They stationed me in a corner. My guards crossed their sabres on my breast. I looked on all sides for my Provençal. Two national guards, one of them drunk, presented some appeal from the section of Croix Rouge in favour of the prisoner. The man in grey answered, They are useless, these appeals for traitors. Then the prisoner exclaimed, It is frightful, your judgment is a murder. The president answered, My hands are washed of it, take Monsieur Maillet away. They drove him into the street, where, through the opening of the door, I saw him massacred. The president sat down to write, registering, I suppose, the name of this one whom they had finished. Then I heard him say, Another! A un autre! Behold me, then, hailed before this swift and bloody judgment bar, where the best protection was to have no protection, and all resources of ingenuity became null if they were not founded on truth. Two of my guards held me each by a hand, the third by the collar of my coat. "'Your name? Your profession?' said the President. "'The smallest lie ruins you,' added one of the judges. "'My name is Juniac, St. Maillard. I have served as an officer twenty years, and I appear at your tribunal with the assurance of an innocent man who therefore will not lie.' "'We shall see that,' said the President. "'Do you know why you are arrested?' Yes, Monsieur le President, I am accused of editing the journal de la Cour de la Ville, but I hope to prove the falsity. But no, Jurniac's proof of the falsity, and defence generally, though of excellent result as a defence, is not interesting to read. It is long-winded. There is a loose theatricality in the reporting of it which does not amount to unveracity, yet which tends that way. We shall suppose him successful, beyond hope, in proving and disproving, and skip largely to the catastrophe, almost at two steps. But after all, said one of the judges, there is no smoke without kindling. Tell us why they accuse you of that. I was about to do so, Jurniac does so, with more and more success. Nay, continued I, they accuse me even of recruiting for the emigrants. At these words there arose a general murmur. Oh, monsieur, monsieur, I exclaimed, raising my voice. It is my turn to speak. I beg, monsieur le president, to have the kindness to maintain it for me. I never needed it more. True enough, true enough, said almost all the judges with a laugh. Silence. While they were examining the testimonials I had produced, a new prisoner was brought in and placed before the president. It was one priest more, they said, whom they had ferreted out of the chapel. After very few questions, à la force, he flung his breviary on the table, was hurled forth and massacred. I reappeared before the tribunal. You tell us always, cried one of the judges with a tone of impatience, that you are not this, that you are not that. What are you then? I was an open royalist. There arose a general murmur which was miraculously appeased by another of the men who had seemed to take an interest in me. We are not here to judge opinion, said he, but to judge the results of them. Could Rousseau and Voltaire, both in one pleading for me, have said better? Yes, monsieur, cried I. Always till the 10th of August I was an open royalist. Ever since the 10th of August that cause has been finished. I am a Frenchman, true to my country. I was always a man of honour. My soldiers never distrusted me. Nay, two days before that business of Nancy, when their suspicion of their officers was at its height, they chose me for commander to lead them to Luneville to get back the prisoners of the regiment Mestre de Camp and seize General Monseigne. Which fact there is, most luckily, an individual present who, by a certain token, can confirm. The president, this cross-questioning being over, took off his hat and said, I see nothing to suspect in this man. I am for granting him his liberty. Is that your vote? To which all the judges answered, Oui, oui, it is just. And there arose vivats within doors and without, escort of three amid shoutings and embracings. 
Thus Juniak escaped from jury trial and the jaws of death. Maitown and Sicard did, either by trial and no bill found, Lank President Shapey finding absolutely nothing, or else by evasion and new favour of Moton, the brave watchmaker, likewise escape, and were embraced and wept over, weeping in return as they well might. Thus they three, in wondrous trilogy or triple soliloquy, uttering simultaneously through the dread night watches their night thoughts, grown audible to us. They three are become audible. But the other thousand and eighty-nine, of whom two hundred and two were priests, who also had night thoughts, remain inaudible, choked forever in black death, heard only of President Shapey and the man in grey. End of Book One, Chapter Five The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 1, September, Chapter 6, The Circular. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 1, Chapter 6, The Circular. But the constituted authorities all this while... The Legislative Assembly, the Six Ministers, the Town Hall, Santerre with the National Guard? It is very curious to think what a city is. Theatres to the number of some twenty-three were open every night during these prodigies, while right arms here grew weary with slaying, right arms there a tweedledeeing on melodious catgut. At the very instant when Abbe Sakar was climbing up his second pair of shoulders, three men high, Five hundred thousand human individuals were lying horizontal as if nothing were amiss. As for the poor legislative, the sceptre had departed from it. The legislative did send deputation to the prisons, to the street courts, and poor Monsieur Dussault did harangue there but produced no conviction whatsoever. Nay, at last, as he continued haranguing, the street court interposed, not without threats, and he had to cease and withdraw. This is the same poor, worthy old Monsieur Dussault who told, or indeed almost sang, though with cracked voice, the taking of the Bastille to our satisfaction long since. He was wont to announce himself on such and on all occasions as the translator of Juvenal. Good citizens, you see before you a man who loves his country, who is the translator of Juvenal, said he once. Juvenal, interrupts sans culottism. Who the devil is Juvenal? One of your sacra aristocrats? To the lantern! From an orator of this kind, conviction was not to be expected. The legislative had much ado to save one of its own members, or ex-members, Deputy Journaux, who chanced to be lying in arrest for mere parliamentary delinquencies in these prisons. As for poor old Dussault and company, they returned to the Salle de Manège, saying it was dark and they could not see well what was going on. Roland writes indignant messages in the name of order, humanity and the law, but there is no force at his disposal. Santerre's national force seems lazy to rise, though he made requisitions, he says, which always dispersed again. Nay, did not we, with Advocate Maiton's eyes, see men in uniform too, with their sleeves bloody to the shoulder? Petion goes in tricolour scarf, speaks the austere language of the law. The killers give up while he is there. When his back is turned, recommence. Manuel too, in scarf, we, with Maiton's eyes, transiently saw haranguing in the court called of nurses, Cœur de Nourice. On the other hand, cruel Biord, likewise in scarf, with that small puce coat and black wig we are used to on him, audibly delivers standing among corpses at the abbey, a short but ever memorable harangue reported in various phraseology, but always to this purpose. Brave citizens, you are extirpating the enemies of liberty. You are at your duty. A grateful commune and country would wish to recompense you adequately, but cannot, for you know its want of funds. Whoever shall have worked, travaille, in a prison shall receive a draft of one louis, payable by our cashier. Continue your work. The constituted authorities are of yesterday, all pulling different ways. 
There is properly not constituted authority, but every man is his own king, and all are kinglets, belligerent, allied, or armed neutral, without king over them. Oh, everlasting infamy, exclaims Mont Gaillard, that Paris stood looking on in stupor for four days and did not interfere. Very desirable indeed that Paris had interfered, yet not unnatural that it stood even so, looking on in stupor. Paris is in death panic, the enemy and gibbets at its door. Whosoever in Paris has the heart to front death finds it more pressing to do it fighting the Prussians than fighting the killers of aristocrats. Indignant abhorrence, as in Roland, may be here. Gloomy sanction, premeditation or not, as in Marat and Committee of Salvation, may be there. Dull disapproval, dull approval and acquiescence in necessity and destiny is the general temper. The sons of darkness, two hundred or so, risen from their lurking places, have scope to do their work. Urged on by fever frenzy of patriotism and the madness of terror, urged on by lucre and the gold louis of wages? Nay, not lucre, for the gold watches, rings, money of the massacred are punctually brought to the town hall by king as sans indispensables, who higgle afterwards for their twenty shillings of wages, and Sir Jean sticking an uncommonly fine agate on his finger, fully meaning to account for it, becomes agate Sir Jean. But the temper, as we say, is dull acquiescence. Not till the patriotic or frenetic part of the work is finished for want of material and sons of darkness spent clearly on lucre alone begin wrenching watches and purses, brooches from ladies' necks to equip volunteers in daylight on the streets does the temper from dull grow vehement, does the constable raise his truncheon and, striking heartily, like a cattle driver in earnest, beat the course of things back into its old regulated drove roads. The guard meuble itself was surreptitiously plundered on the 17th of the month to Roland's new horror, who anew bestirs himself and is, as Sieg says, the veto of scoundrels, Roland veto des coquins. This is the September Massacre, otherwise called Severe Justice of the People. These are the Septemberers, Septembrisers, a name of some note and lucency, but lucency of the nether-fire sort, very different from that of our Bastille heroes, who shone, disputable by no friend of freedom, as in heavenly light radiance, to such faces of the business have we advanced since then. The numbers massacred are, in historical fantasy, between two and three thousand, or indeed they are upwards of six thousand, for Peltier, in vision, saw them massacring the very patients of the Bicetre madhouse with grapeshot. Nay, finally, they are twelve thousand and odd hundreds, not more than that. In arithmetical ciphers and lists drawn up by accurate advocate Maiton, the number, including 202 priests, three persons unknown and one thief killed at the Bernardin, is, as above hinted, 1,089, no less than that. 1,089 lie dead, 260 heaped carcasses on the Pont au Change itself, among which Robespierre, pleading afterwards, will nearly weep to reflect that there was said to be one slain innocent. One, not two, O thou sea-green incorruptible? If so, Demis Senscalotte must be lucky, for she was brief. In the dim registers of the town hall, which are preserved to this day, men read with a certain sickness of heart items and entries not usual in town books. To workers employed in preserving the salubrity of the air in the prisons and persons who presided over these dangerous operations, so much. In various items, nearly £700 sterling. To carters employed to the bearing grounds of Clamart, Montrouge and Vaugirard at so much a journey per cart, this also is an entry. Then so many francs and odd sous for the necessary quantity of quicklime. Carts go along the streets, full of stripped human corpses, thrown pell-mell, limbs sticking up, 
Seest thou that cold hand sticking up through the heaped embrace of brother corpses in its yellow paleness, in its cold rigour, the palm open towards heaven as if in dumb prayer, in expostulation de profundis? Take pity on the sons of men. Messier saw it as he walked down the Rue Saint-Jacques from Montrouge on the morrow of the massacres, but not a hand, it was a foot, which he reckoned still more significant. One understands not well why. Or was it as the foot of one spurning heaven, rushing like a wild diver in disgust and despair towards the depths of annihilation? Even there shall his hand find thee, and his right hand hold thee, surely for right, not for wrong, for good, not evil. I saw that foot, says Mercia, I shall know it again at the great day of judgment, when the Eternal, throned on his thunders, shall judge both kings and Septemberers. That a shriek of inarticulate horror rose over this thing, not only from French aristocrats and moderates, but from all Europe, and has prolonged itself to the present day, was most natural and right. The thing lay done, irrevocable a thing to be counted beside some other things which lie very black in our earth's annals, yet which will not erase therefrom. For man, as was remarked, has transcendentalisms in him, standing, as he does, poor creature, every way, in the confluence of infinitudes, a mystery to himself and others, in the centre of two eternities, of three immensities, in the intersection of primeval light with the everlasting dark, Thus have there been, especially by vehement tempers, reduced to a state of desperation, very miserable things done. Sicilian vespers and 8,000 slaughtered in two hours are a known thing. Kings themselves, not in desperation, but only in difficulty, have sat hatching for year and day. Nay, Dethu says for seven years, their Bartholomew business, and then at the right moment, also on an autumn Sunday, this very bell. They say it is the identical metal of saint germain l'Auxerrois was set appealing with effect. Nay, the same black boulder stones of these Paris prisons have seen prison massacres before now, men massacring countrymen, Burgundies massacring Armagnacs, whom they had suddenly imprisoned, till as now there are piled heaps of carcasses and the streets ran red the mere pétion of the times speaking the austere language of the law and answered by the killers in old French, it is some four hundred years old, Maugre bien, sire, sire, God's malice and on your justice, your pity, your right reason, cursed be of God, whoso shall have pity on these false traitorous Armagnacs, English, dogs they are, they have destroyed us, wasted this realm of France and sold it to the English. And so they slay and fling aside the flame to the extent of 1518, among whom are found four bishops of false and damnable counsel and two presidents of Parliament. For though it is not Satan's world, this that we live in, Satan always has his place in it, underground properly, and from time to time bursts up. Well may mankind shriek, inarticulately anathematizing as they can. There are actions of such emphasis that no shrieking can be too emphatic for them. Shriek ye, acted have they. Shriek who might, in this France, in this Paris legislative or Paris town hall, there are ten men who do not shriek. A circular goes out from the Committee of Salut Public, dated 3rd of September, 1792, directed to all town halls. A state paper, too remarkable to be overlooked. A part of the ferocious conspirators detained in the prisons, it says, have been put to death by the people, and it, the circular, cannot doubt but the whole nation, driven to the edge of ruin by such endless series of treasons, will make haste to adopt this means of public salvation, and all Frenchmen will cry, as the men of Paris, we go to fight the enemy, but we will not leave robbers behind us to butcher our wives and children. To which are legibly appended these signatures, Pani, Sujon, Marat, friend of the people, with seven others, carried down thereby in a strange way to the late remembrance of antiquarians. We remark, however, that their circular rather recoiled on themselves. The town halls made no use of it. 
Even the distracted sans culottes made little. They only howled and bellowed, but did not bite. At Rheem, about eight persons were killed and two afterwards were hanged for doing it. At Lyon and a few other places, some attempt was made, but with hardly any effect, being quickly put down. Less fortunate were the prisoners of Orléans, was the good Duke de la Rochefoucauld. He, journeying by quick stages with his mother and wife towards the waters of Forge or some quieter country, was arrested at Gisors, conducted along the streets amid effervescing multitudes, and killed dead by the stroke of a paving stone hurled through the coach window. Killed as a once liberal, now aristocrat, protector of priests, suspender of virtuous pétions, and his unfortunate hot grown cold, detestable to patriotism. He dies lamented of Europe, his blood spattering the cheeks of his old mother, ninety-three years old. As for the Orléans prisoners, they are state criminals, royalist ministers, Delessar, Montmorin, who have been accumulating on the High Court of Orléans ever since that tribunal was set up whom now it seems good that we should get transferred to our new Paris court of the 17th, which proceeds far quicker. Accordingly, hot Fournier from Martinique, Fournier l'Americaine, is off, missioned by constituted authority with stanch national guards, with Lazuski the Pole sparingly provided with road money. These, through bad quarters, through difficulties, perils, for authorities cross each other in this time, do triumphantly bring off the fifty or fifty-three Orléans prisoners towards Paris, where a swifter court of the 17th will do justice on them. But lo, at Paris, in the interim, a still swifter and swiftest court of the 2nd and of September has instituted itself. Enter not Paris, or that will judge you. What shall Hutt Fournier do? It was his duty as volunteer constable, had he been a perfect character, to guard these men's lives, never so aristocratic, at the expense of his own valuable life, never so sans till some constituted court had disposed of them. But he was an imperfect character and constable, perhaps one of the more imperfect. Hot Fournier, ordered to turn thither by one authority, to turn thither by another authority, is in a perplexing multiplicity of orders, but finally he strikes off for Versailles. His prisoners fare in tumbrils or open carts, himself and guards riding and marching around, and at the last village the worthy mayor of Versailles comes to meet him, anxious that the arrival and locking up were well over. It is Sunday, the ninth day of the month. Lo! On entering the avenue of Versailles, what multitude stirring, swarming in the September sun under the dull green September foliage, the four-road avenue all humming and swarming as if the town had emptied itself. Our tumbrils roll heavily through the living sea, the guards and Fournier making way with ever more difficulty, the mayor speaking and gesturing his persuasivest amid the inarticulate growling hum which growls ever the deeper even by hearing itself growl, not without sharp yelpings here and there. Would to God we were out of this straight place, and wind and separation had cooled the heat which seems about igniting here. And yet if the wide avenue is too straight, what will the street de Surintendance be at leaving of the same? At the corner of Sir Intendant Street, the compressed yelpings become a continuous yell. Savage figures spring onto the tumbrel shafts, first spray of an endless coming tide. The mayor pleads, pushes, half desperate, is pushed, carried off in men's arms. The savage tide has entrance, has mastery. Amid horrid noise and tumult as of fierce wolves, the prisoners sink massacred, all but some eleven who escaped into houses and found mercy. The prisons and what other prisoners they held were with difficulty saved. The stripped clothes are burnt in bonfires, the corpses lie heaped in the ditch on the morrow morning. All France, except it be the ten men of the circular and their people, moans and rages, inarticulately shrieking. All Europe rings. But neither did Danton shriek, though, as Minister of Justice it was more his part to do so. 
brawny Danton is in the breach, as of stormed cities and nations, amid the sweep of 10th of August cannon, the rustle of Prussian gallows ropes, the smiting of September sabres, destruction all round him, and the rushing down of worlds. Minister of Justice is his name, but titan of the forlorn hope, an enfant perdu of the revolution is his quality, and the man acts according to that. We must put our enemies in fear, deep fear, is it not, as of its own accord falling on our enemies. The titan of the forlorn hope, he is not the man that would swiftest of all prevent it so falling. Forward, thou lost titan of an enfant perdu, thou must dare and again dare and without end dare, there is nothing left for thee but that. Que mon nom soit flétri, let my name be blighted, what am I? The cause alone is great and shall live and not perish. So on the whole, he too is a swallower of formulas of still wider gulp than Mirabeau. This is Danton, Mirabeau of the sans culottes. In the September days, this minister was not heard of as cooperating with strict Roland. His business might lie elsewhere, with Brunswick and the Hotel de Ville. When applied to by an official person about the Orléans prisoners and the risks they ran, he answered gloomily, twice over, Are not these men guilty? When pressed, he answered in a terrible voice and turned his back. Two thousand slain in the prisons. Horrible, if you will. But Brunswick is within a day's journey of us, and there are five and twenty millions yet to slay or to save. Some men have tasks frightfuler than ours. It seems strange, but is not strange, that this minister of Moloch justice, when any suppliant for a friend's life got access to him, was found to have human compassion, and yielded and granted always. Neither did one personal enemy of Danton perish in these days. To shriek, we say, when certain things are acted, is proper and unavoidable. Nevertheless, articulate speech, not shrieking, is the faculty of man. When speech is not yet possible, let there be, with the shortest delay, at least silence. Silence, accordingly, in this 44th year of the business, and 1836 of an era called Christian a Lucas Anon, is the thing we recommend and practice. Nay, instead of shrieking more, it were perhaps edifying to remark on the other side what a singular thing customs, in Latin, mores are, and how fitly the virtue, virtus, manhood or worth, that is in a man, is called his morality or customariness. Fell slaughter, one the most authentic products of the pit, you would say, once give it customs, becomes war, with laws of war, and is customary and moral enough, and red individuals carry the tools of it girt round their haunches, not without an air of pride, which do thou nowise blame. While see, so long as it is but dressed in hodden or russet, and revolution, less frequent than war, has not yet got its laws of revolution, but the hodden or russet individuals are uncustomary. O oh, shrieking beloved brother blockheads of mankind, let us close those wide mouths of ours. Let us cease shrieking and begin considering. End of Book 1, Chapter 6The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 1, September, Chapter 7, September in Argonne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 1, Chapter 7, September in Argonne. Plain at any rate is one thing, that the fear whatever of fear those aristocrat enemies might need, has been brought about. The matter is getting serious, then. Sanscolotism, too, has become a fact and seems minded to assert itself as such. This huge moon-calf of Sanscolotism staggering about, as young calves do, is not mockable only and soft like another calf, but terrible, too, if you prick it, and through its hideous nostrils blows fire, Aristocrats, with pale panic in their hearts, fly towards covert. 
and a light rises to them over several things, or rather a confused transition towards light, whereby for the moment darkness is only darker than ever. But what will become of this France? Here is a question. France is dancing its desert waltz as Sahara does when the winds waken, in whirl blasts twenty-five million in number, waltzing towards town halls, aristocrat prisons and election committee rooms, towards Brunswick and the frontiers, towards a new chapter of universal history, if indeed it be not the finis and winding up of that. In election committee rooms there is now no dubiety, but the work goes bravely along. The convention is getting chosen, really in a decisive spirit. In the town hall we already date first year of the Republic. Some two hundred of our best legislators may be re-elected, the mountain bodily. Robespierre with Mère Pétion, Buzot, Curate Grégoire, Rabot, some three score old constituents, though we once had only thirty voices. All these, and along with them, friends long known to revolutionary fame, Camille de Moulin, though he stutters in speech, Manuel Tallien and company, journalist Gossard, Carat, Messier, Louvet of Faublas, Clout, speaker of mankind, Collot de Bois, tearing a passion to rags, Fabre d'Eglantine, speculative pamphleteer, Legendre, the solid butcher, nay Marat, though rural France can hardly believe it, or even believe that there is a Marat, except in print, of Minister Danton, who will lay down his ministry for a membership, we need not speak. Paris is fervent, nor is the country wanting to itself. Barbaru, Rebecchi and fervid patriots are coming from Marseille. 745 men, or indeed 49, for Avignon now sends four, are gathering. So many are to meet, not so many are to part. Attorney Carrier from Aurillac, ex-priest Le Bon from Arras, these shall both gain a name. Mountainous Auvergne re-elects her Rome, hardly tiller of the soil, once mathematical professor, who, unconscious, carries in petto a remarkable new calendar with Messidor, Pluviosa, and such like, and having given it well forth, shall depart by the death they call Roman. C.A. old constituent comes to make new constitutions, as many as wanted. For the rest, peering out of his clear, cautious eyes, he will cower low in many an emergency and find silence safest. Young Saint-Just is coming, deputed for Ain in the north, more like a student than a senator, not four-and-twenty yet, who has written books, a youth of slight stature, with mild, mellow voice, enthusiast olive complexion and long dark hair. Ferrault from the far valley Doire in the folds of the Pyrenees is coming, an ardent republican doomed to fame, at least in death. All manner of patriot men are coming, teachers, husbandmen, priests and ex-priests, traders, doctors, above all talkers or the attorney species. Men midwives, as Le Vasseur of the South, are not wanting, nor artists, Gross David with the swollen cheek has long painted with genius in a state of convulsion and will now legislate. The swollen cheek, choking his words in the birth, totally disqualifies him as an orator, but his pencil, his head, his gross hot heart, with genius in a state of convulsion, will be there. A man bodily and mentally swollen-cheeked, disproportionate, flabby large instead of great, weak withal as in a state of convulsion, not strong in a state of composure. So let him play his part. Nor are naturalised benefactors of the species forgotten. Priestly, elected by the Orne department, but declining. Payne, the rebellious needleman by the Pas de Calais, who accepts. Few nobles come, and yet not none. Paul Francois Barat, noble as the Barasses, old as the rocks of Provence, he is one. 
The reckless shipwrecked man flung ashore on the coast of the Maldives long ago while sailing and soldiering as Indian fighter, flung ashore since then as hungry Parisian pleasure hunter and half pay on many a Circe island with temporary enchantment, temporary conversion into beasthood and hoghood. The remote VAR department has now sent him hither. A man of heat and haste, defective in utterance, defective indeed in anything to utter, yet not without a certain rapidity of glance, a certain swift transient courage, who in these times, fortune favouring, may go far. He is tall, handsome to the eye, only the complexion a little yellow but with a robe of purple with a scarlet cloak and plume of tricolour on occasions of solemnity, the man will look well. Le Palettier Saint-Fageau, old constituent, is a kind of noble and of enormous wealth. He too has come hither. To have the pain of death abolished? Hapless ex-parliamentier. Nay, among our sixty old constituents, see Philip d'Orléans, a prince of the blood. Not now d'Orléans, or feudalism being swept from the world, he demands of his worthy friends, the electors of Paris, to have a new name of their choosing. Whereupon Procureur Manuel, like an antithetic literary man, recommends equality, égalité. A Philippe égalité, therefore, will sit, seen of the earth and heaven. Such a convention is gathering itself together mere angry poultry in malting season, whom Brunswick's grenadiers and cannoneers will give short account of, would the weather only mend a little. In vain, O oh Bertrand, the weather will not mend a whit, nay, even if it did. Dumurier Palimatus, though Bertrand knows it not, started from brief slumber at Sedan on that morning on the 29th of August, with stealthiness, with promptitude, audacity. Some three mornings after that, Brunswick, opening wide eyes, perceives the passes of the Argonne all seized, blocked with felled trees, fortified with camps, and that it is a most shifty, swift Dumouriez, this, who has outwitted him. The manoeuvre may cost Brunswick a loss of three weeks, very fatal in these circumstances. A mountain wall of forty miles lying between him and Paris, which he should have preoccupied, which how now to get possession of? Also the rain, it raineth every day, and we are in a hungry champagne poilures, a land flowing only with ditch water. How to cross this mountain wall of the Argonne, and what in the world to do with it? There are marchings and wet splashings by steep paths with sacraments and guttural interjections, forcings of Argonne passes, which unhappily will not force. Through the woods volleying war reverberates like huge gong music or Moloch's kettle drum, borne by the echoes, swollen torrents boil angrily round the foot of rocks, floating pale carcasses of men. In vain, Ilet village with its church steeple rises intact in the mountain pass between the embosoming heights. Your forced marchings and climbings have become forced slidings and tumblings back. From the hilltops thou seest nothing but dumb crags and endless wet moaning woods, the Clermont Vache, huge cow that she is, disclosing herself at intervals, flinging off her cloud blanket and soon taking it on again, drowned in the pouring heaven. The Argonne passes will not force, you must skirt the Argonne, go round by the end of it. But fancy whether the emigrant seigneurs have not got their brilliancy dulled a little, whether that foot regiment in red facings with nankeen trousers could be in field day order. In place of gasconading, a sort of desperation and hydrophobia from excess of water is threatening to supervene. Young Prince de Lagne, son of that brave literary de Lagne, the thunder god of dandies, fell backwards, shot dead in Grand Pre, the northmost of the passes. Brunswick is skirting and rounding laboriously by the extremity of the south. Four days, days of a rain as of Noah, without fire, without food. For fire you cut down green trees and produce smoke. For food you eat green grapes and produce colic, pestilential dysentery, holocotofto, delay. 
and the peasants assassinate us. They do not join us. Shrill women cry shame on us, threaten to draw their very scissors on us. O oh, ye hapless, dull, bright seigneurs and hydrophobic splashed nankeens, but oh, ten times more, ye poor sacramenting, ghastly visaged Hessians and Hulans fallen on your backs, who had no call to die there except compulsion and three halfpence a day. Nor has Mrs. Leblanc of the Golden Arm a good time of it in her bower of dripping rushes. Assassinating peasants are hanged, old constituent honourable members, though of venerable age, ride in carts with their hands tied. These are the woes of war. Thus they, sprawling and wriggling far and wide on the slopes and passes of the Argonne, are lost to Brunswick of five and twenty disastrous days. There is wriggling and struggling, facing, backing and right about facing as the positions shift and the Argonne gets partly rounded, partly forced, but still Du Maurier, force him round him as you will, sticks like a rooted fixture on the ground, fixture with many hinges, wheeling now this way, now that, showing always new front in the most unexpected manner, nowise consenting to take himself away. Recruits stream up on him, full of heart, yet rather difficult to deal with. Behind Grand Pré, for example, Grand Pré which is on the wrong side of the Argonne, for we are now forced and rounded, the full heart in one of those wheelings and showings of new front did, as it were, overset itself, as full hearts are liable to do, and there rose a shriek of Suave qui peur, and a death panic which had nigh ruined all so that the general had to come galloping and with thunder words, with gesture, stroke of drawn sword even, check and rally and bring back the sense of shame, nay, to seize the first shriekers and ringleaders, shave their heads and eyebrows and pack them forth into the world as a sign. Thus too, for really the rations are short and wet camping with hungry stomach brings bad humour, there is like to be mutiny. Whereupon again Du Maurier arrives at the head of their line with his staff and an escort of a hundred hussars. He had placed some squadrons behind them, the artillery in front. He said to them, As for you, for I will neither call you citizens nor soldiers nor my men, ni mes enfants, you see before you this artillery, behind you this cavalry. You have dishonoured yourselves by crimes. If you amend and grow to behave like this brave army which you have the honour of belonging to, you will find in me a good father, but plunderers and assassins I do not suffer here. At the smallest mutiny I'll have you shivered in pieces, haché en pièce. Seek out the scoundrels that are among you and dismiss them yourselves. I hold you responsible for them. Patience, old Dumouriez. This uncertain heap of shriekers, mutineers, were they once drilled and inured, will become a phalanxed mass of fighters, and wheel and whirl to order, swiftly like the wind or the whirlwind, tanned mustachio figures, often barefoot, even bare-backed, with sinews of iron, who require only bread and gunpowder, very sons of fire, the adroitest, hastiest, hottest ever seen, perhaps since Attila's time. They may conquer and overrun amazingly, much as that same Attila did, whose Attila's camp and battlefield thou now seest on this very ground, who, after sweeping bare the world, was with difficulty and days of tough fighting, checked here by Roman Aetius and fortune, and his dust cloud made to vanish in the east again. Strangely enough, in this shrieking confusion of a soldiery, which we saw long since fallen all suicidally out of square in suicidal collision, at Nancy or on the streets of Metz where brave Bouillet stood with drawn sword, and which has collided and ground itself to pieces worse and worse ever since, down now to such a state in this shrieking confusion and not elsewhere, lies the first germ of returning order for France. Round which we say... Poor France, nearly all ground down suicidally likewise into rubbish and chaos, will be glad to rally, to begin growing and new shaping her inorganic dust. Very slowly, through centuries, through Napoleons, Louis Philippe's and other the like media and phases, into a new, infinitely preferable France, we can hope. 
these wheelings and movements in the region of the Argonne, which are all faithfully described by Dumouriez himself, and more interesting to us than Hoyle's or Philidor's best game of chess, let us nevertheless, O oh reader, entirely omit, and hasten to remark two things. The first a minute private, the second a large public thing. Our minute private thing is the presence in the Prussian host, in that war game of the Argonne, of a certain man belonging to the sort called Immortal, who in days since then is becoming visible more and more in that character as the transitory more and more vanishes, for from of old it was remarked that when the gods appear among men it is seldom in recognisable shape. Thus Admetus's neat herds give Apollo a draught of their goatskin whey bottle, well, if they do not give him strokes with their ox rungs, not dreaming that he is the sun god. This man's name is Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He is Herzog Weimar's minister, come with the small contingent of Weimar to do insignificant unmilitary duty here, very irrecognisable to nearly all. He stands at present with drawn bridle on the height near St. Menahoud, making an experiment on the cannon fever, having ridden thither against persuasion into the dance and firing of the cannon balls, with a scientific desire to understand what that same cannon fever may be. The sound of them, says he, is curious enough, as if it were compounded of the humming of tops, the gurgling of water, and the whistle of birds. By degree you get a very uncommon sensation, which can only be described by similitude. It seems as if you were in some place extremely hot, and at the same time were completely penetrated by the heat of it, so that you feel as if you and this element you are in were perfectly on a par. The eyesight loses nothing of its strength or distinctness, and yet it is as if all things had got a kind of brown-red colour, which makes the situation and the object still more impressive on you. This is the cannon fever, as the world poet feels it. A man entirely irrecognisable, in whose irrecognisable head, meanwhile, there verily is the spiritual counterpart, and call it complement, of this same huge death-birth of the world, which now effectuates itself outwardly in the Argonne in such cannon thunder, inwardly in the irrecognisable head, quite otherwise than by thunder. Mark that man, O oh reader, as the memorablest of all the memorable in this Argonne campaign. What we say of him is not dream nor flourish of rhetoric, but scientific historic fact, as many men now at this distance see or begin to see. But the large public thing we had to remark is this, that the 20th of September 1792 was a raw morning covered with mist, that from three in the morning St. Menahou and those villages and homesteads we know of old were stirred by the rumble of artillery wagons, by the clatter of hoofs and many-footed tramp of men, all manner of military, patriot and Prussian, taking up positions on the heights of La Lune and other heights, shifting and shoving, seemingly in some dread chess game, which may the heavens turn to good. The miller of Valmy has fled dusty underground. His mill, were it never so windy, will have rest today. At seven in the morning, the mist clears off. See Kellerman, Dumouriez's second in command, with eighteen pieces of cannon and deep serried ranks drawn up round that same silent windmill on his knoll of strength. Brunswick also with serried ranks and cannon, glooming over to him from the height of La Lune, only the little brook and its little dell now parting them, so that the much longed for has come at last. Instead of hunger and dysentery we shall have sharp shot, and then Dumouriez, with force and firm front, looks on from a neighbouring height, can help only with his wishes in silence. Lo, the eighteen pieces do bluster and bark, responsive to the bluster of La Lune, and thunder clouds mount into the air, and echoes roar through all dells, far into the depths of Argonne wood, deserted now, and limbs and lives of men fly, dissipated, this way and that. Can Brunswick make an impression on them? The dull bright seigneurs stand biting their thumbs. These sans-culottes seem not to fly like poultry. 
Towards noontide, a cannon shot blows Callerman's horse from under him. There bursts a powder cart high into the air, with Nell heard over all, some swaggering and swaying observable. Brunswick will try. Camarades, cries Kellerman, vive la patrie, allons vaincre pour elle, let us conquer. Live the fatherland, rings responsive to the welcome, like rolling fire from side to side. Our ranks are as firm as rocks, and Brunswick may recross the dell, ineffectual, regain his old position on La Lune, not unbattered by the way. And so, for the length of a September day, with bluster and bark, with bellow far echoing, the cannonade lasts till sunset, and no impression made. Till an hour after sunset, the few remaining clocks of the district striking seven at this late time of day, Brunswick tries again. With not a whit better fortune, he is met by rock ranks, by shouts of Viva la patrie, and driven back, not unbattered. Whereupon he ceases, retires to the tavern of La Lune, and sets to raising a redoubt, lest he be attacked. Verily so, ye dulled bright seigneurs, make of it what ye may. Ah, and France does not rise round us in mass, and the peasants do not join us, but assassinate us, neither hanging nor any persuasion will induce them. They have lost their old distinguishing love of king and king's cloak, I fear, altogether, and will even fight to be rid of it. That seems now their humour. Nor does Austria prosper, nor the siege of Thionville. The Thionvilles, carrying their insolence to the epigrammatic pitch, have put a wooden horse on their walls, with a bundle of hay hung from him, and this inscription, When I finish my hay, you will take Thionville. To such height has the frenzy of mankind risen. The trenches of Thionville may shut, and what though those of Lee are open? The earth smiles not on us, nor the heaven, but weeps and blears itself in sour rain and worse. Our very friends insult us. We are wounded in the house of our friends. His Majesty of Prussia had a great coat when the rain came, and, contrary to all known laws, he put it on, though our two French princes, the hope of their country, had none. To which, indeed, as Goethe admits, what answer could be made? Cold and hunger and affront, colic and dysentery and death, and we here, cowering, redoubted, most unredoubtable, amid the tattered corn shocks and deformed stubble on the splashy heights of La Lune, round the mean tavern de La Lune. This is the cannonade of Valmy, wherein the world poet experimented on the cannon fever, wherein the French sans culottes did not fly like poultry. Precious to France, every soldier did his duty, and Alsacian Kellerman, how preferable to old Luckner the dismissed, began to become greater, and Egalité Fils, Equality Junior, a light gallant field officer, distinguished himself by intrepidity. It is the same intrepid individual who now, as Louis Philippe, without the equality, struggles under sad circumstances to be called King of the French for a season. End of Book One, Chapter Seven The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 1, September, Chapter 8, Exeunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 1, Chapter 8, Exeunt. But this 20th of September is otherwise a great day. For observe, while Kellerman's horse was flying, blown from under him at the mill of Valmy, our new national deputies, that shall be a national convention, are hovering and gathering about the hall of the hundred Swiss, with intent to constitute themselves. On the morrow, about noontide, Camus, the archivist, is busy verifying their powers, several hundreds of them already here. Whereupon the old legislative comes solemnly over to merge its old ashes, phoenix-like, in the body of the new, and so forthwith, returning all solemnly back to the Salle de Manège, there sits a national convention, 749 complete or complete enough, presided by Pétion, 
which proceeds directly to do business. Read that reported afternoon's debate, O oh reader. There are few debates like it. Dull reporting monitor itself becomes more dramatic than a very Shakespeare. For epigrammatic Manuel rises, speaks strange things, how the President shall have a guard of honour and lodge in the Tuileries. Rejected. And Danton rises and speaks, and Colo d'Herbois rises, and Curate Gregoire and Lame Couton of the Mountain rises, and in rapid Melibian stanzas, only a few lines each, they propose motions, not a few. That the cornerstone of our new constitution is sovereignty of the people. That our constitution shall be accepted by the people or be null. Further, that the people ought to be avenged and have right judges. That the imposts must continue till new order. That land and another property be sacred for ever. Finally, that royalty from this day is abolished in France. Decreed all before four o'clock strike with acclamation of the world. The tree was all so ripe, only shake it and there fall such yellow cartloads. And so, in the Valmy region, as soon as the news come, what stir is this, audible, visible from our muddy heights of La Lune? Universal shouting of the French on their opposite hillside, caps raised on bayonets and a sound as of République, vive la République, borne dubious on the wind. On the morrow morning, so to speak, Brunswick slings his knapsacks before day, lights any fires he has, and marches without tap of drum. Dumouriez finds ghastly symptoms in that camp, latrines full of blood. The chivalrous king of Prussia, for he, as we saw, is here in person, may long rue the day, may look colder than ever on these dull bright seigneurs and French princes their country's hope and on the whole put on his greatcoat without ceremony, happy that he has one. They retire, all retire, with convenient dispatch, through a champagne trodden into a quagmire, the wild weather pouring on them. Dumouriez through his calamans and dions pricking them a little in the hinder parts. A little, not much. Now pricking, now negotiating, for Brunswick has his eyes opened, and the majesty of Prussia is a repentant majesty. Nor has Austria prospered, nor the wooden horse of Thionville bitten his hay, nor Lille City surrendered itself. The Lille trenches opened on the 29th of the month, with balls and shells and red-hot balls, as if not trenches, but Vesuvius and the pit had opened. It was frightful, say all eyewitnesses, but it is ineffectual. The Lillers have risen to such temper, especially after these news from Argonne and the East. Not a sans indispensables in Lear that would surrender for a king's ransom. Red-hot balls rain day and night, six thousand or so, and bombs filled internally with oil of turpentine which splashes up in flame, mainly on the dwellings of the saints colottes and poor, the streets of the rich being spared. But the saints colottes get water pails, form quenching regulations. The ball is in Peter's house, the ball is in John's. They divide their lodging and substance with each other, shout Viva la République and faint not in heart. A ball thunders through the main chamber of the Hôtel de Ville while the commune is there assembled. We are in permanent, says one coldly, proceeding with his business, and the ball remains permanent too, sticking in the wall, probably to this day. The Austrian Archduchess, Queen's sister, will herself see red artillery fired. In their overhaste to satisfy an Archduchess, two mortars explode and kill thirty persons. It is in vain. Lille, often burning, is always quenched again. Lille will not yield. The very boys deftly wrench the matches out of fallen bombs. A man clutches a rolling ball with his hat, which takes fire. When cool, they crown it with a bonnet rouge. Memorable also be that nimble barber, who, when the bomb burst beside him, snatched up a shred of it, introduced soap and lather into it, crying, Voilà mon plat à barbe, my new shaving dish, and shaved fourteen people on the spot. Bravo, thou nimble shaver, worthy to shave old spectral red cloak and find treasures. On the eighth day of this desperate siege, the sixth day of October, Austria, finding it fruitless, draws off 
with no pleasurable consciousness, rapidly du Maurier, tending thitherward and Lille too, black with ashes and smoulder but jubilant sky high, flings its gates open. The plat d'Arbab became fashionable, no patriot of an elegant turn, says Messier several years afterwards, but shaves himself out of the splinter of a Lille bomb. Quid multa, by many words. The invaders are in flight. Brunswick's host, the third part of it gone to death, staggers disastrous along the steep highways of Champagne, spreading out also into the fields of a tough, spongy, red-coloured clay, like Pharaoh through a red sea of mud, says Goethe, for he also lay broken chariots and riders and foot seemed sinking around. On the eleventh morning of October, the world poet, struggling northwards out of Verdun, which he had entered southward some five weeks ago in quite other order, discerned the following phenomenon and formed part of it. Towards three in the morning, without having had any sleep, we were about mounting our carriage, drawn up at the door, when an insuperable obstacle disclosed itself, for they rolled on already between the pavement stones which were crushed up into a ridge on each side, an uninterrupted column of sick wagons through the town, and all was trodden as into a morass. While we stood waiting what could be made of it, our landlord, the Knight of St. Louis, pressed past us without salutation. He had been a Cologne's notable in 1787, an emigrant since, had returned to his home jubilant with the Prussians, but must now forth again into the wide world, followed by a servant carrying a little bundle on his stick. The activity of our alert Lisieux shone eminent, and on this occasion too brought us on, for he struck into a small gap of the wagon row, and held the advancing team back till we, with our six and our four horses, got intercalated, after which, in my light little coachlet, I could breathe freer. We are now under way, at a funeral pace, but still under way. The day broke, we found ourselves at the outlet of the town, in a tumult and turmoil without measure. All sorts of vehicles, few horsemen, innumerable foot-people, were crossing each other on the great esplanade before the gate. We turned to the right with our column towards Estaing, on a limited highway, with ditches at each side. Self-preservation in so monstrous a press knew now no pity, no respect of aught. Not far before us there fell down a horse of an ammunition wagon. They cut the traces and let it lie. And now, as the three others could not bring their load along, they cut them also loose, tumbled the heavy-packed vehicle into the ditch, and with the smallest retardation we had to drive on, right over the horse, which was just about to rise, and I saw too clearly how its legs under the wheels went crashing and quivering. Horse and foot endeavoured to escape from the narrow, laborious highway into the meadows, but these two were rain to ruin, overflowed by full ditches, the connection of the footpaths everywhere interrupted. Four gentlemanlike, handsome, well-dressed French soldiers waded for a time beside our carriage, wonderfully clean and neat, and had such art of picking their steps that their footgear testified no higher than the ankle to the muddy pilgrimage these good people found themselves engaged in. That under such circumstances one saw, in ditches, in meadows, in fields and crofts, dead horses enough, was natural to the case, by and by, however, you found them also flayed, the fleshly parts even cut away, sad token of the universal distress. Thus we fared on, every moment in danger, at the smallest stoppage on our own part, of being ourselves tumbled overboard, under which circumstances, truly, the careful dexterity of our lisieur could not be sufficiently praised, the same talent showed itself at Estaing, where we arrived towards noon, and descried over the beautiful, well-built little town, through streets and on squares, around and beside us, one sense-confusing tumult. The mass rolled this way and that, and all struggling forward, each hindered the other. Unexpectedly our carriage drew up before a stately house in the marketplace. Master and mistress of the mansion saluted us in reverent distance. Dexterously so, though we knew it not, had said we were the king of Prussia's brother. But now from the ground-floor windows, looking over the whole marketplace, 
we had the endless tumult lying, as it were, palpable. All sorts of walkers, soldiers in uniform, marauders, stout but sorrowing citizens and peasants, women and children, crushed and jostled each other amid vehicles of all forms. Ammunition wagons, baggage wagons, carriages, single, double and multiplex, such hundredfold miscellany of teams requisitioned or lawfully owned, making way, hitting together, hindering each other, rolled here to right and to left. Horned cattle, too, were struggling on, probably herds that had been put in requisition. Riders, you saw a few, but the elegant carriages of the emigrants, many-coloured, lacquered, gilt and silvered, evidently by the best builders, caught your eye. The crisis of the strait, however, arose further on a little, where the crowded marketplace had to introduce itself into a street, straight indeed and good, but proportionably far too narrow. I have in my life seen nothing like it. The aspect of it might perhaps be compared to that of a swollen river which has been raging over meadows and fields and is now again obliged to press itself through a narrow bridge and flow on in its bounded channel. Down the long street, all visible from our windows, there swelled continually the strangest tide. A high double-seated travelling coach towered visible over the flood of things. We thought of the fair French women we had seen in the morning. It was not they, however, it was Count Haugwitz, him you could look at with a kind of sardonic malice, rocking onwards, step by step there. In such untriumphant procession has the Brunswick Manifesto issued. Nay, in worse, in negotiation with these miscreants, the first news of which produced such a revulsion in the emigrant nature as put our scientific world poet in fear for the wits of several. There is no help. They must fare on, these poor emigrants, angry with all persons and things, and making all persons angry in the hapless course they struck into. Landlord and landlady testify to you, at tables dot, how insupportable these Frenchmen are, how, in spite of such humiliation, of poverty and probable beggary, there is ever the same struggle for precedence, the same forwardness and want of discretion. High in honour, at the head of the table, you with your own eyes observe not a seigneur, but the automaton of a seigneur, fallen into dotage, still worshipped, reverently waited on and fed. In miscellaneous seats is a miscellany of soldiers, commissaries, adventurers, consuming silently their barbarian victuals. On all brows is to be read a hard destiny. All are silent, for each has his own sufferings to bear, and looks forth into misery without bounds. One hasty wanderer coming in and eating without ungraciousness what is set before him, the landlord lets off almost scot-free. He is, whispered the landlord to me, the first of these cursed people I have seen condescend to taste our German black bread. And Dumouriez is in Paris, lauded and feasted, paraded in glittering saloons, floods of beautifulest blonde dresses and broadcloth coats flowing past him, endless in admiring joy. One night, nevertheless, in the splendour of one such scene, he sees himself suddenly apostrophised by a squalid, unjoyful figure, who has come in uninvited, nay, despite of all lackeys, an unjoyful figure. The figure is come in express mission from the Jacobins to inquire sharply, better then than later, touching certain things. Shaven eyebrows of volunteer patriots, for instance? Also, your threats of shivering in pieces? Also, why you have not chased Brunswick hotly enough? Thus, with sharp croak, inquires the figure, Ah, c'est vous qu'on appelle Marat. You are he, they call Marat, answers the general, and turns coldly on his heel. Marat! The blonde gowns quiver like aspens, the dress coats gather round. Actor Talma, for it is his house, and almost the very chandelier lights are blue, till this obscene spectrum or visual appearance vanish back into native night. General de Maurier, in few brief days, is gone again towards the Netherlands, will attack the Netherlands winter though it be. 
and General Montesquieu on the southeast has driven in the Sardinian majesty, nay, almost without a shot fired, has taken Savoy from him, which longs to become a piece of the Republic. And General Castine on the northeast has dashed forth on Spires in its arsenal, and then on electoral ments, not uninvited, wherein are German Democrats and no shadow of an elector now so that in the last days of October, Frau Forster, a daughter of Heinz, somewhat democratic, walking out of the gate of Mentz with her husband, finds French soldiers playing at bowls with cannonballs there. Forster trips cheerfully over one iron bomb with, Live the Republic! A black-bearded National Guard answers, El vivre bien sans vous! It will probably live independently of you. End of Book 1, Chapter 8 The French Revolution, A History by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 2, Regicide Chapter 1, The Deliberative This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 2, Chapter 1, The Deliberative France, therefore, has done two things very completely. She has hurled back her Sumerian invaders far over the marches, and likewise she has shattered her own internal social constitution, even to the minutest fibre of it, into wreck and dissolution. Utterly it is all altered, from king down to parish constable, all authorities, magistrates, judges, persons that bore rule, have had on the sudden to alter themselves so far as needful, or else on the sudden and not without violence to be altered. A patriot executive council of ministers with a patriot Danton in it, and then a whole nation and national convention have taken care of that. Not a parish constable in the furthest hamlet who has said de par le roi and shown loyalty but must retire, making way for a new, improved parish constable who can say de par la république. It is a change such as history must beg her readers to imagine, undescribed. An instantaneous change of the whole body politic, the soul politic being all changed, such a change as few bodies, politic or other, can experience in this world. Say, perhaps, such as poor nymph Samele's body did experience when she would needs, with a woman's humour, see her Olympian Jove as very Jove, and so stood poor nymph this moment Samele, next moment not Samele, but flame and a statue of red-hot ashes. France has looked upon democracy, seen it face to face. The Sumerian invaders will rally in humbler temper with better or worse luck. The wreck and dissolution must reshape itself into a social arrangement as it can and may. But as for this national convention, which is to settle everything, if it do, as Deputy Payne and France generally expect, get all finished in a few months, we shall call it a most deft convention. In truth, it is very singular to see how this mercurial French people plunges suddenly from vive le roi to vive la république and goes simmering and dancing, shaking off daily, so to speak, and trampling into the dust its old social garnages, ways of thinking, rules of existing, and cheerfully dances towards the ruleless, unknown, with such hope in its heart and nothing but freedom, equality and brotherhood in its mouth. Is it two centuries or is it only two years since all France roared simultaneously to the welcome, bursting forth into sound and smoke at its feast of pikes, live the restorer of French liberty? Three short years ago there was still Versailles and an Oeil de Boeuf. Now there is that watched circuit of the temple, girt with dragon-eyed municipals, where, as in its final limbo, royalty lies extinct. In the year 1789, constituent deputy Barret wept in his break-of-day newspaper at sight of a reconciled King Louis. And now, in 1792, convention deputy Barret, perfectly tearless, may be considering whether the reconciled King Louis shall be guillotined or not. 
old garnitures and social vestures drop off, we say, so fast, being indeed quite decayed, and are trodden under the national dance. And the new vestures, where are they? The new modes and rules. Liberty, equality, fraternity, not vestures, but the wish for vestures. The nation is, for the present, figuratively speaking, naked. It has no rule or vesture, but is naked, a sanscalotic nation. So far, therefore, in such manner have our patriot Brissot's guardes triumphed. Vernio's Ezekiel visions of the fall of thrones and crowns, which he spake hypothetically and prophetically in the spring of the year, have suddenly come to fulfilment in the autumn. Our eloquent patriots of the legislative, like strong conjurers by the word of their mouth, have swept royalism with its old modes and formulas to the winds, and shall now govern a France free of formulas. Free of formulas, and yet man lives not except with formulas, with customs, ways of doing and living. No text truer than this, which will hold true from the tea table and tailor's shop board up to the high senate house, solemn temples, nay, through all provinces of mind and imagination, onwards to the utmost confines of articulate being. Upi homine sunt, modi sunt. There are modes wherever there are men. It is the deepest law of man's nature whereby man is a craftsman and tool-using animal, not the slave of impulse, chance and brute nature, but in some measure their lord. Twenty-five millions of men suddenly stripped bare of their modi and dancing them down in that manner are a terrible thing to govern. Eloquent patriots of the legislative, meanwhile, have precisely this problem to solve. Under the name and nickname of statesmen, hommes d'état, of moderate men, moderantins, of brissantins, rolandins, finally of girondins, they shall become world famous in solving it. For the twenty-five millions are Gallic effervescent too, filled both with hope of the unutterable, of universal fraternity and golden age, and with terror of the unutterable Sumerian Europe all rallying on us. It is a problem like few. Truly, if man, as the philosophers brag, did to any extent look before and after, what, one may ask, in many cases would become of him? What, in this case, would become of these 749 men? The convention, seen clearly before and after, were a paralysed convention. Seen clearly to the length of its own nose, it is not paralysed. To the convention itself, neither the work nor the method of doing it is doubtful. To make the constitution, to defend the republic till that be made. Speedily enough, accordingly, there has been a committee of the constitution got together. C.A., or constituent, constitution builder by trade. Condor, say, fit for better things. Deputy Payne, foreign benefactor of the species, with that red carbuncled face and the black beaming eyes. Harold de Seychelles, ex-parlementeer, one of the handsomest men in France. These, with inferior guild brethren, are girt cheerfully to the work, will once more make the constitution, let us hope, more effectually than last time. For that the constitution can be made, who doubts? Unless the gospel of Jean-Jacques came into the world in vain... True, our last constitution did tumble within the year, so lamentably. But what then, except sort the rubbish and boulders and build them up again better? Widen your basis, for one thing, to universal suffrage, if need be. Exclude rotten materials, royalism and such like, for another thing. And in brief, build, O unspeakable C.A. and company, unwearied. Frequent perilous downrushing of scaffolding and rubble work, be that an irritation, no discouragement. Start ye always again, clearing aside the wreck, if with broken limbs, yet with whole hearts, and build, we say, in the name of heaven, till either the work do stand, or else mankind abandon it, and the constitution builders be paid off with laughter and tears. One good time in the course of eternity, it was appointed that this of social contract too should try itself out. And so the Committee of Constitution shall toil, 
with hope and faith, with no disturbance from any reader of these pages. To make the Constitution then, and return home joyfully in a few months, this is the prophecy our National Convention gives of itself. By this scientific program shall its operations and events go on. But from the best scientific program in such a case to the actual fulfilment, what a difference. Every reunion of men, is it not, as we often say, a reunion of incalculable influences? Every unit of it a microcosm of influences, of which how shall science calculate or prophecy? Science which cannot, with all its calculuses, differential, integral and of variations, calculate the problem of three gravitating bodies, ought to hold her peace here, and say only... In this National Convention there are 749 very singular bodies that gravitate and do much else, who probably, in an amazing manner, will work the appointment of heaven. Of national assemblages, parliaments, congresses, which have long sat, which are of saturnine temperament, above all which are not dreadfully in earnest, something may be computed or conjectured, yet even these are a kind of mystery in progress, whereby we see the journalist reporter find livelihood, even these jolt madly out of the ruts from time to time. How much more a poor national convention of French vehemence urged on at such velocity, without routine, without rut, track or landmark, and dreadfully in earnest every man of them, it is a parliament, literally, such as there was never elsewhere in the world. Themselves are new, unarranged. They are the heart and presiding centre of a France fallen wholly into maddest disarrangement. From all cities, hamlets, from the utmost ends of this France, with its 25 million vehement souls, thick streaming influences storm in on that same heart in the Salle de Manege and storm out again, such fiery venous arterial circulation is the function of that heart. 749 human individuals, we say, never sat together on earth under more original circumstances. Common individuals, most of them, or not far from common, yet in virtue of the position they occupied, so notable. How in this wild piping of the whirlwind of human passions, with death, victory, terror, valour, and all height and all depth, peeling and piping, these men, left to their own guidance, will speak and act. Readers know well that this French National Convention, quite contrary to its own programme, became the astonishment and horror of mankind. A kind of apocalyptic convention, or black dream become real, concerning which history seldom speaks except in the way of interjection, how it covered France with woe, delusion and delirium, and from its bosom there went forth death on the pale horse. To hate this poor national convention is easy. To praise and love it has not been found impossible. It is, as we say, a parliament in the most original circumstances. To us, in these pages, be it a fuliginous, fiery mystery where upper has met nether, and in such alternate glare and blackness of darkness poor bedazzled mortals know not which is upper, which is nether, but rage and plunge distractedly as mortals in that case will do. A convention which has to consume itself suicidally and become dead ashes with its world behoves us not to enter exploratively its dim, embroiled deeps, yet to stand with unwavering eyes, looking how it welters, what notable phases and occurrences it will successively throw up. One general superficial circumstance we remark with praise, the force of politeness. To such depth has the sense of civilization penetrated man's life, no Drouet, no Legendre, in the maddest tug of war, can altogether shake it off. Debates of senates, dreadfully in earnest, are seldom given frankly to the world, else perhaps they would surprise it. Did not the Grand Monarch himself once chase his Louvois with a pair of brandished tongs? But reading long volumes of these convention debates, all in a foam with furious earnestness, 
earnest many times to the extent of life and death, one is struck rather with the degree of continence they manifest in speech, and how in such wild ebullition there is still a kind of polite rule struggling for mastery, and the forms of social life never altogether disappear. These men, though they menace with clenched right hands, do not clench one another by the collar. They draw no daggers except for oratorical purposes, and this not often. Profane swearing is almost unknown, though the reports are frank enough. We find only one or two oaths, oaths by Marat, reported in all. For the rest, that there is effervescence, who doubts? Effervescence enough. Decrees passed by acclamation today, repeated by vociferation tomorrow. Temper fitful, most rotatory changeful, always headlong. The voice of the orator is covered with rumours. A hundred honourable members rush with menaces towards the left side of the hall. President has broken three bells in succession. Claps on his hat as signal that the country is near ruined. A fiercely effervescent old Gallic assemblage. Ah, how the loud sick sounds of debate and of life, which is a debate, sink silent one after another, so loud now and in a little while so low. Brennus and those antique gale captains in their way to Rome, to Galatia and such places, whither they were in the habit of marching in the most fiery manner, had debates as effervescent, doubt it not, though no moniteur has reported them. They scolded in Celtic Welsh, those Brennuses, neither were they sans calotte, nay, rather breeches, bracai, say of felt or rough leather, were the only thing they had, being, as Livy testifies, naked down to the haunches. And see, it is the same sort of work, and of men still, now, when they have got coats, and speak nasally a kind of broken Latin. But on the whole, does not time envelop this present national convention as it did those Brennuses and ancient august senates in felt breeches? Time, surely, and also eternity. Dim dusk of time, or noon, which will be dusk, and then there is night and silence, and time with all its sick noises is swallowed in the still sea. Pity thy brother, O son of Adam. The angriest frothy jargon that he utters, is it not properly the whimpering of an infant which cannot speak what ails it, but is in distress clearly in the inwards of it, and so must squall and whimper continually till its mother take it and get it to sleep? This convention is not four days old, and the melodious Melibuean stanzas that shook down royalty are still fresh in our ear when there bursts out a new diapason unhappily of discord this time. For speech has been made of a thing difficult to speak of well, the September massacres. How deal with these September massacres, with the Paris Commune that presided over them? A Paris Commune, hateful, terrible, before which the poor effete legislative had to quail and sit quiet. And now, if a young, omnipotent convention will not so quail and sit, what steps shall it take? Have a departmental guard in its pay, answer the Girondins and friends of order. A guard of national volunteers, missioned from all the 83 or 85 departments for that express end. These will keep September as tumultuous communes in a due state of submissiveness, the convention in a due state of sovereignty. So have the Friends of Order answered, sitting in committee and reporting, and even a decree has been passed of the required tenor. Nay, certain departments, as the VAR or Marseille, in mere expectation and assurance of a decree, have their contingent of volunteers already on march. Brave Marseillaise, foremost on the 10th of August, will not be hindmost here. Fathers gave their sons a musket and twenty-five louis, says Barbaroux, and bade them march. Can anything be properer? A republic that will found itself on justice must needs investigate September massacres. A convention calling itself national ought it not to be guarded by a national force? Alas, reader, it seems so to the eye, and yet there is much to be said and argued. Thou beholdest here the small beginning of a controversy which mere logic will not settle. Two small wellsprings, September 
departmental guard, or rather at bottom they are but one and the same small wellspring, which will swell and widen into waters of bitterness, all manner of subsidiary streams and brooks of bitterness flowing in from this side and that, till it become a wide river of bitterness, of rage and separation, which can subside only into the catacombs. This departmental guard, decreed by overwhelming majorities and then repealed for peace's sake and not to insult Paris, is again decreed more than once. Nay, it is partially executed, and the very men that are to be of it are seen visibly parading the Paris streets, shouting once, being overtaken with liquor, A bas Marat! Down with Marat! Nevertheless, decreed never so often, it is repealed just as often, and continues for some seven months, an angry, noisy hypothesis only, a fair possibility struggling to become a reality, but which shall never be one, which, after endless struggling, shall in February next sink into sad rest, dragging much along with it. So singular are the ways of men and honourable members. But on this fourth day of the Convention's existence, as we said, which is the 25th of September, 1792, there comes committee report on that decree of the departmental guard and speech of repealing it. There come denunciations of anarchy, of a dictatorship which let the incorruptible Robespierre consider. There come denunciations of a certain Journal de la République, once called Ami du Peuple, and so thereupon there comes, visibly stepping up, visibly standing aloft on the tribune, ready to speak, the bodily spectrum of people's friend Marat. Shriki 749, it is verily Marat, he and not another. Marat is no phantasm of the brain or mere lying impress of printer's types, but a thing material, of joint and sinew, and a certain small stature. He behold him there in his blackness, in his dingy squalor, a living fraction of chaos and old night, visibly incarnate, desirous to speak. It appears, says Marat to the shrieking assembly, that a great many persons here are enemies of mine. All, all, shriek hundreds of voices, enough to drown any people's friend. But Marat will not drown. He speaks and croaks explanation, croaks with such reasonableness, air of sincerity, that repentant pity smothers anger, and the shrieks subside or even become applauses. For this convention is unfortunately the crankest of machines. It shall be pointing eastward with stiff violence this moment, and then do but touch some spring dexterously, the whole machine, clattering and jerking seven hundredfold, will whirl with great crash, and next moment is pointing westward. Thus Marat, absolved and applauded, victorious in this turn of fence, is, as the debate goes on, pricked at again by some dexterous Girondin, and then the shrieks rise anew, and decree of accusation is on the point of passing, till the dingy people's friend bobs aloft once more, croaks once more persuasive stillness, and the degree of accusation sinks, whereupon he draws forth a pistol, and setting it to his head, the seat of such thought and prophecy says, if they had passed their accusation decree, he, the people's friend, would have blown his brains out. A people's friend has that faculty in him. For the rest, as to this of the 260,000 aristocrat heads, Marat candidly says, c'est là mon avis, such is my opinion. Also, it is not indisputable. No power on earth can prevent me from seeing into traitors and unmasking them. By my superior originality of mind, an honourable member like this friend of the people, few terrestrial parliaments have had. We observe, however, that this first onslaught by the friends of order, as sharp and prompt as it was, has failed. For neither can Robespierre, summoned out by talk of dictatorship and greeted with the like rumour on showing himself be thrown into prison, into accusation, not though Barbaro openly bear testimony against him and sign it on paper. 
With such sanctified meekness does the incorruptible lift his sea-green cheek to the smiter, lift his thin voice, and with Jesuitic dexterity plead and prosper, asking at last in a prosperous manner, But what witnesses has the citoyen Barbaroux to support his testimony? Moi! cries red-hot Rebecca, standing up, striking his breast with both hands, and answering, Me! Nevertheless, the sea-green pleads again and makes it good, the long hurly-burly, personal merely, while so much public matter lies fallow, has ended in the order of the day. O oh, friends of the Gironde, why will you occupy our august sessions with mere paltry personalities while the grand nationality lies in such a state? The Gironde has touched this day on the foul black spot of its fair convention domain, has trodden on it, and yet not trodden it down. Alas, it is a wellspring, as we said, this black spot, and will not tread down. End of Book 2, Chapter 1《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 2, Regicide Chapter 2, The Executive This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 2, Chapter 2, The Executive May we not conjecture, therefore, that round this grand enterprise of making the Constitution there will, as heretofore, very strange embroilments gather, and questions and interest complicate themselves, so that after a few or even several months the Convention will not have settled everything. Alas, the whole tide of questions comes rolling, boiling, growing ever wider without end among which, apart from this question of September and anarchy, let us notice those which emerge oftener than the others and promise to become leading questions. Of the armies, of the subsistences, thirdly, of the dethroned king. As to the armies, public defence must evidently be put on a proper footing, for Europe seems coalizing itself again. One is apprehensive even England will join it. Happily, Dumouriez prospers in the north. Nay, what if he should prove too prosperous and become liberticide, murderer of freedom? Dumouriez prospers through this winter season, yet not without lamentable complaints. Sleek Pache, the Swiss schoolmaster, he that sat frugal in his alley, the wonder of neighbours, has got lately, whither thinks the reader, to be minister of war. Madame Roland, struck with his sleek ways, recommended him to her husband as clerk. The sleek clerk had no need of salary, being of true patriotic temper. He would come with a bit of bread in his pocket to save dinner and time, and munching incidentally do three men's work in a day. Punctual, silent, frugal, the sleek tartuffe that he was. Wherefore Roland, in the late overturn, recommended him to be war minister. And now, it would seem, he is secretly undermining Roland, playing into the hands of your hotter Jacobins and September Commune, and cannot, like strict Roland, be the veto de coquet. How the sleek Pache might mine and undermine, one knows not well. This, however, one does know, that his war office has become a den of thieves and confusion, such as all men shudder to behold. That the citizen Hassenfratz, as head clerk, sits there in bonnet rouge, in rapine, in violence, in some mathematical calculation, a most insolent, red, night-capped man. That Pash munches his pocket loaf amid head clerks and sub-clerks, and has spent all the war estimates. That furnishes scour in gigs all over districts of France and drive bargains. And lastly, that the army gets next to no furniture. No shoes, though it is winter, no clothes, some have not even arms. In the army of the south, complains an honourable member, there are thirty thousand pairs of breeches wanting, a most scandalous want. Roland's strict soul is sick to see the course things take, but what can he do? Keep his own department strict, rebuke and repress wheresoever possible, at lowest complain. He can complain in letter after letter to a national convention, to France, to posterity, the universe, grow ever more querulous, indignant, till at last may he not grow wearisome? 
for is it not this continual text of his at bottom a rather barren one? How astonishing that in a time of revolt and abrogation of all law but canon law, there should be such unlawfulness. Intrepid veto of scoundrels, narrow faithful, respectable, methodic man, work thou in that manner, since happily it is thy manner, and wear thyself away, though ineffectual, not profitless in it, then nor now. The brave Dame Roland, bravest of all French women, begins to have misgivings. The figure of Danton has too much of the Sardanapalus character at a Republican Rolandin dinner table. Clute, speaker of mankind, proses sad stuff about a universal republic or union of all peoples and kindreds in one and the same fraternal bond. Of which bond, how is it to be tied, one unhappily sees not. It is also an indisputable, unaccountable or accountable fact that grains are becoming scarcer and scarcer. Riots for grain, tumultuous assemblages demanding to have the price of grain fixed, abound far and near. The mayor of Paris and other poor mayors are like to have their difficulties. Pétion was re-elected mayor of Paris but has declined being now a convention legislator. Wise surely to decline, for... Besides this of grains and all the rest, there is in these times an improvised insurrectionary commune passing into an elected legal one, getting their account settled, not without irritancy. Pétion has declined. Nevertheless, many do covet and canvas. After months of scrutinising, balloting, arguing and jargoning, one Dr. Chambon gets the post of honour, who will not long keep it, but be, as we shall see, literally crushed out of it. Think also if the private sans culotte has not his difficulties in a time of dearth. Bread, according to the people's friend, may be some six sous per pound, a day's wages, some fifteen, and grim winter here. How the poor man continues living and so seldom starves by miracle. Happily in these days he can enlist and have himself shot by the Austrians in an unusually satisfactory manner for the rights of man. But Commandant Santerre, in this so straitened condition of the flower market and state of equality and liberty, proposes through the newspapers two remedies, or at least palliatives. First, that all classes of men should live, two days of the week, on potatoes. Then second, that every man should hang his dog. Hereby, as the Commandant thinks, the saving, which indeed he computes to so many sacks, would be very considerable. A cheerfuller form of inventive stupidity than Commandant saint dwells in no human soul. Inventive stupidity, embedded in health, courage and good nature, much to be commended. My whole strength, he tells the convention once, is day and night at the service of my fellow citizens. If they find me worthless, they will dismiss me. I will return and brew beer. Or figure what correspondence a poor Roland, Minister of the Interior, must have on this of grains alone. Free trade in grain, impossibility to fix the prices of grain. On the other hand, clamour and necessity to fix them. Political economy lecturing from the Home Office with demonstration clear as scripture, ineffectual for the empty national stomach. The mayor of Chartres, like to be eaten himself, cries to the convention. The convention sends honourable members in deputation who endeavour to feed the multitude by miraculous spiritual methods, but cannot. The multitude, in spite of all eloquence, come bellowing round. We'll have the grain prices fixed, and at a moderate elevation, or else the Honourable Deputies hanged on the spot. The Honourable Deputies, reporting this business, admit that, on the edge of horrid death, they did fix, or affect to fix, the price of grain, for which, be it also noted, the Convention, a convention that will not be trifled with, sees good to reprimand them. But as to the origin of these grain riots, is it not most probably your secret royalists again? Glimpses of priests were discernible in this of Chartres to the eye of patriotism. Or indeed may not the root of it all lie in the temple prison in the heart of a perjured king, well as we guard him. Unhappy perjured king.
And so there shall be baker's cues by and by, more sharp-tempered than ever, on every baker's door rabbit an iron ring and coil of rope, whereon, with firm grip, on this side and that, we form our cue. But mischievous, deceitful persons cut the rope, and our cue becomes a ravelment, wherefore the coil must be made of iron chain. Also there shall be prices of grain well fixed, but then no grain purchasable by them. Bread not to be had except by tickets from the mare, few ounces per mouth daily, after long swaying with firm grip on the chain of the queue. And hunger shall stalk direful, and wrath and suspicion, wetted to the preternatural pitch, shall stalk, as those other preternatural shapes of gods in their wrathfulness were discerned stalking in glare and gloom of that fire ocean when Troy town fell. End of Book 2, Chapter 2《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 2, Regicide, Chapter 3, Discrowned. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2, Chapter 3, Discrowned. But the question more pressing than all on the legislator as yet is this third, what shall be done with King Louis? King Louis, now king and majesty to his own family alone, in their own prison apartment alone, has been Louis Capet and the traitor Vito with the rest of France. Shut in his circuit of the temple, he has heard and seen the loud whirl of things, yells of September massacres, Brunswick war thunders dying off in disaster and discomfiture. He, passive, a spectator merely, waiting whither it would please to whirl with him. From the neighbouring windows, the curious, not without pity, might see him walking daily at a certain hour in the temple garden with his queen, sister and two children, all that now belongs to him in this earth. Quietly he walks and waits, for he is not of lively feelings and is of a devout heart. The weary, irresolute has at least no need of resolving now. His daily meals, lessons to his son, daily walk in the garden, daily game at ombre or draughts, fill up the day. The morrow will provide for itself. The morrow indeed, and yet how, Louis asks, how? France, with perhaps still more solicitude, asks how? A king dethroned by insurrection is verily not easy to dispose of. Keep him prisoner. He is a secret centre for the disaffected, for endless plots, attempts and hopes of theirs. Banish him. He is an open centre for them. His royal war standard, with what of divinity it has, unrolls itself, summoning the world. Put him to death? A cruel, questionable extremity, that too. And yet the likeliest in these extreme circumstances of insurrectionary men whose own life and death lies staked, Accordingly, it is said, from the last step of the throne to the first of the scaffold, there is a short distance. But on the whole, we will remark here that this business of Louis looks altogether different now, as seen overseas and at the distance of forty-four years, than it looked then in France, and struggling, confused all round one. For indeed it is a most lying thing, that same past tense always so beautiful, sad, almost Elysian sacred, in the moonlight of memory, it seems, and seems only. For observe, always, one most important element is surreptitiously, we not noticing it, withdrawn from the past time, the haggard element of fear. Not there does fear dwell, not uncertainty nor anxiety, but it dwells here, haunting us, tracking us, running like an accursed ground discord through all the music tones of our existence, making the tense a mere present one. Just so is it with this of Louis. Why smite the fallen, asks magnanimity, out of danger now? He has fallen so low, this once high man, no criminal nor traitor, how far from it, but the unhappiness of human solecisms, whom, if abstract justice had to pronounce upon, she might well become concrete pity and pronounce only sobs and dismissal. So argues retrospective magnanimity, but pusillanimity, present, prospective? 
Reader, thou hast never lived for months under the rustle of Prussian gallows ropes. Never wert thou a portion of a national Sahara waltz. Twenty-five millions running distracted to fight Brunswick. Knights errant themselves, when they conquered giants, usually slew the giants. Quarter was only for other knights errant who knew courtesy and the laws of battle. The French nation, in simultaneous desperate dead pull, and as if by miracle of madness, has pulled down the most dread Goliath, huge with the growth of ten centuries, and cannot believe, though his giant bulk covering acres lies prostrate, bound with peg and pack thread, that he will not rise again, man devouring, that the victory is not partly a dream. Terror has its scepticism, miraculous victory its rage of vengeance. Then, as to criminality, is the prostrated giant who will devour us if he rise an innocent giant? Curate Gregoire, who indeed is now Constitutional Bishop Gregoire, asserts in the heat of eloquence that kingship by the very nature of it is a crime capital, that kings' houses are wild beast dens. Lastly, consider this, that there is on record a trial of Charles I. This printed trial of Charles I is sold and read everywhere at present. Gal spectacle! Thus did the English people judge their tyrant and become the first of free peoples, which feat, by the grace of destiny, may not France now rival? Scepticism of terror, rage of miraculous victory, sublime spectacle to the universe, all things point one fatal way. Such leading questions and their endless incidental ones of September anarchists and departmental guard, of grain riots, plaintiff interior ministers, of armies, huss and fruts, dilapidations, and what is to be done with Louis, beleaguer and embroil this convention which would so gladly make the constitution, rather. All which questions, too, as we often urge of such things, are in growth. They grow in every French head, and can be seen growing also very curiously in this mighty welter of parliamentary debate, of public business, which the Convention has to do. A question emerges, so small at first, is put off, submerged, but always re-emerges, bigger than before. It is a curious, indeed an indescribable sort of growth which such things have. We perceive, however, both by its frequent re-emergence and by its rapid enlargement of bulk, that this question of King Louis will take the lead of all the rest. And truly, in that case, it will take the lead in a much deeper sense. For as Aaron's rod swallowed all the other serpents, so will the foremost question, whichever may get foremost, absorb all other questions and interests, and from it and the decision of it will they all, so to speak, be born or newborn, and have shape, physiognomy and destiny corresponding. It was a point of fate that, in this wide, weltering, strangely growing, monstrous, stupendous imbroglio of convention business, the grand first parent of all the questions, controversies, measures and enterprises which were to be evolved there to the world's astonishment, should be this question of King Louis. End of Book 2, Chapter 3「The French Revolution – A History » by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3 – The Guillotine Book 2 – Regicide Chapter 4 – The Loser Pays This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2 – Chapter 4 – The Loser Pays The 6th of November, 1792, was a great day for the Republic. Outwardly, over the frontiers, inwardly in the Salle de Manège, Outwardly, for Dumouriez, overrunning the Netherlands, did on that day come in contact with Saxtessian and the Austrians, Dumouriez wide-winged, they wide-winged, at and around the village of Germap near Mons. And fire-hail is whistling far and wide there, the great guns playing, and the small, so many green heights getting fringed and maned with red fire and Dumouriez is swept back on this wing and swept back on that, and is like to be swept back utterly, when he rushes up in person, the prompt polymatus, speaks a prompt word or two, and then with clear tenor pipe, uplifts the hymn of the Marseillaise, Entonne la Marseillaise, ten thousand tenor or bass pipes joining, or say some forty thousand in all, for every heart leaps at the sound. 
and so with rhythmic march melody, waxing ever quicker, to double and to treble quick, they rally, they advance, they rush, death-defying, man-devouring, carry batteries, redoubts, whatsoever is to be carried, and like the fire whirlwind, sweep all manner of Austrians from the scene of action. Thus, through the hands of Dumouriez, may Rouget de Lille, in figurative speech, be said to have gained, miraculously, like another Orpheus, by his Marcellet's fiddle strings, Fidibus Canoras, a victory of Jamap, and conquered the Low Countries. Young General Egalité, it would seem, shone brave among the bravest on this occasion. Doubtless a brave Egalité, whom, however, does not Dumouriez rather talk of oftener than need were? The mother society has her own thoughts. As for the elder Egalité, he flies low at this time, appears in the convention for some half-hour daily with rubicund, preoccupied or impressive, quasi-contemptuous countenance, and then takes himself away. The Netherlands are conquered, at least overrun. Jacobin missionaries, your proles, pireras, follow in the train of the armies, also convention commissioners, melting church plate, revolutionising and remodelling, among whom Danton, in brief space, does immensities of business, not neglecting his own wages and trade profits, it is thought. Hassenfratz dilapidates at home. Dumouriez grumbles and they dilapidate abroad. Within the walls there is sinning, and without the walls there is sinning. But in the hall of the convention at the same hour with this victory of Jamap, there went another thing forward. Report of great length from the proper appointed committee on the crimes of Louis. The galleries listen breathless. Take comfort, ye galleries. Deputy Valaze, reporter on this occasion, thinks Louis very criminal, and that, if convenient, he should be tried. Poor Girondin Valaze, who may be tried himself one day. Comfortable so far. Nay, here comes a second committee reporter, Deputy Maia, with a legal argument, very prosy to read now, very refreshing to hear then, that by the law of the country, Louis Capet was only called inviolable by a figure of rhetoric, but at bottom was perfectly viable, triable, that he can and even should be tried. This question of Louis emerging so often as an angry, confused possibility and submerging again, has emerged now in an articulate shape. Patriotism growls indignant joy. The so-called reign of equality is not to be a mere name, then, but a thing. Try Louis Capet, scornfully ejaculates patriotism. Mean criminals go to the gallows for a purse cut, and this chief criminal, guilty of a France cut, of a France slashed asunder with cloth those scissors and civil war, with his victims twelve hundred on the 10th of August alone, lying low in the catacombs, fattening the passes of Argonne Wood, of Valmy and Far Fields, he, such chief criminal, shall not even come to the bar. For a lass of patriotism, add we, it was from of old said, the loser pays. It is he who has to pay all scores, run up by whomsoever. On him must all breakages and charges fall, and the twelve hundred on the 10th of August are not rebel traitors, but victims and martyrs, such is the law of quarrel. Patriotism, nothing doubting, watches over this question of the trial, now happily emerged in an articulate shape, and will see it to maturity if the gods permit. With a keen solicitude, patriotism watches, getting ever keener at every new difficulty, as Girondin and false brothers interpose delays, till it get a keenness as of fixed idea, and will have this trial and no earthly thing instead of it, if equality be not a name. Love of equality, then scepticism of terror, rage of victory, sublime spectacle of the universe, all these things are strong. But indeed this question of the trial, is it not to all persons a most grave one, filling with dubiety many a legislative head? Regicide, asks the Gironde, respectability? To kill a king and become the horror of respectable nations and persons? but then also to save a king, to lose one's footing with a decided patriot, an undecided patriot, though never so respectable, being mere hypothetic froth and no footing? The dilemma presses sore, and between the horns of it you wriggle round and round. Decision is nowhere, 
save in the mother society and her sons, these have decided and go forward. The others wriggle round uneasily within their dilemma horns and make way nowhither. End of Book 2, Chapter 4《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3 — The Guillotine Book 2 — Regicide Chapter 5 — Stretching of Formulas This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2 — Chapter 5 — Stretching of Formulas But how this question of the trial grew laboriously through the weeks of gestation now that it has been articulated or conceived were superfluous to trace here. It emerged and submerged among the infinite of questions and embroilments. The veto of scoundrels writes plaintive letters as to anarchy, concealed royalists, aided by hunger, produce riots about grain. Alas, it is but a week ago these Girondins made a new fierce onslaught on the September massacres. For one day, amongst the last of October, Robespierre, being summoned to the tribune by some new hint of that old calumny of the dictatorship, was speaking and pleading there, with more and more comfort to himself, till, rising high in heart, he cried out valiantly, Is there any man here that dare specifically accuse me? Moi! exclaimed one pause of deep silence. A lean, angry little figure with broad, bald brow strode swiftly towards the tribune, taking papers from its pocket. I accuse thee, Robespierre. I, Jean-Baptiste Louvet. The sea-green became tallow-green, shrinking to a corner of the tribune. Danton cried, Speak, Robespierre, there are many good citizens that listen. But the tongue refused its office. And so Louvet, with a shrill tone, read and recited crime after crime. Dictatorial temper, exclusive popularity, bullying at elections, mob retinue, September massacres, till all the convention shrieked again and had almost indicted the incorruptible there on the spot. Never did the incorruptible run such a risk. Louvet, to his dying day, will regret that the Gironde did not take a bolder attitude and extinguish him there and then. Not so, however. The incorruptible, about to be indicted in this sudden manner, could not be refused a week of delay. That week he is not idle, nor is the mother society idle, fierce tremulous for her chosen son. He is ready at the day with his written speech, smooth as a Jesuit doctor's, and convinces some. And now? Why, now, lazy Vergniaud does not rise with demosthenic thunder. Poor Louvet, unprepared, can do little or nothing. Barère proposes that these comparatively despicable personalities be dismissed by order of the day. Order of the day, it accordingly is. Barbaroux cannot even get a hearing, not though he rush down to the bar and demand to be heard as a petitioner. The convention, eager for public business with that first articulate emergence of the trial just coming on, dismisses these comparative miseries and despicabilities. Splenetic Louvet must digest his spleen regretfully forever. Robespierre, dear to patriotism, is dearer for the danger he has run. This is the second grand attempt by our Girondin friends of order to extinguish that black spot in their domain, and we see they have made it far blacker and wider than before. Anarchy, September massacre, it is a thing that lies hideous in the general imagination, very detestable to the undecided patriot of respectability, a thing to be harped on as often as need is. Harp on it, denounce it, trample it, ye Girondin patriots, and yet behold, the readers of newspapers pretend to recollect this hatefulness of the September massacre is itself partly an afterthought. Readers of newspapers can quote Gossard and various Brissotins approving of the September massacre at the time it happened and calling it a salutary vengeance. So that the real grief, after all, were not so much righteous horror as grief that one's own power was departing. Unhappy Girondin. In the Jacobin society, therefore, the decided patriot complains that here are men who, with their private ambitions and animosities, will ruin liberty, equality and brotherhood, all three, 
They check the spirit of patriotism, throw stumbling blocks in its way, and instead of pushing on all shoulders at the wheel, will stand idle there, spitefully clamouring what foul ruts there are, what rude jolts we give. To which the Jacobin society answers with angry roar, with angry shriek, for there are citoyennes too, thick crowded in the galleries here, citoyennes who bring their seam with them, or their knitting needles, and shriek or knit as the case needs, famed tricoteurs as patriot knitters, mere duchess or the like, Deborah and mother of the Faubourgs, giving the keynote. It is a changed Jacobin society, and are still changing where Mother Duchess now sits, authentic duchesses have sat. High Rouge dames went once in jewels and spangles. Now, instead of jewels, you may take the knitting needles and leave the rouge. The rouge will gradually give place to natural brown, clean washed or even unwashed, and Demoiselle Teronia herself gets scandalously fustigated. Strange indeed. It is the same tribune raised in mid-air, where a high Mirabeau, a high Barnave, an aristocrat Lameth once thundered, whom gradually your Brissots, Guardes, Vergniots, a hotter style of patriots in Bonnet Rouge, did displace, red heat, as one may say, superseding light. And now your Brissots, in turn, and Brissotins, Rolandins, Girondins, are becoming supernumerary, must desert the sittings or be expelled. The light of the mighty mother is burning not red but blue. Provincial daughter societies loudly disapprove these things, loudly demand the swift reinstatement of such eloquent Girondins, the swift erasure of Marat, radiation du Marat. The mother society, so far as natural reason can predict, seems ruining herself. Nevertheless, she has at all crises seemed so. She has a preternatural life in her and will not ruin. But in a fortnight more, this great question of the trial, while the fit committee is assiduously but silently working on it, receives an unexpected stimulus. Our readers remember poor Louis's turn for smith work. How, in old happier days, a certain Sieur Gamain of Versailles was wont to come over and instruct him in lock-making, often scolding him, they say, for his numbness by whom, nevertheless, the royal apprentice had learned something of that craft. Hapless apprentice, perfidious master smith, for now, on this 20th of November, 1792, Gingy Smith Gamain comes over to the Paris municipality, over to Minister Roland, with hints that he, Smith Gamain, knows a thing. That in May last, when traitorous correspondence was so brisk, he and the royal apprentice fabricated an iron press, Armoire de Ver, cunningly inserting the same in a wall of the royal chamber in the Tuileries, invisible under the wainscot, where doubtless it still sticks. Perfidious Gamin, attended by the proper authorities, finds the wainscot panel which none else can find, wrenches it up, discloses the iron press, full of letters and papers. Roland clutches them out, conveys them over in towels to the fit assiduous committee, which sits hard by. In towels, we say, and without notarial inventory, an oversight on the part of Roland. Here, however, are letters enough, which disclose to a demonstration the correspondence of a traitorous, self-preserving court, and this not with traitors only, but even with patriots so-called. Barnard's treason of correspondence with the Queen and friendly advice to her ever since that Varenne business is hereby manifest. How happy that we have him, this Barnard, lying safe in the prison of Grenoble since September last, for he has long been suspect. Talleyrand's treason, many a man's treason, if not manifest hereby, is next to it. Mirabeau's treason, wherefore his bust in the hall of the convention is veiled with gauze till we ascertain. Alas, it is too ascertainable. His bust in the hall of the Jacobins, denounced by Robespierre from the tribune in mid-air, is not veiled. It is instantly broken to sherds, a patriot mounting swiftly with a ladder and shivering it down on the floor, it and others amid shouts. Such is their recompense and amount of wages at this date, on the principle of supply and demand. 
Smith Gamain, inadequately recompensed for the present, comes some fifteen months after with a humble petition, setting forth that no sooner was that important iron press finished off by him than, as he now bethinks himself, Louis gave him a large glass of wine, which large glass of wine did produce in the stomach of Sieur Gamain the terriblest effects, evidently tending towards death, and was then brought up by an emetic, but has, notwithstanding, entirely ruined the constitution of Sieur Gamain, so that he cannot work for his family, as he now bethinks himself. The recompense of which is pension of twelve hundred francs and honourable mention. So different is the ratio of demand and supply at different times. Thus, amid obstructions and stimulating furtherances, has the question of the trial to grow, emerging and submerging, fostered by solicitous patriotism. Of the orations that were spoken of it, of the painfully devised forms of process for managing it, the law arguments to prove it lawful, and all the infinite floods of juridical and other ingenuity and oratory, be no syllable reported in this history. Lawyer ingenuity is good, but what can it profit here? If the truth must be spoken, O oh august senators, the only law in this case is vi victis, the loser pays. Seldom did Robespierre say a wiser word than the hint he gave to that effect in his oration, that it was needless to speak of law, that here, if never elsewhere, our right was might. An oration admired almost to ecstasy by the Jacobin patriot. Who shall say that Robespierre is not a thoroughgoing man, bold in logic at least? To the like effect, or still more plainly, spake young Saint-Just, the black-haired, mild-toned youth. Danton is on mission in the Netherlands during this preliminary work. The rest, far as one reads, welter amid law of nations, social contract, juristics, syllogistics, to us barren as the east wind. In fact, what can be more unprofitable than the sight of 749 ingenious men struggling with their whole force and industry for a long course of weeks to do at bottom this, to stretch out the old formula and law phraseology so that it may cover the new, contradictory, entirely uncoverable thing, whereby the poor formula does but crack and one's honesty along with it. The thing that is palpably hot burning, wilt thou prove it by syllogism to be a freezing mixture? This of stretching out formulas till they crack is, especially in times of swift change, one of the sorrowfulest tasks poor humanity has. End of Book 2, Chapter 5《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3 the Guillotine. Book 2. Regicide. Chapter 6. At the Bar. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2. Chapter 6. At the Bar. Meanwhile, in a space of some five weeks, we have got to another emerging of the trial, and a more practical one than ever. On Tuesday, 11th of December, the King's trial has emerged very decidedly, into the streets of Paris, in the shape of that green carriage of Mère Chambon, within which sits the king himself, with attendants, on his way to the convention hall. Attended in that green carriage by Mère Chambon, Procureur Chaumet, and outside of it by Commandant Santerre, with cannon, cavalry and double row of infantry, all sections under arms, strong patrols scouring all streets. So fares he slowly through the dull, drizzling weather, and about two o'clock we behold him, in walnut-coloured greatcoat, redingote noisette, descending through the Place Vendôme, towards that salle de manège, to be indicted and judicially interrogated. The mysterious temple circuit has given up its secret, which now, in this walnut-coloured coat, men behold with eyes. The same bodily Louis, who was once Louis the Desired, fares there, Hapless king he is getting now towards port. His deplorable fairings and voyagings draw to a close. What duty remains to him henceforth, that of placidly enduring, he is fit to do. 
The singular procession fares on, in silence, says Proudhon, or amid growlings of the Marseillaise hymn. In silence, ushers itself into the hall of the convention, Santerre holding Louis's arm with his hand. Louis looks round him, with composed air, to see what kind of convention and parliament it is. Much changed, indeed, since February gone two years, when our constituent, then busy, spread fleur-de-lis velvet for us, and we came over to say a kind word here, and they all started up swearing fidelity, and all France started up swearing, and made it a feast of pikes, which has ended in this. Barrea, who once wept looking up from his editor's desk, looks down now from his president's chair, with a list of fifty-seven questions and says, dry-eyed, Louis, you may sit down. Louis sits down. It is the very seat, they say, same timber and stuffing, from which he accepted the constitution, amid dancing and illumination, autumn gone a year. So much woodwork remains identical, so much else is not identical. Louis sits and listens with a composed look and mind. Of the fifty-seven questions, we shall not give so much as one. They are questions captiously embracing all the main documents seized on the 10th of August, or found lately in the Iron Press, embracing all the main incidents of the revolution history. And they ask, in substance, this. Louis, who were king, art thou not guilty, to a certain extent, by act and written document, of trying to continue king? Neither in the answer is there much notable, mere quiet negations for the most part, an accused man standing on the simple basis of, no, I do not recognise that document, I did not do that act, or did it according to the law that then was. Whereupon the fifty-seven questions, and documents to the number of a hundred and sixty-two, being exhausted in this manner, Barrere finishes, after some three hours, with his, Louis, I invite you to withdraw. Louis withdraws, under municipal escort, into a neighbouring committee room, having first, in leaving the bar, demanded to have legal counsel. He declines refreshment in this committee room, then, seeing Chaumet busy with a small loaf which a grenadier had divided with him, says he will take a bit of bread. It is five o'clock, and he had breakfasted but slightly in a morning of such drumming and alarm. Chaumet breaks his half-loaf. The king eats of the crust, mounts the green carriage, eating. Asks now what he shall do with the crumb. Chaumet's clerk takes it from him, flings it out into the street. Louis says, it is pity to fling out bread in a time of dearth. My grandmother, remarks Chaumet, used to say to me, little boy, never waste a crumb of bread, you cannot make one. Monsieur Chaumet, answers Louis, your grandmother seems to have been a sensible woman. Poor innocent mortal, so quietly he waits the drawing of the lot, fit to do this at least well. Passivity alone, without activity, sufficing for it. He talks once of travelling over France by and by to have a geographical and topographical view of it, from being of old fond of geography. The temple circuit again receives him, closes on him. Gazing Paris may retire to its hearths and coffee-houses, to its clubs and theatres. The damp darkness has sunk, and with it the drumming and patrolling of this strange day. Louis is now separated from his queen and family, given up to his simple reflections and resources. Dull lie these stone walls round him, of his loved ones none with him. In this state of uncertainty, providing for the worst, he writes his will, a paper which can still be read, full of placidity, simplicity, pious sweetness. The convention, after debate, has granted him legal counsel of his own choosing. Advocate Target feels himself too old, being turned to fifty-four, and declines. He had gained great honour once defending Rohan, the necklace cardinal, but will gain none here. Advocate Tranchet, some ten years older, does not decline. Nay, behold, good old Malacherbe steps forward voluntarily to the last of his fields, the good old hero. 
He is grey with seventy years. He says, I was twice called to the counsel of him who was my master when all the world coveted that honour, and I owe him the same service now when it has become one which many reckon dangerous. These two, with the younger de Sayes, whom they will select for pleading, are busy over that fifty and sevenfold indictment, over the hundred and sixty-two documents, Louis aiding them as he can. A great thing is now, therefore, in open progress, all men in all lands watching it. By what forms and methods shall the Convention acquit itself, in such manner that there rest not on it even the suspicion of blame? Difficult, that will be. The Convention, really much at a loss, discusses and deliberates. All day, from morning to night, day after day, the Tribune drones with oratory on this matter. One must stretch the old formula to cover the new thing. The patriots of the mountain, wetted ever keener, clamour for dispatch above all. The only good form will be a swift one. Nevertheless, the Convention deliberates, the Tribune drones, drowned indeed in tenor and even in treble from time to time, the whole hall shrilling up round it into pretty frequent wrath and provocation. It has droned and shrilled well nigh a fortnight before we can decide, this shrillness getting ever shriller, that on Wednesday 26th of December Louis shall appear and plead. His advocates complain that it is fatally soon, which they well might as advocates but without remedy. To patriotism it seems endlessly late. On Wednesday, therefore, at the cold, dark hour of eight in the morning, all senators are at their post. Indeed, they warm the cold hour, as we find, by a violent effervescent, such as is too common now, some Louvre or Buzo attacking some Talian Chabot, and so the whole mountain effervescing against the whole Gironde. Scarcely is this done at nine when Louis and his three advocates, escorted by the clang of arms and Santerre's national force, enter the hall. De Sayes unfolds his papers, honourably fulfilling his perilous office, pleads for the space of three hours. An honourable pleading, composed almost overnight, courageous yet discreet, not without ingenuity and soft pathetic eloquence. Louis fell on his neck when they had withdrawn and said with tears, Mon pauvre de Sayes. Louis himself, before withdrawing, had added a few words, perhaps the last he would utter to them, how it pained his heart, above all things, to be held guilty of that bloodshed on the 10th of August, or of ever shedding or wishing to shed French blood. So saying, he withdrew from that hall, having indeed finished his work there. Many are the strange errands he has had thither, but this strange one is the last. And now why will the Convention loiter? Here is the indictment and evidence, here is the pleading, does not the rest follow of itself? The mountain and patriotism in general clamours still louder for dispatch, for permanent session till the task be done. Nevertheless, a doubting, apprehensive convention decides that it will still deliberate first, that all members who desire it shall have leave to speak. To your desks, therefore, ye eloquent members, down with your thoughts, your echoes and hearsays of thoughts, now is the time to show oneself. France and the universe listens. Members are not wanting. Oration spoken pamphlet follows spoken pamphlet with what eloquence it can. President's list swells ever higher with names claiming to speak from day to day, all days and all hours, the constant tribune drones, shrill galleries supplying, very variably, the tenor and treble. It were a dull tune otherwise. The patriots in mountain and galleries, or taking counsel nightly in section house, in mother society, amid their shrill trickateurses, have to watch lynx-eyed, to give voice when needful, occasionally very loud. Deputy Turio, he who was advocate Turio, who was elector Turio, and from the top of the Bastille saw Saint Antoine rising like the ocean, this Turio can stretch a formula as heartily as most men. Cruel Biot is not silent if you incite him, nor is cruel Jules Bon silent, a kind of Jesuit he too. Write him not as the dictionaries too often do, Jambon, which signifies mere ham. But on the whole, let no man conceive it possible that Louis is not guilty. 
The only question for a reasonable man is, or was, can the convention judge Louis? Or must it be the whole people, in primary assembly and with delay? Always delay, ye Girondins, false homme d'état, so bellows patriotism, its patience almost failing. But indeed, if we consider it, what shall these poor Girondins do? Speak their convictions that Louis is a prisoner of war and cannot be put to death without injustice, solecism, peril? Speak such conviction and lose utterly your footing with the decided patriot? Nay, properly, it is not even a conviction, but a conjecture and dim puzzle. How many poor Girondins are sure of but one thing, that a man and Girondin ought to have footing somewhere and to stand firmly on it, keeping well with the respectable classes? This is what conviction and assurance of faith they have. They must wriggle painfully between their dilemma horns. Nor is France idle, nor Europe. It is a heart, this convention, as we said, which sends out influences and receives them. A king's execution, call it martyrdom, call it punishment, were an influence. Two notable influences this convention has already sent forth over all nations, much to its own detriment. On the 19th of November it emitted a decree and has since confirmed and unfolded the details of it that any nation which might see good to shake off the fetters of despotism was thereby, so to speak, the sister of France and should have help and countenance. A decree much noised of by diplomatists, editors, international lawyers, such a decree as no living fetter of despotism nor person in authority anywhere can approve of. It was Deputy Chambon, the Girondin, who propounded this degree, at bottom perhaps as a flourish of rhetoric. The second influence we speak of had a still poorer origin, in the restless, loud, rattling, slightly furnished head of one Jacob Dupont from the Loire country. The convention is speculating on a plan of national education, Deputy Dupont, in his speech, says, I am free to avow, Monsieur le Président, that I, for my part, am an atheist, thinking the world might like to know that. The French world received it without commentary, or with no audible commentary, so loud was France otherwise. The foreign world received it with confutation, with horror and astonishment, a most miserable influence this. And now, if to these two were added a third influence and sent pulsing abroad all over the earth, that of regicide? Foreign courts interfere in this trial of Louis. Spain, England, not to be listened to, though they come, as it were, at least Spain comes, with the olive branch in one hand and the sword without scabbard in the other. But at home, too, from out of this circumambient Paris and France, what influences come thick pulsing? Petitions flow in, pleading for equal justice in a reign of so-called equality. The living patriot pleads, O ye national deputies, do not the dead patriots plead? The twelve hundred that lie in cold obstruction, do not they plead and petition in death's dumb show from their narrow house there, more eloquently than speech? Crippled patriots hop on crutches round the salle de manège, demanding justice. The wounded of the 10th of August, the widows and orphans of the killed, petition in a body and hop and defile, eloquently mute through the hall. One wounded patriot, unable to hop, is borne on his bed thither and passes shoulder high in the horizontal posture. The convention tribune, which has paused at such sight, commences again, droning mere juristic oratory. But out of doors Paris is piping ever higher. Bull-voiced saint Rouge is heard, and the hysteric eloquence of Mother Duchesse, Violet, Apostle of Liberty, with pike and red cap, flies hastily, carrying his oratorical folding-stool. Justice on the traitor, cries all the patriot world. Consider also this other cry, heard loud on the streets, Give us bread, or else kill us! Bread and equality, justice on the traitor, that we may have bread! The limited or undecided patriot is set against the decided. Mayor Chambon heard of dreadful rioting at the Théâtre de la Nation. It had come to rioting and even to fistwork between the decided and the undecided, touching a new drama called Ami des Lois, Friend of the Laws. 
one of the poorest dramas ever written, but which had didactic applications in it, wherefore powdered wigs of friends of order and black hair of Jacobin heads are flying there, and Mayor Chambon hastens with Santerre in hopes to quell it. Far from quelling it, our poor mayor gets so squeezed, says the report, and likewise so blamed and bullied, say we, that he, with regret, quits the brief mayorality altogether, his lungs being affected. This miserable ami des lois is debated of in the convention itself, so violent, mutually enraged, are the limited patriots and the unlimited between which two classes are not aristocrats enough and crypto-aristocrats busy? Spies running over from London with important packets? Spies pretending to run? One of these latter, Viard was the name of him, pretended to accuse Roland, and even the wife of Roland, to the joy of Chabot and the mountain. But the wife of Roland came, being summoned, on the instant to the convention hall, came in her high clearness, and with few clear words dissipated this viard into despicability and air, all friends of order applauding. So, with theatre riots and bread or else kill us, with rage, hunger, preternatural suspicion, does this wild Paris pipe. Roland grows ever more querulous in his messages and letters, rising almost to the hysterical pitch. Marat, whom no power on earth can prevent seeing into traitors and Rolands, takes to bed for three days, almost dead, the invaluable people's friend, with heartbreak, with fever and headache. O oh, peuple babilla, si tu savais agir! People of babblers, if thou couldst but act! To crown all, victorious Dumouriez in these New Year's days is arrived in Paris, one fears for no good. He pretends to be complaining of Minister Pache and Hassan France dilapidations, to be concerting measures for the spring campaign. One finds him much in the company of the Girondins, plotting with them against Jacobinism, against equality and the punishment of Louis. We have letters of his to the convention itself. Will he act the old Lafayette part, this new victorious general? Let him withdraw again, not undenounced. And still, in the convention tribune, it drones continually, mere juristic eloquence and hypothesis without action, and there are still fifties on the president's list. Nay, these Giron presidents give their own party preference. We suspect they play foul with the list. Men of the mountain cannot be heard. And still it drones, all through December into January and a new year, and there's no end. Paris pipes round it, multitudinous, ever higher, to the note of the whirlwind. Paris will bring cannon from Saint-Denis, there is talk of shutting the barriers, to Roland's horror. Whereupon, behold, the convention tribune suddenly ceases droning. We cut short, be on the list who likes, and make end. On Tuesday next, the 15th of January, 1793, it shall go to the vote, name by name, and one way or other, this great game play itself out. End of Book 2, Chapter 6「The French Revolution: A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume Three, The Guillotine, Book Two, Regicide, Chapter Seven, The Three Votings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book Two, Chapter Seven, The Three Votings. Is Louis Capet guilty of conspiring against liberty? Shall our sentence be itself final, or need ratifying by appeal to the people? If guilty, what punishment? This is the form agreed to, after uproar and several hours of tumultuous indecision. These are the three successive questions, whereon the convention shall now pronounce. Paris floods round their hall, multitudinous, many sounding. Europe and all nations listen for their answer. Deputy after deputy shall answer to his name, guilty or not guilty. As to the guilt, there is, as above hinted, no doubt in the mind of patriot man. Overwhelming majority pronounces guilt. The unanimous convention votes for guilt. Only some feeble twenty-eight voting not innocence, but refusing to vote at all. Neither does the second question prove doubtful, whatever the Girondins might calculate. 
Would not appeal to the people be another name for civil war? Majority of two to one answers that there shall be no appeal. This also is settled. Loud patriotism, now at ten o'clock, may hush itself for the night and retire to its bed, not without hope. Tuesday has gone well. On the morrow comes what punishment? On the morrow is the tug of war. Consider, therefore, if on this Wednesday morning there is an affluence of patriotism, if Paris stands a tiptoe and all deputies are at their post. 749 honourable deputies, only some 20 absent on mission, Duchatel and some seven others absent by sickness. Meanwhile, expectant patriotism and Paris, standing a tiptoe, have need of patience. For this Wednesday again passes in debate and effervescence, Girondins proposing that a majority of three-fourths shall be required, patriots fiercely resisting them. Danton, who has just got back from mission in the Netherlands, does obtain order of the day on this Girondin proposal. Nay, he obtains further that we decide san disimpare in permanent session till we have done. And so, finally, at eight in the evening, this third stupendous voting by roll call or appel nominal does begin. What punishment? Girondins, undecided, patriots decided, men afraid of royalty, men afraid of anarchy, must answer here and now. Infinite patriotism, dusky in the damp light, floods all corridors, crowds all galleries, sternly waiting to hear. Shrill-sounding ushers summon you by name and department. You must rise to the tribune and say. Eyewitnesses have represented this scene of the third voting, and of the votings that grew out of it, a scene protracted, like to be endless, lasting with few brief intervals from Wednesday till Sunday morning, as one of the strangest seen in the revolution. Long night wears itself into day, morning's paleness is spread over all faces, and again the wintry shadows sink and the dim lamps are lit, but through day and night and the vicissitude of hours, member after member is mounting continually those tribune steps, pausing aloft there in the clearest upper light to speak his fate word, then diving down into the dusk and throng again like phantoms in the hour of midnight, most spectral, pandemonial. Never did President Vernio or any terrestrial president superintend the like. A king's life, and so much else that depends thereon, hangs trembling in the balance. Man after man mounts, the buzz hushes itself till he have spoken. Death, banishment, imprisonment till the peace. Many say death, with what cautious, well-studied phrases and paragraphs they could devise of explanation, of enforcement, of faint recommendation to mercy. Many, too, say banishment, something short of death. The balance trembles, none can yet guess whitherward. Whereat anxious patriotism bellows, irrepressible by ushers. The poor Girondins, many of them under such fierce bellowing of patriotism, say death, justifying motivant, that most miserable word of theirs, by some brief casuistry and jesuitry. Vernio himself says death, justifying by jesuitry. Rich Le Pelletier saint Fargo had been of the noblesse and then of the patriot left side in the constituent and had argued and reported there and elsewhere not a little against capital punishment. Nevertheless, he now says death, a word which may cost him dear. Manuel did surely rank with the decided in August last, but he has been sinking and backsliding ever since September and the scenes of September. In this convention, above all, no word he could speak would find favour. He says now banishment, and in mute wrath quits the place forever, much hustled in the corridors. Philippe Egalité votes in his soul and conscience death at the sound of which and of whom even patriotism shakes its head, and there runs a groan and shudder through this hall of doom. Robespierre's vote cannot be doubtful. His speech is long. Men see the figure of Shrilsier ascend, hardly pausing, passing merely. This figure says, La mort sans phrase, death without phrases, and fares onward and downward, most spectral, pandemonial. 
And yet if the reader fancy it of a funereal, sorrowful or even grave character, he is far mistaken. The ushers in the mountain quarter, says Mercier, had become as box openers at the opera, opening and shutting of galleries for privileged persons, for d'Orléans, egalites, mistresses or other high dizened women of condition, rustling with laces and tricolour. Gallant deputies pass and repass thitherward, treating them with ices, refreshments and small talk. The high dizened heads beck responsive. Some have their card and pin, pricking down the eyes and nose as at a game of rouge et noir. Further aloft reigns Mère Duchesse with her unrouged Amazons. She cannot be prevented making long ha-has when the vote is not la mort. In these galleries there is refection drinking of wine and brandy, as in open tavern, en plein tabagi. Betting goes on in all coffee-houses of the neighbourhood, but within doors fatigue, impatience, uttermost weariness sits now on all visages, lighted up only from time to time by turns of the game. Members have fallen asleep, I shall come and awaken them to vote, other members calculate whether they shall not have time to run and dine. Figures rise like phantoms, pale in the dusky lamplight, utter from this tribune only one word, death. Tout est optique, says Monsieur. The world is all an optical shadow. Deep in the Thursday night, when the voting is done and secretaries are summing it up, sick du Châtel, more spectral than another, comes borne on a chair, wrapped in blankets, in nightgown and nightcap, to vote for mercy. One vote, it is thought, may turn the scale. Ah, no. In profoundest silence, President Vernier, with a voice full of sorrow, has to say, I declare in the name of the Convention that the punishment it pronounces on Louis Capet is that of death. Death by a small majority of 53. Nay, if we deduct from the one side and add to the other a certain twenty-six who said death but coupled some faintest ineffectual surmise of mercy with it, the majority will be but one. Death is the sentence, but its execution? It is not executed yet. Scarcely is the vote declared when Louis' three advocates enter, with protest in his name, with demand for delay, for appeal to the people. For this do Desais and Tranchet plead with brief eloquence. Brave old Malicheur pleads for it with eloquent want of eloquence, in broken sentences, in embarrassment and sobs. That brave, time-honoured face with its grey strength, its broad sagacity and honesty, is mastered with emotion, melts into dumb tears. They reject the appeal to the people, that having been already settled. But as to the delay, what they call sursi, it shall be considered, shall be voted for tomorrow. At present we adjourn. Whereupon patriotism hisses from the mountain, but a tyrannical majority has so decided, and adjourns. There is still this fourth vote, then, growls indignant patriotism, this vote and who knows what other votes and adjournments of voting, and the whole matter still hovering hypothetical. And at every new vote, those Jesuit Girondins, even they who voted for death, would so fain find a loophole. Patriotism must watch and rage. Tyrannical adjournments there have been, one and now another at midnight on plea of fatigue, all Friday wasted in hesitation and higgling, in recounting of the votes which are found correct as they stood. Patriotism bays fiercer than ever. Patriotism, by long watching, has become red-eyed, almost rabid. Delay? Yes or no? Men do vote it, finally, all Saturday, all day and night. Men's nerves are worn out. Men's hearts are desperate. Now it shall end. Vernio, spite of the baying, ventures to say yes, delay, though he had voted death. Philippe Galate says in his soul and conscience, no. The next member mounting, since Philippe says no, I for my part say yes, moi je dis oui. The balance still trembles, till finally at three o'clock on Sunday morning we have no delay by a majority of seventy, death within four and twenty hours. Gara, Minister of Justice, has to go to the temple with this stern message. He ejaculates repeatedly, Quelle commission affreuse! What a frightful function! 
Louis begs for a confessor for yet three days of life to prepare himself to die. The confessor is granted. The three days and all respite are refused. There is no deliverance then? Thick stone walls answer none. Has King Louis no friends, men of action, of courage, grown desperate in this his extreme need? King Louis's friends are feeble and far. Not even a voice in the coffee houses rises for him. At Mayo the restaurateurs, no Captain Damp Martin now dines or sees death doing whiskerandos on furlough exhibit daggers of improved structure. Mayo's gallant royalists on furlough are far across the marches. They are wandering distracted over the world, or their bones lie whitening argon wood. Only some weak priests leave pamphlets on all the bornstones this night, calling for a rescue, calling for the pious women to rise, or are taken distributing pamphlets and sent to prison. Nay, there is one death-doer of the ancient Mayo sort, who with effort has done even less and worse slain a deputy and set all the patriotism of Paris on edge. It was five on Saturday evening when Le Pelletier saint fageau having given his vote, no delay, ran over to Fevrier's in the Palais Royal to snatch a morsel of dinner. He had dined and was paying. A thick-set man with black hair and blue beard in a loose kind of frock stepped up to him. It was, as Fevrier and the bystanders bethought them, one Paris of the old king's guard. Are you Pelletier? asks he. Yes. You voted in the king's business? I voted death. Scalera, take that, cries Paris, flashing out a sabre from under his frock and plunging it deep in Le Pelletier's side. Fevrier clutches him, but he breaks off, is gone. The voter Le Pelletier lies dead. He has expired in great pain at one in the morning, two hours before that vote of no delay was fully summed up. Guardsman Paris is flying over France, cannot be taken, will be found some months after, self-shot in a remote inn. Robespierre sees reason to think that Prince d'Artois himself is privately in town, that the convention will be butchered in the lump. Patriotism, sound mere wail and vengeance. Santerre doubles and trebles all his patrols. Pity is lost in rage and fear. The convention has refused the three days of life and all respite. End of Book 2, Chapter 7《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 2. Regicide. Chapter 8. Place de la Révolution. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2. Chapter 8. Place de la Révolution. To this conclusion, then, hast thou come, O hapless Louis. The son of sixty kings is to die on the scaffold by form of law. Under sixty kings this same form of law, form of society, has been fashioning itself together these thousand years, and has become one way and another a most strange machine. Surely, if needful, it is also frightful, this machine, dead, blind, not what it should be, which, with swift stroke or by cold, slow torture, has wasted the lives and souls of innumerable men. And behold now a king himself, or say rather, kinghood, in his person, is to expire here in cruel tortures, like a phalara shut in the belly of his own red-heated brazen bull. It is ever so, and thou shouldst know it, O haughty tyrannous man. Injustice breeds injustice. Curses and falsehoods do verily return always home, wide as they may wander. Innocent Louis bears the sins of many generations, He too experiences that man's tribunal is not in this earth, that if he had no higher one, it were not well with him. A king dying by such violence appeals impressively to the imagination, as the like must do and ought to do. And yet at bottom it is not the king dying, but the man. Kingship is a coat, the grand loss is of the skin." The man from whom you take his life, to him can the whole combined world do more? Lai went on his hurdle, his mouth filled with a gag. 
miserablest mortals doomed for picking pockets have a whole five-act tragedy in them in that dumb pain as they go to the gallows unregarded. They consume the cup of trembling down to the lees. For kings and for beggars, for the justly doomed and the unjustly, it is a hard thing to die. Pity them all. Thy utmost pity with all aids and appliances and throne and scaffold contrasts, how far short is it of the thing pitied? A confessor has come. Abbe Edgeworth, of Irish extraction, whom the king knew by good report, has come promptly on this solemn mission. Leave the earth alone, then, thou hapless king. It with its malice will go its way, thou also canst go thine. A hard scene yet remains, the parting with our loved ones. Kind hearts environed in the same grim peril with us, to be left here. Let the reader look with eyes of Valet Clary through these glass doors, where also the municipality watches, and see the cruelest of scenes. At half-past eight the door of the anteroom opened. The Queen appeared first, leading her son by the hand, then Madame Royale and Madame Elizabeth, they all flung themselves into the arms of the king. Silence reigned for some minutes, interrupted only by sobs. The queen made a movement to lead his majesty towards the inner room, where Monsieur Edgeworth was waiting unknown to them. No, said the king, let us go into the dining room, it is there only that I can see you. They entered there, I shut the door of it, which was of glass. The king sat down, the queen on his left hand, Madame Elizabeth on his right, Madame Royale almost in front, the young prince remained standing between his father's legs. They all leaned towards him and often held him embraced. This scene of woe lasted an hour and three quarters, during which we could hear nothing. We could see only that always when the king spoke, the sobbings of the princesses redoubled, continued for some minutes, and that then the king began again to speak. And so our meetings and our partings do now end. The sorrows we gave each other, the poor joys we faithfully shared, and all our lovings and our sufferings and confused toilings under the earthly sun are over. Thou, good soul, I shall never, never, through all ages of time, see thee any more. Never. O reader, knowest thou that hard word? For nearly two hours this agony lasts, then they tear themselves asunder. Promise that you will see us on the morrow. He promises. Ah, yes, yes, yet once, and go now, ye loved ones. Cry to God for yourselves and me. It was a hard scene, but it is over. He will not see them on the morrow. The Queen, in passing through the anteroom, glanced at the Cerberus municipals, and with woman's vehemence said through her tears, Vous êtes tous des scélérats. King Louis slept sound till five in the morning, when Clary, as he had been ordered, awoke him. Clary dressed his hair. While this went forward, Louis took a ring from his watch and kept trying it on his finger. It was his wedding ring, which he is now to return to the Queen as a mute farewell. At half-past six he took the sacrament and continued in devotion and conference with Abbe Edgeworth. He will not see his family. It were too hard to bear. At eight the municipals enter. The king gives them his will and messages and effects, which they at first brutally refuse to take charge of. He gives them a roll of gold pieces, a hundred and twenty-five louis. These are to be returned to Malesherbe, who had lent them. At nine, Santerre says the hour is come. The king begs yet to retire for three minutes. At the end of three minutes, Santerre again says the hour is come. Stamping on the ground with his right foot, Louis answers, Patton, let us go. How the rolling of those drums comes in, through the temple bastions and bullocks, on the heart of a queenly wife, soon to be a widow. He is gone then, and has not seen us. A queen weeps bitterly, a king's sister and children. Over all these four does death also hover. All shall perish miserably save one. She, as Duchess d'Angoulême, will live, not happily. 
At the temple gate were some faint cries, perhaps from voices of pitiful women. Grath! Grath! Through the rest of the streets there is silence, as of the grave. No man not armed is allowed to be there. The armed, did any even pity, dare not express it, each man overawed by all his neighbours. All windows are down, none seen looking through them. All shops are shut. No wheel carriage rolls this morning in these streets, but one only. Eighty thousand armed men stand ranked like armed statues of men. Cannons bristle, cannoneers with match burning, but no word or movement. It is as a city enchanted into silence and stone. One carriage, with its escort, slowly rumbling, is the only sound. Louis reads in his book of devotion the prayers of the dying. Clatter of this death march falls sharp on the ear in the great silence, but the thought would fain struggle heavenward and forget the earth. As the clock strike ten, behold the Place de la Révolution, once Place de Louis Quinze, the guillotine mounted near the old pedestal where once stood the statue of that Louis. Far round all bristle with cannons and armed men, spectators crowding in the rear, d'Orléans de Galate there in Cabriolet. Swift messengers, hoqueton, speed to the town hall every three minutes, nearby is the convention sitting, vengeful for Le Pelletier. Heedless of all, Louis reads his prayers of the dying. Not till five minutes yet has he finished, then the carriage opens. What temper he is in? Ten different witnesses will give ten different accounts of it. He is in the collision of all tempers, arrived now at the black maelstrom and descent of death, in sorrow, in indignation, in resignation, struggling to be resigned. Take care of Monsieur Edgeworth, he straightly charges the lieutenant who is sitting with them. Then they too descend. The drums are beating. Taisez-vous, silence, he cries, in a terrible voice, d'une voix terrible. He mounts the scaffold, not without delay. He is in puce coat, breeches of grey, white stockings. He strips off the coat, stands disclosed in a sleeve waistcoat of white flannel. The executioners approach to bind him. He spurns, resists. Abbe Edgeworth has to remind him how the saviour, in whom men trust, submitted to be bound. His hands are tied, his head bare. The fatal moment is come. He advances to the edge of the scaffold, his face very red, and says, Frenchman, I die innocent. It is from the scaffold and near appearing before God that I tell you so. I pardon my enemies. I desire that France... A general on horseback, Centaire or another, prances out with uplifted hand. Tambours! The drums drown the voice. Executioners, do your duty. The executioners, desperate lest themselves be murdered, for Santerre and his armed ranks will strike if they do not, seize the hapless Louis. Six of them desperate, him singly desperate, struggling there, and bind him to their plank. Abbe Edgeworth, stooping, bespeaks him, Son of St. Louis, ascend to heaven. The axe clanks down. A king's life is shorn away. It is Monday, the 21st of January, 1793. He was aged 38 years, 4 months and 28 days. Executioner Samson shows the head. Fierce shout of Viva la République rises and swells, caps raised on bayonets, hats waving, students of the College of Four Nations take it up on the far quay, fling it over Paris. Orléans drives off in his cabriolet, the town hall councillors rub their hands, saying, It is done, it is done. There is dipping of handkerchiefs, of pike points in the blood. Headsman Samson, though he afterwards denied it, sells locks of the hair, fractions of the puce coat are long after worn in rings. And so, in some half hour, it is done, and the multitude has all departed. Pastry cooks, coffee sellers, milkmen sing out their trivial quotidian cries. The world wags on as if this were a common day. In the coffee houses that evening, says Proudhon, Patriot shook hands with Patriot in a more cordial manner than usual. 
Not till some days after, according to Messier, did public men see what a grave thing it was. A grave thing it indisputably is, and will have consequences. On the morrow morning, Roland, so long steeped to the lips in disgust and chagrin, sends in his demission. His accounts lie already, correct in black on white to the uttermost farthing. These he wants but to have audited that he might retire to remote obscurity to the country and his books. They will never be audited, those accounts. He will never get retired thither. It was on Tuesday that Roland demitted. On Thursday comes Le Pelletier, Saint-Fargo's funeral and passage to the pantheon of great men, notable as the wild pageant of a winter day. The body is borne aloft, half bare, the winding sheet disclosing the death wound. Sabre and bloody clothes parade themselves, a lugubrious music wailing harsh nainiae. Oak crowns shower down from windows. President Vernier walks there with convention, with Jacobin society, and all patriots of every colour, all mourning, brother-like. Notable also for another thing, this burial of Le Pelletier, it was the last act these men ever did with concert. All parties and figures of opinion that agitate this distracted France and its convention now stand, as it were, face to face and dagger to dagger, the king's life round which they all struck and battled being hurled down. Du Maurier, conquering Holland, growls ominous discontent at the head of armies. Men say Du Maurier will have a king. That young Dorleans Egalité shall be his king. Deputy Fauchet in the Journal des Armées curses his day more bitterly than Job did, invokes the poniards of regicides, of Arras vipers or Robespierre's, of Pluto Dantons, of horrid butchers Legendre and Simulacra des Bois to send him swiftly to another world than theirs. This is tedium Fauchet of the Bastille of Victory, of the Cercle Society. Sharp was the death hail rattling round one's flag of truce on that Bastille day, but it was soft to such wreckage of high hope as this. One's new golden era going down in leaden dross and sulphurous black of the everlasting darkness. At home this killing of a king has divided all friends, and abroad it has united all enemies. Fraternity of peoples, revolutionary propagandism, atheism, regicide, total destruction of social order in this world. All kings and lovers of kings and haters of anarchy rank in coalition as in a war for life. England signifies to citizen Chauvelin, the ambassador, or rather ambassador's cloak, that he must quit the country in eight days. Ambassadors Cloak and Ambassador Chauvelin and Talleyrand depart accordingly. Talleyrand, implicated in that iron press of the Tuileries, thinks it safest to make for America. England has cast out the embassy. England declares war, being shocked principally, it would seem, at the condition of the River Scheldt. Spain declares war, being shocked principally at some other thing, which doubtless the manifesto indicates. Nay, we find it was not England that declared war first, or Spain first, but that France herself declared war first on both of them, a point of immense parliamentary and journalistic interest in those days, but which has become of no interest whatever in these. They all declare war. The sword is drawn, the scabbard thrown away. It is even as Danton said in one of his all too gigantic figures, The coalized kings threaten us. We hurl at their feet as gauge of battle the head of a king. End of Book 2 Chapter 8《The French Revolution A History by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3 The Guillotine Book 3 The Girondins Chapter 1. Cause and Effect This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3. Chapter 1. Cause and Effect This huge insurrectionary movement, which we liken to a breaking out of Tophet and the Abyss, has swept away royalty, aristocracy and a king's life. The question is, what will it next do? How will it henceforth shape itself? 
settle down into a reign of law and liberty according as the habits, persuasions and endeavours of the educated, moneyed, respectable class prescribe? That is to say, the volcanic lava flood bursting up in the manner described will explode and flow according to Girondin formula and pre-established rule of philosophy? If so, for our Girondin friends, it will be well. Meanwhile, were not the prophecy rather that as no external force, royal or other, now remains which could control this movement, the movement will follow a course of its own, probably a very original one. Further, that whatsoever man or men can best interpret the inward tendencies it has and give them voice and activity will obtain the lead of it. For the rest, that as a thing without order, a thing proceeding from beyond and beneath the region of order, it must work and welter, not as a regularity, but as a chaos, destructive and self-destructive, always till something that has order arise strong enough to bind it into subjection again. Which something, we may further conjecture, will not be a formula with philosophical propositions and forensic eloquence, but a reality, probably with a sword in its hand. As for the Girondin formula of a respectable republic for the middle classes, all manner of aristocracies being now sufficiently demolished, there seems little reason to expect that the business will stop there. Liberty, equality, fraternity, these are the words, enunciative and prophetic. Republic for the respectable washed middle classes, how can that be the fulfilment thereof? Hunger and nakedness and nightmare oppression lying heavy on 25 million hearts, this not the wounded vanities or contradicted philosophies of philosophical advocates, rich shopkeepers, rural noblesse, was the prime mover in the French Revolution, as the like will be in all such revolutions in all countries. Feudal fleur-de-lis had become an insupportably bad marching banner and needed to be torn and trampled. But money bag of mammon, for that in these times is what the respectable republic for the middle classes will signify, is a still worse while it lasts. Properly, indeed, it is the worst and basest of all banners and symbols of dominion among men, and indeed is possible only in a time of general atheism and unbelief in anything save in brute force and sensualism, Pride of birth, pride of office, any known kind of pride being a degree better than purse pride. Freedom, equality, brotherhood. Not in the money bag, but far elsewhere will sanscalotism seek these things. We say, therefore, that an insurrectionary France, loose of control from without, destitute of supreme order from within, will form one of the most tumultuous activities ever seen on this earth, such as no Girondin formula can regulate. An immeasurable force, made up of forces manifold, heterogeneous, compatible and incompatible. In plainer words, this France must needs split into parties, each of which seeking to make itself good, contradiction, exasperation will arise, and parties on parties find that they cannot work together, cannot exist together. As for the number of parties, there will, strictly counting, be as many parties as there are opinions according to which rule in this national convention itself, to say nothing of France generally, the number of parties ought to be 749, for every unit entertains his opinion. But now, as every unit has at once an individual nature, or necessity to follow his own road, and a gregarious nature, or necessity to see himself travelling by the side of others, What can there be but dissolutions, precipitations, endless turbulence of attracting and repelling, till once the master element get evolved and this wild alchemy arrange itself again? To the length of 749 parties, however, no nation was ever yet seen to go, nor indeed much beyond the length of two parties, Two at a time, so invincible is man's tendency to unite with all the invincible divisiveness he has. Two parties, we say, are the usual number at one time. Let these two fight it out, all minor shades of party rallying under the shade likest them, when the one has fought down the other, then it in its turn may divide self-destructive, and so the process continue as far as needful. 
This is the way of revolutions, which spring up as the French one has done when the so-called bonds of society snap asunder and all laws that are not laws of nature become naught and formulas merely. But quitting these somewhat abstract considerations, let history note this concrete reality which the streets of Paris exhibit on Monday the 25th of February 1793. Long before daylight that morning, these streets are noisy and angry. Petitioning enough there has been, a convention often solicited. It was but yesterday there came a deputation of washerwomen with petition, complaining that not so much as soap could be had, to say nothing of bread and condiments of bread. The cry of women round the Salle de Manege was heard plaintive, Du pain et du savon, bread and soap. And now, from six o'clock this Monday morning, one perceives the bakers' queues unusually expanded, angrily agitating themselves. Not the baker alone, but two section commissioners to help him manage with difficulty the daily distribution of loaves. Soft-spoken assiduous in the early candlelight are baker and commissioners, and yet the pale, chill February sunrise discloses an unpromising scene. Indignant female patriots, partly supplied with bread, rush now to the shops, declaring that they will have groceries. Groceries enough, sugar barrels rolled forth into the street, patriot citoyenne weighing it out at a just rate of eleven pence a pound, likewise coffee chests, soap chests, nay, cinnamon and cloves chests, with aqua vitae and other forms of alcohol, at a just rate which some do not pay, the pale-faced grocer silently wringing his hands. What help? The distributive citoyenne are a violent speech and gesture, their long Eumenides hair hanging out of curl, nay, in their girdles pistols are seen sticking. Some, it is even said, have beards, male patriots in petticoats and mob cap. Thus in the streets of Lombards, in the streets of Five Diamonds, streets of Pulleys, in most streets of Paris, does it effervesce the live-long day. No municipality, no mere pash, though he was war minister lately, sends military against it, or ought against it, but persuasive eloquence, till seven at night or later. On Monday, gone five weeks, which was the 21st of January, we saw Paris, beheading its king, stand silent like a petrified city of enchantment. And now, on this Monday, it is so noisy, selling sugar. Cities, especially cities in revolution, are subject to these alternations, the secret courses of civic business and existence effervescing and efflorescing in this manner as a concrete phenomenon to the eye of which phenomenon, when secret existence becoming public effloresces on the street, the philosophical cause and effect is not so easy to find. What, for example, may be the accurate philosophical meaning and meanings of this sale of sugar? These things that have become visible in the street of Pulleys and over Paris, whence are they, we say, and whither? That pit has a hand in it, the gold of Pitt, so much to all reasonable patriot men, may seem clear. But then, through what agents of Pitt? Vilet, apostle of liberty, was discerned again of late with his pike and his red nightcap. Deputy Marat published in his journal this very day, complaining of the bitter scarcity and sufferings of the people, till he seemed to get wroth. If your rights of man were anything but a piece of written paper, the plunder of a few shops and a forestaller or two hung up at the door lintels would put an end to such things. Are not these, say the Girondins, pregnant indications? Pitt has bribed the anarchists. Marat is the agent of Pitt, hence this sale of sugar. To the mother society, again, it is clear that the scarcity is factitious, is the work of Girondins and such like, a set of men partly sold to Pitt, sold wholly to their own ambitions and hard-hearted pedantries who will not fix the grain prices but prate pedantically of free trade, wishing to starve Paris into violence and embroil it with the departments, hence this sale of sugar. And alas, if to these two notabilities of a phenomenon and such theories of a phenomenon, we add this third notability, that the French nation has believed for several years now in the possibility 
nay, certainty, a near advent of a universal millennium, or reign of freedom, equality, fraternity, wherein man should be the brother of man, and sorrow and sin flee away. Not bread to eat, not soap to wash with, and the reign of perfect felicity ready to arrive, due always since the Bastille fell. How did our hearts burn within us at that feast of pikes when brother flung himself on brother's bosom and in sunny jubilee twenty-five millions burst forth into sound and cannon smoke? Bright was our hope then as sunlight. Red angry is our hope grown now as consuming fire. But, oh heavens, what enchantment is it, or devilish leisure domain of such effect that perfect felicity, always within arm's length, could never be laid hold of, but only in her stead, controversy and scarcity. This set of traitors after that set, tremble ye traitors, dread a people which calls itself patient, long-suffering, but which cannot always submit to have its pocket picked in this way of a millennium. Yes, reader, here is a miracle. Out of that putrescent rubbish of scepticism, sensualism, sentimentalism, hollow Machiavellianism, such a faith has verily risen, flaming in the heart of a people. A whole people, awakening as it were to consciousness in deep misery, believes that it is within reach of a fraternal heaven on earth. With longing arms it struggles to embrace the unspeakable, cannot embrace it owing to certain causes. Seldom do we find that a whole people can be said to have any faith at all, except in things which it can eat and handle. Whensoever it gets any faith, its history becomes spirit-stirring, noteworthy. But since the time when steel Europe shook itself simultaneously at the word of Hermit Peter and rushed towards the sepulchre where God had lain, there was no universal impulse of faith that one could note. Since Protestantism went silent, no Luther's voice, no Ziska's drum any longer proclaiming that God's truth was not the devil's lie, and the last of the Cameronians, Rennick was the name of him, honour to the name of the brave, sank shot on the castle hill of Edinburgh, there was no partial impulse of faith among nations. Till now, behold, once more, this French nation believes. Herein, we say, in that astonishing faith of theirs lies the miracle. It is a faith, undoubtedly, of the more prodigious sort, even among faiths, and will embody itself in prodigies. It is the soul of that world prodigy named French Revolution, whereat the world still gazes and shudders. But for the rest, let no man ask history to explain by cause and effect how the business proceeded henceforth. This battle of Mountain and Gironde and what follows is the battle of fanaticisms and miracles unsuitable for cause and effect. The sound of it to the mind is as a hubbub of voices in distraction. Little of articulate is to be gathered by long listening and studying, only battle tumult, shouts of triumph, shrieks of despair. The mountain has left no memoirs, the Girondins have left memoirs, which are too often little other than long-drawn interjections of woe is me and cursed be ye. So soon as history can philosophically delineate the conflagration of a kindled fire ship, she may try this other task. Here lay the bitumen stratum, there the brimstone one, so ran the vein of gunpowder, of nitre, terebinth and foul grease. This were she inquisitive enough, history might partly know. But how they acted and reacted below decks, one fire stratum playing into the other, by its nature and the art of man, now when all hand ran raging and the flames lashed high over shrouds and topmast, this let not history attempt. The fire ship is old France, and old France form of life, her creed a generation of men. Wild are their cries and their ragings there, like spirits tormented in that flame. But on the whole, are they not gone, O reader? Their fireship and they, frightening the world, have sailed away, its flames and its thunders quite away into the deep of time. One thing, therefore, history will do. Pity them all, for it went hard with them all. 
not even the sea-green incorruptible, but shall have some pity, some human love, though it takes an effort. And now, so much once thoroughly attained, the rest will become easier. To the eye of equal brotherly pity, innumerable perversions dissipate themselves. Exaggerations and execrations fall off of their own accord. Standing wistfully on the safe shore, we will look and see what is of interest to us, what is adapted to us. End of Book 3, Chapter 1《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 3, The Girondin, Chapter 2, Calotic and Sans Calotic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 2, Calotic and Sans Calotic. Gironde and Mountain are now in full quarrel. Their mutual rage, says Toulongion, is growing a pale rage. Curious, lamentable, all these men have the word republic on their lips. In the heart of every one of them is a passionate wish for something which he calls republic. Yet see their death quarrel. So, however, are men made. Creatures who live in confusion, who, once thrown together, can readily fall into that confusion of confusions which quarrel is, simply because their confusions differ from one another, still more because they seem to differ. Men's words are a poor exponent of their thought. Nay, their thought itself is a poor exponent of the inward unnamed mystery wherefrom both thought and action have their birth. No man can explain himself, can get himself explained. Men see not one another, but distorted phantasms which they call one another, which they hate and go to battle with. For all battle is well said to be misunderstanding. But indeed, that similitude of the fireship of our poor French brethren, so fiery themselves, working also in an element of fire, was not insignificant. Consider it well, there is a shade of the truth in it. For a man once committed headlong to Republican or any other transcendentalism, and fighting and fanaticizing amid a nation of his like, becomes, as it were, enveloped in an ambient atmosphere of transcendentalism and delirium. His individual self is lost in something that is not himself, but foreign, though inseparable from him. Strange to think of, the man's cloak still seems to hold the same man, and yet the man is not there, his volition is not there, nor the source of what he will do and devise. Instead of the man and his volition, there is a piece of fanaticism and fatalism incarnated in the shape of him. He, the hapless incarnated fanaticism, goes his road. No man can help him, he himself least of all. It is a wonderful, tragical predicament, such as human languages, unused to deal with these things, being contrived for the uses of common life, struggles to shadow out in figures. The ambient element of material fire is not wilder than this of fanaticism, nor, though visible to the eye, is it more real. Volition bursts forth involuntarily, rapidly, along, the movement of free human minds becomes a raging tornado of fatalism, blind as the winds, and Mountain and Gironde, when they recover themselves, are alike astounded to see where it has flung and dropped them. To such height of miracle can men work on men, the conscious and the unconscious blended inscrutably in this our inscrutable life, endless necessity environing free will. The weapons of the Girondins are political philosophy, respectability and eloquence. Eloquence, or call it rhetoric, really of a superior order. Vernio, for instance, turns a period as sweetly as any man of that generation. The weapons of the mountain are those of mere nature, audacity and impetuosity, which may become ferocity, as of men complete in their determination, in their conviction, nay, of men in some cases who, as Septemberers, must either prevail or perish. The ground to be fought for is popularity. Further, ye may either seek popularity with the friends of freedom and order, or with the friends of freedom simple, 
to seek it with both has unhappily become impossible. With the former sort, and generally with the authorities of the departments and such as read parliamentary debates and are of respectability and of a peace-loving, moneyed nature, the Girondins carry it. With the extreme patriot again, with the indigent millions, especially with the population of Paris, who do not read so much as hear and see, the Girondins altogether lose it, and the mountain carries it. Egoism, not meanness of mind, is not wanting on either side. Surely not on the Girondin side, where in fact the instinct of self-preservation, too prominently unfolded by circumstances, cuts almost a sorry figure where also a certain finesse to the length even of shuffling and shamming now and then shows itself. They are men skilful in advocate fence. They have been called the Jesuits of the Revolution, but that is too hard a name. It must be owned likewise that this rude blustering mountain has a sense in it of what the Revolution means, which these eloquent Girondins are totally void of. Was the revolution made and fought for against the world these four weary years that a formula might be substantiated, that society might become methodic, demonstrable by logic, and the old noblesse with their pretensions vanish? Or ought it not withal to bring some glimmering of light and alleviation to the twenty-five millions who sat in darkness heavy laden till they rose with pikes in their hands? At least, and lowest, one would think, it should bring them a proportion of bread to live on. There is in the mountain, here and there, in Marat, people's friend, in the incorruptible sea-green himself, though otherwise so lean and formularly, a heartfelt knowledge of this latter fact, without which knowledge of all other knowledge here is naught, and the choicest forensic eloquence is a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal most cold, on the other hand, most patronising, unsubstantial, is the tone of the Girondins towards our poorer brethren, those brethren whom one often hears of under the collective name of the masses, as if they were not persons at all, but mounds of combustible explosive material for blowing down Bastille with. In very truth, a revolutionist of this kind, is he not a solecism? disowned by nature and art, deserving only to be erased and disappear. Surely to our poorer brethren of Paris all this Girondin patronage sounds deadening and killing. If fine-spoken and incontrovertible in logic, then all the falser, all the hatefuller, in fact. Nay, doubtless, pleading for popularity here among our poorer brethren of Paris, the Girondin has a hard game to play. If he gain the ear of the respectable at a distance, it is by insisting on September and such like. It is at the expense of this Paris where he dwells and perorates. Hard to perorate in such an auditory. Wherefore the question arises, could we not get ourselves out of this Paris? Twice or oftener such an attempt is made. If not, we ourselves think good, eh? Then at least our suppliant might do it. For every deputy has his suppliant or substitute who will take his place if need be. Might not these assemble, say, at Bourges, which is a quiet Episcopal town in quiet Berry, forty good leagues off? In that case, what profit were it for the Paris Saint's galottery to insult us, a suppliant sitting quiet in Bourges to whom we could run? Nay, even the primary electoral assemblies, thinks Gourdet, might be reconvoked and a new convention got, with new orders from the sovereign people, and right glad were Lyon, Bordeaux, Rouen, Marseille, as yet provincial towns, to welcome us in their turn and become a sort of capital towns, and teach these Parisians reason. Fond schemes, which all miss go. If decreed in heat of eloquent logic today, they are appealed by clamour and passionate wider considerations on the morrow. Will you, O Girondins, parcel us into separate republics then, like the Swiss, like your Americans, so that there be no metropolis or indivisible French nation any more? Your departmental guards seem to point that way. Federal Republic? Federalist? 
men in knitting women repeat federalist with or without much dictionary meaning, but go on repeating it, as is usual in such cases, till the meaning of it becomes almost magical, fit to designate all mystery of iniquity, and federalista has grown a word of exorcism and apage satanas. But furthermore, consider what poisoning of public opinion in the departments by these brisso, gossas, carita, condosay newspapers. And then also what counter-poisoning, still feller in quality, by a Père Duchesne of Hébert, brutalist newspaper yet published on earth, by a Rougif of Gouvoy, by the incendiary leaves of Marat. More than once on complaint given and effervescence rising, it is decreed that a man cannot both be legislator and editor, that he shall choose between the one function and the other. But this too, which indeed could help a little, is revoked or eluded, remains a pious wish, mainly. Meanwhile, as to the sad fruit of such strife, behold, O ye national representatives, how between the friends of law and the friends of freedom everywhere, mere heats and jealousies have arisen, fevering the whole republic. Department, provincial town is set against metropolis, rich against poor, colotic against sans colotic, man against man. From the southern cities come addresses of an almost inculpatory character, for Paris has long suffered newspaper calumny. Bordeaux demands a reign of law and respectability, meaning Girondism, with emphasis. With emphasis, Marseille demands the like. Nay, from Marseille there come two addresses, one Girondin, one Jacobin sans colotic. Hot Rebecca, sick of this convention work, has given place to his substitute and gone home, where also with such jarrings there is work to be sick of. Lyon, a place of capitalists and aristocrats, is in still worse state, almost in revolt. Chalier, the Jacobin town councillor, has got too literally to daggers drawn with Nievre Col, the moderate and mayor, one of your moderate, perhaps aristocrat, royalists or federalist mayors. Chalier, who pilgrimed to Paris to behold Marat and the mountain, has verily kindled himself at their sacred urn, for on the 6th of February last, history or rumour has seen him haranguing his Leon Jacobin in a quite transcendental manner, with a drawn dagger in his hand, recommending, they say, sheer September methods, patience being worn out, and that the Jacobin brethren should impromptu work the guillotine themselves. One sees him still in engravings, mounted on a table, foot advanced, body contorted, a bald, rude, slope-browed, infuriated visage of the canine species, the eyes starting from their sockets, in his puissant right hand the brandished dagger, or horse pistol as some give it, other dog visages kindling under him, a man not likely to end well. However, the guillotine was not got together impromptu that day on the Pont Saint-Clair or elsewhere, but indeed continued lying rusty in its loft. Nievre Scholl, with military, went about, rumbling cannon in the most confused manner, and the nine hundred prisoners received no hurt. So distracted is Lyon grown with its cannon rumbling. Convention commissioners must be sent thither forthwith, if even they can appease it and keep the guillotine in its loft. Consider finally if, on all these mad jarrings of the southern cities and of France generally, a traitorous crypto-royalist class is not looking and watching, ready to strike in at the right season. Neither is there bread, neither is there soap. See the patriot women selling out sugar at a just rate of 22 sous per pound. Citizen representatives, it were verily well that your quarrels finished and the reign of perfect felicity began. End of Book 3, Chapter 2《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 3, The Girondins, Chapter 3, Growing Shrill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 3, Growing Shrill. On the whole, one cannot say that the Girondins are wanting to themselves so far as good will might go. They prick assiduously into the sore places of the mountain, from principle and also from Jesuitism. 
Besides September, of which there is now little to be made except effervescence, we discern two sore places where the mountain often suffers, Marat and Orléans à Galité. Squalid Marat, for his own sake and for the mountains, is assaulted ever and anon, held up to France as a squalid, bloodthirsty portent, inciting to the pillage of shops, of whom let the mountain have the credit. The mountain murmurs ill at ease. This maximum of patriotism, how shall they either own him or disown him? As for Marat personally, he, with his fixed idea, remains invulnerable to such things. Nay, the people's friend is very evidently rising in importance as his befriended people rises. No shrieks now when he goes to speak, occasional applauses rather, furtherance which breeds confidence. The day when the Girondins proposed to decree him accused, décreté d'accusation, as they phrase it, for that February paragraph of hanging up a forestaller or two at the door lintels, Marat proposes to have them decreed insane, and descending the tribune steps is heard to articulate these most unsenatorial ejaculations. Les cochons, les imbéciles! Pigs, idiots! Oftentimes he croaks harsh sarcasm, having really a rough, rasping tongue and a very deep fund of contempt for fine outsides, and once or twice he even laughs, nay, explodes into laughter, rio éclat, at the gentilities and superfine airs of these Girondin men of statesmanship, with their pedantries, plausibilities, pusillanimities, these two years, says he, you have been whining about attacks and plots and dangers from Paris, and you have not a scratch to show for yourselves. Danton gruffly rebukes him from time to time, a maximum of patriotism whom one can neither own nor disown. But the second sore place of the mountain is this anomalous Monseigneur Equality Prince d'Orléans, Behold these men, says the Gironde, with a wild and bourbon prince among them. They are creatures of the Dorléans faction. They will have Philippe made king, one king no sooner guillotined than another made in his stead. Girondins have moved, Buzo moved long ago, from principle and also from Jesuitism, that the whole race of Bourbon should be marched forth from the soil of France, this prince Egalité, to bring up the rear motions which might produce some effect on the public, which the mountain, ill at ease, knows not what to do with. And poor Orléans Egalité himself, for one begins to pity even him, what does he do with them? The disowned of all parties, the rejected and foolishly bedrifted hither and thither, to what corner of nature can he now drift with advantage? Feasible hope remains not for him, Unfeasible hope in pallid, doubtful glimmers there may still come, bewildering, not cheering or illuminating, from the Dumouriez quarter. And how, if not the time wasted Orleans Egalité, then perhaps the young, unworn Chartres Egalité might rise to be a kind of king? Sheltered, if shelter it be, in the clefts of the mountain, poor Egalité will wait. One refuge in Jacobinism, one in Dumouriez and counter-revolution. Are there not two chances? However, the look of him, Dame Jeanne says, is grown gloomy, sad to see. See, Yuri, also the Jeanne husband, who hovers about the mountain, not on it, is in a bad way. Dame Jeanne has come to Rancy, out of England, and Berry St. Edmunds in these days, being summoned by Egalité with her young charge, Mademoiselle Egalité, so that Mademoiselle might not be counted among emigrants and hardly dealt with. But it proves a ravelled business. jean Lee and charge find that they must retire to the Netherlands, must wait on the frontiers for a week or two, till Monseigneur, by Jacobin help, get it wound up. Next morning, says Dame jean Lee, Monseigneur, gloomier than ever, gave me his arm to lead me to the carriage. I was greatly troubled. Mademoiselle burst into tears. Her father was pale and trembling. After I had got seated, he stood immovable at the carriage door with his eyes fixed on me. His mournful and painful look seemed to implore pity. Adieu, madame, said he. The altered sound of his voice completely overcame me. Not able to utter a word, I held out my hand. 
He grasped it close, then turning and advancing sharply towards the postilions, he gave them a sign, and we rolled away. Nor are peacemakers wanting, of whom likewise we mentioned two, one fast on the crown of the mountain, the other not yet alighted anywhere. Danton and Barrère. Ingenious Barrère, old constituent and editor from the slopes of the Pyrenees, is one of the usefulest men of this convention in his way. Truth may lie on both sides, on either side or on neither side. My friends, ye must give and take, for the rest success to the winning side. This is the motto of Barrère. Ingenious, almost genial, quick-sighted, supple, graceful, a man that will prosper. Scarcely Belial in the assembled pandemonium was plausible to ear and eye. An indispensable man, in the great art of varnish, he may be said to seek his fellow. Has there an explosion arisen, as many do arise, a confusion, unsightliness, which no tongue can speak of, nor eye look on? Give it to Barrer. Barrer shall be committee reporter of it. You shall see it transmute itself into a regularity, into the very beauty and improvement that was needed. Without one such man, we say, how are this convention bested? Call him not, as exaggerative Messier does, the greatest liar in France. Nay, it may be argued that there is not truth enough in him to make a real lie of. Call him, with Burke, anacreon of the guillotine, and a man serviceable to this convention. The other peacemaker whom we name is Danton. Peace, oh peace with one another, cries Danton often enough. Are we not alone against the world, a little band of brothers? Broad Danton is loved by all the mountain, but they think him too easy-tempered, deficient in suspicion. He has stood between Du Maurier and much censure, anxious not to exasperate our only general, in the shrill tumult, Danton's strong voice reverberates for union and pacification. Meetings there are, dinings with the Girondins. It is so pressingly essential that there be union. But the Girondins are haughty and respectable. This titan Danton is not a man of formulas, and there rests on him a shadow of September. Your Girondins have no confidence in me. This is the answer a conciliatory Mayon gets from him. To all the arguments and pleadings this conciliatory mayon can bring, the repeated answer is, Ils n'ont point de confiance. The tumult will get even shriller. The rage is growing pale. In fact, what a pang is it to the heart of a Girondin, this first withering probability that the despicable, unphilosophic, anarchic mountain, after all, may triumph. Brutal Septembrers, a fifth-floor Italian, a Robespierre without an idea in his head, as Condorcet says, or a feeling in his heart, and yet we, the flower of France, cannot stand against them. Behold, the sceptre departs from us, from us and goes to them. Eloquence, philosophism, respectability avail not. Against stupidity the very gods fight to no purpose. Mit der Dummheit kämpfen Gottes selbst vergebens. Shrill are the plaints of Louvet, his thin existence all acidified into rage and preternatural insight of suspicion. Wrath is young Barbaru, wrath and scornful. Silent like a queen with an aspic on her bosom sits the wife of Roland. Roland's accounts never yet got audited, his name become a byword. Such is the fortune of war, especially of revolution. The great gulf of Tophet and 10th of August opened itself at the magic of your eloquent voice, and lo, now it will not close at your voice. It is a dangerous thing, such magic. The magician's famulus got hold of the forbidden book and summoned a goblin. Plate deal, what is your will? said the goblin. The famulus, somewhat struck, bade him fetch water. The swift goblin fetched it, pale in each hand, but lo, would not cease fetching it. Desperate, the famulus shrieks at him, smites at him, cuts him in two. Lo, two goblin water carriers ply, and the house will be swum away in Deucalion deluges. End of Book 3 Chapter 3《The French Revolution A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3 The Guillotine 
Book 3. The Girondins. Chapter 4. Fatherland in Danger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3. Chapter 4. Fatherland in Danger. Or rather, we will say, this senatorial war might have lasted long, and party tugging and throttling with party might have suppressed and smothered one another in the ordinary bloodless parliamentary way, on one condition that France had been at least able to exist all the while. But this sovereign people has a digestive faculty and cannot do without bread. Also, we are at war and must have victory, at war with Europe, with fate and famine, and behold, in the spring of the year, all victory deserts us. Du Maurier had his outposts stretched as far as Aix la chapelle and the beautifulest plan for pouncing on Holland by stratagem, flat-bottomed boats and rapid intrepidity, wherein too he had prospered so far, but unhappily could prosper no further. Aix la chapelle is lost. Maastricht will not surrender to mere smoke and noise. The flat-bottomed boats must launch themselves again and return the way they came. Steady now, ye rapidly intrepid men, retreat with firmness, Parthian-like. Alas, were it General Miranda's fault, were it the war minister's fault, or were it de Muria's own fault and that of fortune, enough there is nothing for it but retreat. Well, if it be not even flight, for already terror-stricken cohorts and stragglers pour off, not waiting for order, flow disastrous, as many as ten thousand of them, without halt till they see France again. Nay, worse, du Maurier himself is perhaps secretly turning traitor. Very sharp is the tone in which he writes to our committees. Commissioners and Jacobin pillagers have done such incalculable mischief. Hassenfreit sends neither cartridges nor clothing. Shoes we have, deceptively sold with wood and pasteboard. Nothing, in short, is right. Danton and Lacroix, when it was that they were commissioners, would needs join Belgium to France, of which du Maurier might have made the prettiest little duchy for his own secret behoof. With all these things the general is wroth, and writes to us in a sharp tone. Who knows what this hot little general is meditating? Du Maurier, Duke of Belgium, or Brabant, or, say, Egalité, the younger king of France, there were an end for our revolution." Committee of Defence gazes and shakes its head, who except Danton, defective in suspicion, could still struggle to be of hope. And General Castine is rolling back from the Rhine country. Conquered Mentz will be reconquered, the Prussians gathering round to bombard it with shot and shell. Mentz may resist, Commissioner Merlin, the Thionville, making sallies at the head of the besieged, resist to the death, but not longer than that. How sad a reverse for Mentz. Brave Foster, brave Lux, planted liberty trees amid sigh-raring music in the snow-slush of last winter there, and made Jacobin societies and got the territory incorporated with France. They came hither to Paris as deputies or delegates and have their eighteen francs a day. But see, before once the liberty tree is got rightly in leaf, Mentz is changing into an explosive crater, vomiting fire, be vomited with fire. Neither of these men shall again see Mentz. They have come hither only to die. Foster has been round the globe. He saw Cook perish under Awihi clubs. But like this Paris, he has yet seen or suffered nothing. Poverty escorts him. From home there can nothing come except Job's news. The eighteen daily francs, which we hear as deputy or delegate with difficulty touch, are in paper assignats and sink fast in value. Poverty, disappointment, inaction, obloquy, the brave heart slowly breaking. Such is Foster's lot. For the rest, Demoiselle Terogne smiles on you in the soirees, a beautiful brown-locked face of an exalted temper, and contrives to keep her carriage. Prussian Trenk, the poor subterranean baron, jargons and jangles in an unmelodious manner. Thomas Paine's face is red-pustuled, but the eyes uncommonly bright. Convention deputies ask you to dinner, very courteous, and we all play at plum sack. It is the explosion and new creation of a world, says Foster, and the actors in it, such small, mean objects, buzzing round one like a handful of flies. 
Likewise, there is war with Spain. Spain will advance through the gorges of the Pyrenees, rustling with Bourbon banners, jingling with artillery and menace. And England has donned the red coat and marches with Royal Highness of York, whom some once spake of inviting to be our king. Change that humour now, and ever more changing, till no hatefuler thing walk this earth than a denizen of that tyrannous island, and Pitt be declared and decreed with effervescence, l'ennemi du genre humain, the enemy of mankind. And very singular to say, you make an order that no soldier of liberty give quarter to an Englishman. Which order, however, the soldier of liberty does but partially obey. We will take no prisoners then, say the soldiers of liberty. They shall all be deserters that we take. It is a frantic order, and attended with inconvenience. For surely, if you give no quarter, the plain issue is that you will get none. And so the business becomes as broad as it was long. Our recruitment of 300,000 men, which was the decreed force for this year, is like to have work enough laid to its hand. So many enemies come wending on, penetrating through throats of mountains, steering over the salt sea, towards all points of our territory, rattling chains at us. Nay, worst of all, there is an enemy within our own territory itself. In the early days of March, the Nant post-bags do not arrive. There arrive only instead of them conjecture, apprehension, bodeful wind of rumour. The bodefulest proves true. Those fanatic peoples of Lavande will no longer keep under. Their fire of insurrection, heretofore dissipated with difficulty, blazes out anew after the king's death as a wide conflagration, not riot but civil war. Your Catellino, your Stofflet, Charettes are other men than was thought. Behold how their peasants in mere russet and hodden, with their rude arms, rude array, with their fanatic Gaelic frenzy and wild yelling battle cry of God and the King, dash at us like a dark whirlwind, and blow the best disciplined nationals we can get into panic and self keeper. Field after field is theirs, one sees not where it will end. Commandant Santerre may be sent thither, but with none effect. He might as well have returned and brewed beer. It has become peremptorily necessary that a national convention cease arguing and begin acting. Yield one party of you to the other, and do it swiftly. No theoretic outlook is here, but the close certainty of ruin, the very day that is passing over, must be provided for. It was Friday the 8th of March when this Job's post from Dumouriez, thickly preceded and escorted by so many other Job's posts, reached the National Convention. Blank enough are most faces. Little will it avail whether our Septemberers be punished or go unpunished if Pitt and Coburg are coming in with one punishment for us all. Nothing now between Paris itself and the tyrants but a doubtful Dumouriez and hosts in loose-flowing loud retreat. Danton, the titan, rises in this hour, as always in the hour of need. Great is his voice, reverberating from the domes. Citizen representatives, shall we not in such crisis of fate lay aside discords? Reputation! Oh, what is the reputation of this man or of that? Comment non soit flétri que la France soit libre? Let my name be blighted, let France be free. It is necessary now again that France rise in swift vengeance with her million right hands, with her heart as of one man. Instantaneous recruitment in Paris. Let every section of Paris furnish its thousands. Every section of France. Ninety-six commissioners of us, two for each section of the forty-eight, must go forth with and tell Paris what the country needs of her. Let eighty more of us be sent post-haste over France to spread the fire across to call forth the might of men. Let the eighty also be on the road before this sitting rise. Let them go and think what their errand is. Speedy camp of fifty thousand between Paris and the north frontier, for Paris will pour forth her volunteers. Shoulder to shoulder, one strong, universal, death-defiant, rising and rushing, we shall hurl back these sons of night yet again, and France, in spite of the world, be free. So sounds the titan's voice into all section houses, into all French hearts. Sections sit in permanence for recruitment, enrolment that very night. 
Convention commissioners on swift heels are carrying the fire cross from town to town till all France blaze. And so there is flag of fatherland in danger waving from the town hall, black flag from the top of Notre Dame Cathedral. There is proclamation, hot eloquence, Paris rushing out once again to strike its enemies down. That in such circumstances Paris was in no mild humour can be conjectured. Agitated streets, still more agitated round the Salle de Manège. Foyant's terrace crowds itself with angry citizens, angrier citizenesses. Violet perambulates with portable chair, ejaculations of no measured kind as to perfidious fine-spoken homme d'état, friends of Dumouriez, secret friends of Pitt and Coburg, burst from the hearts and lips of men. To fight the enemy? Yes, and even to freeze him with terror, glacé de froid, but first to have domestic traitors punished. Who are they that, carping and quarrelling in their Jesuitic most moderate way, seek to shackle the patriotic movement, that divide France against Paris and poison public opinion in the departments, that when we ask for bread and a maximum fixed price, treat us with lectures on free trade in grains? Can the human stomach satisfy itself with lectures on free trade, and are we to fight the Austrians in a moderate manner or in an immoderate This convention must be purged, set up a swift tribunal for traitors, a maximum for grains. Thus speak with energy the patriot volunteers as they defile through the convention hall, just on the wing to the frontiers, perorating in that heroical Cambyses vein of theirs, beshouted by the galleries and mountain, bemurmured by the right side and plain. Nor are prodigies wanting. Lo, while a captain of the section Poissonnier perorates with vehemence about Dumouriez, Maximum, and crypto-royalist traitors, and his troop beat chorus with him, waving their banner overhead, the eye of a deputy discerns in this same banner that the cravats or streamers of it have royal fleur-de-lis. The section captain shrieks, his troops shriek, horror-struck, and trample the banner underfoot, seemingly the work of some crypto-royalist plotter. A most probable, or perhaps at bottom only the old banner of the section manufactured prior to the 10th of August, when such streamers were according to rule. History, looking over the Girondin memoirs, anxious to disentangle the truth of them from the hysterics, finds these days of March, especially this Sunday the 10th of March, play a great part. Plots, plots, a plot for murdering the Girondin deputies, anarchists and secret royalists plotting in hellish concert for that end? The far greatest part of which is hysterics. What we do find indisputable is that Louvet and certain Girondins were apprehensive they might be murdered on Saturday, and did not go to the evening sitting, but held counsel with one another, each inciting his fellow to do something resolute, and end these anarchists, to which, however, Pétion, opening the window and finding the night very wet, answered only, Il ne fera rien, and composedly resumed his violin, says Louvet, thereby, with soft Lydian tweedledeeing, to wrap himself against eating cares. Also that Louvet felt especially liable to being killed, that several Girondins went abroad to seek beds, liable to being killed, but were not, Further that, in very truth, journalist Deputy Gossard, poisoner of the departments, he and his printer had their houses broken into by a tumult of patriots, among whom ribbed Capt. Valet, American Fournier, loom forth in the darkness of the rain and riot, had their wives put in fear, their presses, types and circumjacent equipment beaten to ruin, no mare intervening in time. Gossard himself escaping, pistol in hand, along the coping of the back wall. Further, that Sunday, the morrow, was not a work day, and the streets were more agitated than ever. Is it a new September, then, that these anarchists intend? Finally, that no September came, and also that hysterics, not unnaturally, had reached almost their acme. Vigneault denounces and deplores in sweetly turned periods. Section Bon Conseil, good counsel so named, not more conseil or ill counsel as it once was, does a far notabler thing. Demands that Vergniaud, Brissot, Gaudet and other denunciatory fine-spoken Girondins to the number of twenty-two be put under arrest. 
Section Good Counsel, so named ever since the 10th of August, is sharply rebuked like a section of ill counsel, but its word is spoken and will not fall to the ground. In fact, one thing strikes us in these poor Girondins, their fatal shortness of vision, nay, fatal poorness of character, for that is the root of it. They are as strangers to the people they would govern, to the thing they have come to work in. Formulas, philosophies, respectabilities, what has been written in books and admitted by the cultivated classes, this inadequate scheme of nature's working is all that nature, let her work as she will, can reveal to these men. So they perorate and speculate and call on the friends of law when the question is not law or no law, but life or no life. Pedants of the revolution, if not Jesuits of it, their formalism is great. Great also is their egoism. France rising to fight Austria has been raised only by plot of the 10th of March to kill 22 of them. This revolution prodigy unfolding itself into terrific stature and articulation by its own laws and natures, not by the laws of formula, has become unintelligible, incredible as an impossibility, the waste chaos of a dream. A republic founded on what they call the virtues, on what we call the decencies and respectabilities, this they will have, and nothing but this. Whatsoever other republic nature and reality send shall be considered as not sent, as a kind of nightmare vision and thing non-extant, disowned by the laws of nature and of formula. Alas! Dim for the best eyes is this reality, and as for these men, they will not look at it with eyes at all, but only through faceted spectacles of pedantry, wounded vanity, which yield the most portentous, fallacious spectrum. Carping and complaining forever of plots and anarchy, they will do one thing, prove to demonstration that the reality will not translate into their formula that they and their formula are incompatible with the reality, and in its dark wrath the reality will extinguish it, and them. What a man kens, he kens. But the beginning of a man's doom is that vision be withdrawn from him, that he see not the reality, but a false spectrum of the reality, and following that, step darkly, with more or less velocity, downwards to the utter dark, to ruin, which is the great sea of darkness, whither all falsehoods, winding or direct, continually flow. This 10th of March we may mark as an epoch in the Girondin destinies, the rage so exasperated itself, the misconception so darkened itself. Many desert the sittings, many come to them armed. An honourable deputy setting out after breakfast must now, besides taking his notes, see whether his priming is in order. Meanwhile, with Dumouriez in Belgium, it fares ever worse. Were it again General Miranda's fault or some other's fault, there is no doubt whatever, but the Battle of Nervinden on the 18th of March is lost, and our rapid retreat has become a far too rapid one. Victorious Coburg, with his Austrian prickers, hangs like a dark cloud on the rear of us. Dumouriez never off horseback night or day, engagement every three hours, our whole discomfited host rolling rapidly inwards, full of rage, suspicion and sauve qui peut. And then Dumouriez himself, what his intents may be. Wicked, seemingly, and not charitable. His dispatches to committee openly denounce a factious convention for the woes it is brought on France and him. And his speeches, for the general has no reticence, the execution of the tyrant this Dumouriez calls the murder of the king. Danton and Lacroix, flying thither as commissioners once more, return very doubtful. Even Danton now doubts. Three Jacobin missionaries, Prolis, Dubuisson, Pereira have flown forth, sped by a wakeful mother society. They are struck dumb to hear the general speak. The convention, according to this general, consists of 300 scoundrels and 400 imbeciles. France cannot do without a king. But we have executed the king. And what is it to me, hastily cries Dumouriez, a general of no reticence, whether the king's name be Ludovicus or Jacobus? Or Philippus, 
rejoins Proly and hastens to report progress. Over the frontiers, such hope is there. End of Book 3, Chapter 4 The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 3, The Girondins, Chapter 5, Sans Colottism Accoutred. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 5, Sans Colottism Accoutred. Let us look, however, at the grand internal Sans Colottism and Revolution prodigy, whether it stirs and waxes. There and not elsewhere, hope may still be for France. The revolution prodigy, as decree after decree issues from the mountain, like creative fiats, accordant with the nature of the thing, is shaping itself rapidly in these days into terrific stature and articulation, limb after limb. Last March, 1792, we saw all France flowing in blind terror, shutting town barriers, boiling pitch for brigands. Happier this March that it is a seeing terror, that a creative mountain exists which can say fiat. Recruitment proceeds with fierce celerity. Nevertheless, our volunteers hesitate to set out till treason be punished at home. They do not fly to the frontiers, but only fly hither and thither, demanding and denouncing. The mountain must speak new fiat and new fiats. And does it not speak such? Take as first example those comités révolutionnaires for the arrestment of persons suspect. Revolutionary committee of twelve chosen patriots sits in every township of France, examining the suspect, seeking arms, making domiciliary visits and arrestments, caring generally that the Republic suffer no detriment. Chosen by universal suffrage, each in its section, they are a kind of elixir of Jacobinism, some 44,000 of them awake and alive over France. In Paris and all towns, every house door must have the names of the inmates legibly printed on it, at a height not exceeding five feet from the ground. Every citizen must produce his certificatory cut de civisme, signed by section president. Every man be ready to give account of the faith that is in him. Person suspect had as well depart this soil of liberty. And yet departure too is bad. All emigrants are declared traitors. Their property become national. They are dead in law, save indeed that for our behoof they shall live yet fifty years in law, and what heritages may fall to them in that time become national too. A mad vitality of Jacobinism, with 44,000 centres of activity, circulates through all fibres of France. Very notable also is the Tribunal Extraordinaire decreed by the mountain, some Girondins dissenting. For surely such a court contradicts every formula, other Girondins assenting, nay, cooperating, for do not we all hate traitors, O ye people of Paris? Tribunal of the 17th in autumn last was swift, but this shall be swifter. Five judges, a standing jury, which is named from Paris and the neighbourhood, that there be not delay in naming it. They are subject to no appeal, to hardly any law forms, but must get themselves convinced in all readiest ways, and for security are bound to vote audibly, audibly in the hearing of a Paris public. This is the Tribunal Extraordinaire, which in few months, getting into most lively action, shall be entitled Tribunal Revolutionnaire, as indeed it from the very first has entitled itself, with a Herman or a Dumas for judge-president, with a Fouquier Tinville for attorney-general, and a jury of such as Citizen Leroy, who has surnamed himself Dizaou, Leroy, August 10th. It will become the wonder of the world. Herein has Sans Colottism fashioned for itself a sword of sharpness, a weapon magical, tempered in the Stygian hell waters, to the edge of it all armour and defence of strength or of cunning shall be soft, it shall mow down lives and brazen gates, and the waving of it shed terror through the souls of men. 
But speaking of an amorphous sense calotism taking form, ought we not above all things to specify how the amorphous gets itself ahead? Without metaphor, this revolution government continues hitherto in a very anarchic state. Executive Council of Ministers, six in number, there is, but they, especially since Roland's retreat, have hardly known whether they were ministers or not. Convention committees sit supreme over them, but then each committee as supreme as the others. Committee of 21, of defence, of general surety, simultaneous or successive for specific purposes. The convention alone is all-powerful, especially if the commune go with it but is too numerous for an administrative body. Wherefore, in this perilous, quick-whirling condition of the Republic, before the end of March, we obtain our small Comité de Salut Public, as it were, for miscellaneous accidental purposes requiring dispatch, as it proves for a sort of universal supervision and universal subjection. They are to report weekly, these new committee men, but to deliberate in secret. Their number is nine, firm patriots all, Danton one of them, renewable every month, yet why not re-elect them if they turn out well? The flower of the matter is that they are but nine, that they sit in secret. An insignificant looking thing at first, this committee, but with a principle of growth in it. Forwarded by fortune, by internal Jacobin energy, it will reduce all committees and the convention itself to mute obedience, the six ministers to six assiduous clerks, and work its will on the earth and under heaven for a season. A committee of public salvation, whereat the world still shrieks and shudders. If we call that revolutionary tribunal a sword, which sans calotism has provided for itself, then let us call the law of the maximum a provender scrip or haversack, wherein, better or worse, some ration of bread may be found. It is true, political economy, Girondin free trade, and all law of supply and demand are hereby hurled topsy-turvy, but what help? Patriotism must live. The cupidity of farmers seems to have no bowels. Wherefore this law of the maximum, fixing the highest price of grains, is with infinite effort got passed, and shall gradually extend itself into a maximum for all manner of comestibles and commodities, with such scrambling and topsy-turving as may be fancied. For now, if, for example, the farmer will not sell, the farmer shall be forced to sell. An accurate account of what grain he has shall be delivered in to the constituted authorities, Let him see that he say not too much, for in that case his rents, taxes and contributions will rise proportionally. Let him see that he say not too little, for on or before a set day, we shall suppose in April, less than one-third of this declared quantity must remain in his barns, more than two-thirds of it must have been thrashed and sold. One can denounce him and raise penalties. By such inextricable overturning of all commercial relation will sans calotism keep life in, since not otherwise. On the whole, as Camille Desmoulins says once, while the sans calots fight, the messieurs must pay. So they come ampo progressif, ascending taxes, which consume with fast increasing veracity superfluous revenue of men. Beyond fifty pounds a year you are not exempt, Rising into the hundreds, you bleed freely. Into the thousands and tens of thousands, you bleed gushing. Also there come requisitions. There comes forced loan of a milliard, some fifty million sterling, which, of course, they that have must lend. Unexampled enough, it has grown to be no country for the rich, this but a country for the poor. And then if one fly, what steads it? Dead in law nay, kept alive fifty years yet for their accursed behoof. In this manner, therefore, it goes, topsy-turving, sa-erraring, and withal there is endless sale of emigrant national property, there is cambon with endless cornucopia of assignats. The trade and finance of sans calotism and how with maximum and baker's cues with cupidity, hunger, denunciation and paper money it led its galvanic life and began and ended remains the most interesting of all chapters in political economy still to be written. All which things are they not clean against formula? 
O oh, Girondin friends, it is not a republic of the virtues we are getting, but only a republic of the strengths, virtuous and other. End of Book 3, Chapter 5《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume Three: The Guillotine, Book Three: The Girondins, Chapter Six: The Traitor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book Three, Chapter Six: The Traitor. But du Maurier, with his fugitive host, with his King Ludovicus or King Philippus, there lies the crisis. There hangs the question. Revolution prodigy or counter revolution? One wide shriek covers that northeast region. Soldiers full of rage, suspicion, and terror flock hither and thither. Du Maurier, the many counselled, never off horseback, knows now no counsel that were not worse than none. The counsel, namely, of joining himself with Coburg, marching to Paris, extinguishing Jacobinism, and with some new King Ludovicus or King Philippus wresting the Constitution of 1791. Is wisdom quitting Du Maurier, the herald of fortune, quitting him? Principle, faith, political or other, beyond a certain faith of mess rooms and honour of an officer, had him not to quit. At any rate, his quarters in the burg of saint Amand his headquarters in the village of saint amand des Boux, a short way off, have become a bedlam. National representatives, Jacobin missionaries, are riding and running of the three towns, Lille, Valenciennes and even Condé, which du Maurier wanted to snatch for himself, not one can be snatched. Your captain is admitted, but the town gate is closed on him, and then the prison gate, and his men wander about the ramparts. Couriers gallop breathless. Men wait or seem waiting to assassinate, to be assassinated. Battalions nigh frantic with such suspicion and uncertainty, with Viva la République and Sauve qui peut rush this way and that. Ruin and desperation in the shape of Coburg lying entrenched close by. Dame Genlis and her fair princess d'Orléans find this burg of saint Amand no fit place for them. Du Maurier's protection has grown worse than none. Tough Jean Lee, one of the toughest women, a woman, as it were, with nine lives in her, whom nothing will beat, she packs her bandboxes clear for flight in a private manner. Her beloved princess she will leave here, with the prince Chartres Egalité, her brother. In the cold grey of the April morning we find her accordingly established in her hired vehicle on the street of saint Amand, postilions just cracking their whips to go, when behold the young princely brother, struggling hitherward, hastily calling, bearing the princess in his arms. Hastily he has clutched the poor young lady up in her very nightgown, nothing saved in her goods except the watch from the pillow. With brotherly despair he flings her in among the bandboxes, into jean Lee's chaise, into jean Lee's arms. Leave her not in the name of mercy and heaven. A shrill scene, but a brief one. The postilions crack and go. Ah, whither? through by-roads and broken hill-passes, seeking their way with lanterns after nightfall, through perils and Coburg Austrians and suspicious French nationals, finally into Switzerland, safe though nigh moneyless. The brave young Egalité has a most wild morrow to look for, but now only himself to carry through it. For indeed, over at that village named of the mud-baths, saint Damon des boux matters are still worse. About four o'clock on Tuesday afternoon, the 2nd of April, 1793, two couriers come galloping as if for life. Mon General, four national representatives, war minister at their head, are posting hitherward from Valenciennes, are close at hand, with what intents one may guess. While the couriers are yet speaking, war minister and national representatives, old Camus the archivist for chief speaker of them, arrive. Hardly has Mon General had time to order out the Hazard Regiment de Berchigny than it take rank and wait nearby in case of accident. And so enter war minister Bournonville with an embrace of friendship, for he is an old friend. Enter archivist Camus and the other three following him. They produce papers invite the general to the bar of the convention, merely to give an explanation or two. 
the general finds it unsuitable, not to say impossible, and that the service will suffer. Then comes reasoning, the voice of the old archivist getting loud. Vain to reason loud with this du Maurier, he answers mere angry irreverences. And so, amid plumed staff officers, very gloomy looking, in jeopardy and uncertainty, these poor national messengers debate and consult, retire and re-enter for the space of some two hours, without effect. Whereupon archivist Camus, getting quite loud, proclaims in the name of the National Convention, for he has the power to do it, that General du Maurier is arrested. Will you obey the national mandate, General? Pardon ce moment-ci. Not at this particular moment, answers the General, also aloud, then glancing the other way, utters certain unknown vocables in a mandatory manner, seemingly a German word of command. Hassas clutch the four national representatives and Bernonville, the war minister, pack them out of the apartment, out of the village, over the lines to Coburg, in two chaises that very night, as hostages, prisoners, to lie long in Maastricht and Austrian strongholds. Yakta Estalia. This night du Maurier prints his proclamation. This night and the morrow, the du Maurier army, in such darkness visible and rage of semi-desperation as there is, shall meditate what the general is doing, what they themselves will do in it. Judge whether this Wednesday was of halcyon nature for anyone. But on the Thursday morning we discern du Maurier with small escort, with chartres égalité and a few staff officers ambling along the Condé highway. Perhaps they are for Condé and trying to persuade the garrison there. At all events they are for an interview with Coburg, who waits in the woods by appointment in that quarter. Nigh the village of Dume, three national battalions, a set of men always full of Jacobinism, sweep past us, marching rather swiftly, seemingly in mistake by a way we had not ordered. The general dismounts, steps into a cottage, a little from the wayside, will give them right order in writing. Hark! What strange growling is heard! What barkings are heard! Loud yells of traitors! Of arrest! The national battalions have wheeled round, are emitting shot. Mount du Maurier and spring for life. Du Maurier and staff strike the spurs in deep, vault over ditches into the fields which prove to be morasses, sprawl and plunge for life, bewhistled with curses and lead. Sunk to the middle, with or without horses, several servants killed, they escape out of shot range to General Mack, the Austrians' quarters. Nay, they return on the morrow to saint Damond and faithful foreign Bersigny. But what boots it? The artillery has all revolted, is jingling off to Valenciennes. All have revolted, are revolting, except only foreign Bersigny. To the extent of some poor 1,500, none will follow du Maurier against France, an indivisible republic. Du Maurier's occupation's gone. Such an instinct of frenihood and sanscolotism dwells in these men. They will follow no du Maurier, nor Lafayette, nor any mortal on such errand. Shriek may be of sauf qui peut, but will also be of vive la république. New national representatives arrive. New General Dampierre, soon killed in battle. New General Costine, the agitated hosts draw back to some camp of Famar, make head against Coburg as they can. And so du Maurier is in the Austrian quarters. His drama ended in this rather sorry manner. A most shifty, wiry man, one of heaven's Swiss that wanted only work. Fifty years of unnoticed toil and valour, one year of toil and valour not unnoticed, but seen of all countries and centuries, then thirty other years again unnoticed of memoir writing, English pension, scheming and projecting to no purpose. Adieu, thou Swiss of heaven, worthy to have been something else. His staff go different ways. Brave young Egalite reaches Switzerland and the Jean Lee cottage with a strong crab stick in his hand, a strong heart in his body. His princedom is now reduced to that. Egalite the father sat playing whist in his palais Egalite at Paris on the sixth day of this same month of April when a catchpole entered. Citoyen Egalité is wanted at the Convention Committee. Examination requiring arrestment, 
finally requiring imprisonment, transference to Marseille and the castle of Yves. Orléans Dom has sunk in the black waters. Palais Egalité, which was Palais Royal, is like to become Palais National. End of Book 3, Chapter 6《The French Revolution A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 3, The Girondins, Chapter 7, In Fight. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan, Book 3, Chapter 7, In Fight. Our Republic, by paper decree, may be one and indivisible, but what profits it while these things are? Federalists in the Senate, renegados in the army, traitors everywhere. France, all in desperate recruitment since the 10th of March, does not fly to the frontier, but only flies hither and thither. This defection of contemptuous diplomatic du Maurier falls heavy on the fine-spoken, high-sniffing homme d'état whom we consorted with, forms a second epoch in their destinies. Or perhaps, more strictly, we might say, the second Girondin epoch, though little noticed then, began on the day when, in reference to this defection, the Girondins broke with Danton. It was the first day of April. Dumouriez had not yet plunged across the morasses to Coburg, but was evidently meaning to do it, and our commissioners were off to arrest him, when what does the Girondin La Source see good to do but rise and Jesuitically question and insinuate at great length whether a main accomplice of Dumouriez had not probably been Danton? Gironde grins sardonic assent, mountain holds its breath. The figure of Danton, Levasseur says, while this speech went on, was noteworthy. He sat erect with a kind of internal convulsion, struggling to keep itself motionless, his eye from time to time flashing wilder, his lip curling in titanic scorn. La Source, in a fine-spoken attorney manner, proceeds. There is this probability to his mind, and there is that probabilities which press painfully on him, which cast the patriotism of Danton under a painful shade, which painful shade he, La Source, will hope that Danton may find it not impossible to dispel. L'escalera, cries Danton, starting up with clenched right hand, La Source having done, and descends from the mountain like a lava flood, his answer not unready. La Source's probabilities fly like idle dust, but leave a result behind them. Ye were right, friends of the mountain, begins Danton, and I was wrong. There is no peace possible with these men. Let it be war, then. They will not save the Republic with us. It shall be saved without them, saved in spite of them. Really a burst of rude parliamentary eloquence, this, which is still worth reading in the old Moniteur. With firewords, the exasperated, rude titan rives and smites these Girondins. At every hit, the glad mountain utters chorus. Marat, like a musical beast, repeating the last phrase. Lazos's probabilities are gone, but Danton's pledge of battle remains lying. A third epoch, or scene in the Girondin drama, or rather it is but the completion of this second epoch, we reckon from the day when the patience of virtuous Pétion finally boiled over, and the Girondins, so to speak, took up this battle pledge of Danton's and decreed Marat accused. It was the 11th of the same month of April, on some effervescence rising such as often rose, and President had covered himself, mere bedlam now ruling, and Mountain and Gironde were rushing on one another with clenched right hands and even with pistols in them, when, behold, the Gironde in Dupere drew a sword. Shriek of horror rose, instantly quenching all other effervescence at sight of the clear murderous steel whereupon Dupere returned it to the leather again, confessing that he did indeed draw it, being instigated by a kind of sacred madness, saint Fureur, and pistols held at him, but that if he parasitically had chanced to scratch the utmost skin of national representation with it, he too carried pistols, and would have blown his brains out on the spot. But now, in such posture of affairs, 
virtuous Pétion rose next morning to lament these effervescences, this endless anarchy invading the legislative sanctuary itself, and here being growled at and howled at by the mountain, his patience, long tried, did, as we say, boil over, and he spake vehemently, in high key, with foam on his lips. Whence, says Marat, I concluded he had got la rage, the rabidity, or dog madness. Rabidity smites others rabid, so there rises new foam-lipped demand to have anarchists extinguished, and specially to have Marat put under accusation. Send a representative to the Revolutionary Tribunal? Violate the inviability of a representative? Have a care, O oh friends. This poor Marat has faults enough, but against liberty or equality, what fault? That he has loved and fought for it, not wisely but too well? in dungeons and cellars, in pinching poverty, under anathema of men, even so in such fight has he grown so dingy, bleared, even so has his head become a stylites one. Him you will fling to your sword of sharpness, while Coburg and Pitt advance on us, fire-spitting. The mountain is loud, the Gironde is loud and deaf, all lips are foamy. With permanent session of twenty-four hours, with vote by roll call and a deadlift effort, the Gironde carries it. Marat is ordered to the Revolutionary Tribunal to answer for that February paragraph of forestallers at the door lintel with other offences, and, after a little hesitation, he obeys. Thus is Danton's battle pledge taken up. There is, as he said there would be, war without truce or treaty, ni trêve ni composition. Wherefore? Close now with one another, formula and reality, in death grips, and wrestle it out. Both of you cannot live, but only one. End of Book 3, Chapter 7《The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 3, The Girondins, Chapter 8 in Death Grips. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 8. In Death Grips. It proves what strength, were it only of inertia, there is in established formulas, what weakness in nascent realities, and illustrates several things, that this death wrestle should still have lasted some six weeks or more. National business, discussion of the Constitutional Act, for our Constitution should decidedly be got ready, proceeds along with it. We even change our locality. We shift on the 10th of May from the old Salle de Manege into our new hall in the palace, once a king's but now the republics of the Tuileries. Hope and Ruth, flickering against despair and rage, still struggles in the minds of men. It is a most dark, confused death wrestle, this of the six weeks. Formalist frenzy against realist frenzy. Patriotism, egoism, pride, anger, vanity, hope and despair, all raised to the frenetic pitch. Frenzy meets frenzy like dark, clashing whirlwinds. Neither understands the other. The weaker one day will understand that it is very swept down. Girondism is strong as established formula and respectability. Do not as many as 72 of the departments, or say respectable heads of departments, declare for us? Calvados, which loves its bouse, will even rise in revolt, so hint the addresses. Marseille, cradle of patriotism, will rise. Bordeaux will rise, and the Gironde department as one man. In a word, who will not rise were our representation nationale to be insulted, or one hair of a deputy's head harmed? The mountain, again, is strong as reality and audacity. To the reality of the mountain are not all furthersome things possible? A new 10th of August, if needful, nay, a new 2nd of September. But on Wednesday afternoon, 24th day of April, year 1793, what tumult as a fierce jubilee is this? It is Marat returning from Revolutionary Tribunal. A week or more of death peril, and now there is triumphant acquittal. Revolutionary Tribunal can find no accusation against this man. 
And so the eye of history beholds patriotism, which had gloomed unutterable things all week, break into loud jubilee. Embrace its mara, lift him into a chair of triumph, bear him shoulder high through the streets. Shoulder high is the injured people's friend, crowned with an oak garland, amid the wavy sea of red nightcaps, carmagnol jackets, grenadier bonnets and female mob caps, far sounding like a sea. The injured people's friend has here reached his culminating point. He too strikes the stars with his sublime head. But the reader can judge with what face President La Source, he of the painful probabilities who presides in this convention hall, might welcome such jubilee tide when it got thither, and the decreed of accusation floating on the top of it. A national sapper, spokesman on the occasion, says, The people know their friend and love his life as their own. Whosoever wants Marat's head must get the sappers first. La Sauce answered with some vague, painful mumblement, which, says Lavasseur, one could not help tittering at. Patriot sections, volunteers not yet gone to the frontiers, come demanding the purgation of traitors from your own bosom, the expulsion, or even the trial and sentence, of a factious twenty-two. Nevertheless, the Gironde has got its commission of twelve, a commission specially appointed for investigating these troubles of the legislative sanctuary. Let Sanscalotism say what it will, law shall triumph. Old constituent Rabo saint Etienne presides over this commission. It is the last plank whereon a wrecked republic may perhaps still save herself. Rabo and they therefore sit intent, examining witnesses, launching arrestments, looking out into a waste dim sea of troubles, the womb of formula, or perhaps her grave. Enter not that sea, O oh reader. There are dim desolation and confusion, raging women and raging men. Sections come demanding twenty-two, for the number first given by section Bon Conseil still holds, though the name should even vary. Other sections of the wealthier kind come denouncing such demand. Nay, the same section will demand today and denounce the demand tomorrow, according as the wealthier sit or the poorer. Wherefore, indeed, the Girondins declare that all sections shall close at ten in the evening before the working people come, which decree remains without effect. And nightly the mother of patriotism wails doleful, doleful but her eye kindling. And Fournier, la Marécaine, is busy, and the two banker frays, and Valet, apostle of liberty, the bull voice of Marquis saint Rouge is heard. And shrill women vociferate from all galleries, the convention ones and downwards. Nay, a central committee of all the forty-eight sections looms forth, huge and dubious, sitting dim in the arshvesh, sending resolutions, receiving them, a centre of the sections, in dread deliberation as to a new 10th of August. One thing we will specify to throw light on many. The aspect under which, seen through the eyes of these Girondin twelve, or even seen through one's own eyes, the patriotism of the softer sex presents itself. There are female patriots, whom the Girondins call Megueras, and count to the extent of eight thousand, with serpent hair all out of curl, who have changed the distaff for the dagger. They are of the society called brotherly, fraternelle, say sisterly, which meets under the roof of the Jacobins. Two thousand daggers or so have been ordered, doubtless, for them. They rush to Versailles to raise more women, but the Versailles women will not rise. Nay, behold, in National Garden of Tuileries, Demoiselle Theronia herself is become as brown-locked Diana, were that possible, attacked by her own dogs, or she-dogs. The Demoiselle, keeping her carriage, is for liberty indeed, as she has full well shown, but then for liberty with respectability, whereupon these serpent-haired extreme sheep-patriots do now fasten on her, tatter her, shamefully fustigate her in their shameful way, almost fling her into the garden ponds had not help intervened. Help, alas, to small purpose, the poor demoiselle's head and nervous system, none of the soundest, is so tattered and fluttered that it will never recover, but flutter worse and worse till it crack 
and within year and day we hear of her in madhouse and straight waistcoat which proves permanent. Such brown-locked figure did flutter and inarticulately jabber and gesticulate, little able to speak the obscure meaning it had through some segment of that eighteenth century of time. She disappears here from the revolution and public history for evermore. Another thing we will not again specify, yet again beseech the reader to imagine, the reign of fraternity and perfection. Imagine, we say, O oh reader, that the millennium was struggling on the threshold, and yet not so much as groceries could be had, owing to traitors. With what impetus would a man strike traitors in that case? Ah, thou canst not imagine it, thou hast thy groceries safe in the shops, and little or no hope of a millennium ever coming. But indeed, as to the temper there was in men and women, does not this one fact say enough? The height suspicion had risen to. Preternatural, we often called it, seemingly in the language of exaggeration, but listen to the cold deposition of witnesses. Not a musical patriot can blow himself a snatch of melody from the French horn, sitting mildly pensive on the housetop, but Mercier will recognise it to be a signal which one plotting committee is making to another. Distraction has possessed harmony herself, lurks in the sound of Marseillaise and Sa Ira. Louvet, who can see as deep into a millstone as the most, discerns that we shall be invited back to our old hall of the Manege by a deputation, and then the anarchists will massacre twenty-two of us as we walk over. It is Pitt and Coburg, the gold of Pitt. Poor Pitt, they little know what work he has with his own friends of the people getting them bespied, beheaded, their habeas corpuses suspended, and his own social order and strong boxes kept tight, to fancy him raising mobs among his neighbours. But the strangest fact connected with French, or indeed with human suspicion, is perhaps this of Camille Desmoulins. Camille's head, one of the clearest in France, has got itself so saturated through every fibre with preternaturalism of suspicion that looking back on that 12th of July, 1789, when the thousands rose round him, yelling responsive at his word in the Palais Royal Garden, and took cockades, he finds it explicable only on this hypothesis that they were all hired to do it and set on by the foreign and other plotters. It was not for nothing, says Camille, with insight, that this multitude bursts up round me when I spoke. No, not for nothing. Behind, around, before, it is one huge preternatural puppet play of plots, pit pulling the wires. Almost I conjecture that I, Camille, myself am a plot and wooden with wires. The force of insight could no further go. Be this as it will, history remarks that the Commission of Twelve, now clear enough as to the plots, and luckily having got the threads of them all by the end, as they say, are launching mandates of arrest rapidly in these May days, and carrying matters with a high hand, resolute that the sea of troubles shall be restrained. What chief patriot, section president even, is safe? They can arrest him, tear him from his warm bed, because he has made irregular section arrestments. They arrest Valet, Apostle of Liberty. They arrest Procureur Substitute Hébert, Père Duchesne, a magistrate of the people sitting in Town Hall, who with high solemnity of martyrdom takes leave of his colleagues, prompt he to obey the law, and solemnly acquiescent disappears into prison. The swifter fly the sections, energetically demanding him back, demanding not arrestment of popular magistrates, but of a traitorous twenty-two. Section comes flying after section, defiling energetic with their Cambyses vein of oratory. Nay, the commune itself comes, with mere pash at its head, and with question not of a bear and the twenty-two alone, but with this ominous old question made new. Can you save the Republic, or must we do it? To whom President Max Enard makes fiery answer, if by fatal chance in any of those tumults which since the 10th of March are ever returning, Paris were to lift a sacrilegious finger against the national representation, France would rise as one man in never imagined vengeance, and shortly the traveller would ask on which side of the Seine Paris had stood. Whereat the mountain bellows only louder, and every gallery, 
expatriate Paris boiling round. And Girondin Valaise has nightly conclaves at his house, sends billets, come punctually and well armed, for there is to be business. And Megara women perambulate the streets with flags, with lamentable allelu, and the convention doors are obstructed by roaring multitudes. Fine spoken homme d'etat are hustled, maltreated as they pass. Marat will apostrophize you in such death peril and say, Thou too art of them. If Roland ask leave to quit Paris, there is order of the day. What help? Substitute a bear, apostle valet must be given back to be crowned with oak garlands. The commission of twelve in a convention overwhelmed with roaring sections is broken. Then on the morrow, in a convention of rallied Girondins, is reinstated. Dim chaos, or the sea of troubles, is struggling through all its elements, writhing and chafing towards some creation. End of Book 3, Chapter 8《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 3, The Girondins, Chapter 9, Extinct. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 9, Extinct. Accordingly, on Friday, the 31st of May, 1793, there comes forth into the summer sunlight one of the strangest scenes. Mayor Pache, with municipality, arrives at the Tuileries Hall of Convention, sent for, Paris being invisible ferment, and gives the strangest news. How, in the grey of this morning, while we sat permanent in town hall, watchful for the Commonweal, there entered, precisely as on the 10th of August, some ninety-six extraneous persons, who declared themselves to be in a state of insurrection to be plenipotentiary commissioners from the 48 sections, sections or members of the sovereign people, all in a state of insurrection, and further that we, in the name of said sovereign insurrection, were dismissed from office. How we thereupon laid off our sashes and withdrew into the adjacent saloon of liberty. How in a moment or two we were called back and reinstated, the sovereign pleasing to think us still worthy of confidence whereby, having taken new oath of office, we on a sudden find ourselves insurrectionary magistrates, with extraneous committee of ninety-six sitting by us, and a citoyen Henriot, one of whom some accuse of Septemberism, is made generalissimo of the National Guard, and since six o'clock the toxins ring and the drums beat. Under which peculiar circumstances what would an august National Convention please to direct us to do? Yes, there's the question. Break the insurrectionary authorities, answers some with vehemence. Vernio, at least, will have the national representatives all die at their post. This is sworn to, with ready, loud acclaim. But as to breaking the insurrectionary authorities, alas, while we yet debate, what sound is that? Sound of the alarm cannon on the Pont Neuf, which it is death by the law to fire without order from us. It does boom off there, nevertheless, sending a sound through all hearts. And the toxins discourse stern music, and Henriot with his armed force has enveloped us. And section succeeds section, the lifelong day, demanding with Cambyses oratory, with a rattle of muskets, that traitors, twenty-two or more, be punished, that the commission of twelve be irrecoverably broken. The heart of the Gironde dies within it. Distant are the seventy-two respectable departments, this fiery municipality is near. Barrere is for a middle course, granting something. The Commission of Twelve declares that, not waiting to be broken, it hereby breaks itself and is no more. Fain would reporter Rabot speak his and its last words, but he is bellowed off. Too happy that the twenty-two are still left unviolated, Vernio, carrying the laws of refinement to a great length, moves to the amazement of some that the sections of Paris have deserved well of their country. Whereupon, at a late hour of the evening, the deserving sections retire to their respective places of abode. Barre shall report on it. With busy quill and brain he sits, secluded. For him no sleep to-night. 
Friday the last of May has ended in this manner. The sections have deserved well, but ought they not to deserve better? Faction and Girondism is struck down for the moment and consents to be a nullity. But will it not at another favourable a moment rise, still feller, and the Republic have to be saved in spite of it? So reasons patriotism, still permanent. So reasons the figure of Marat, visible in the dim section world on the morrow. To the conviction of men, and so at even tide of Saturday, when Berea had just got it all varnished in the course of the day, and his report was setting off in the evening mailbags, Toxen peals out again. General is beating, armed men taking station in the Place Vendôme and elsewhere for the night, supplied with provisions and liquor. There, under the summer stars, will they wait this night. What is to be seen and to be done? Henriot and Town Hall giving due signal. The convention, at sound of General, hastens back to its hall, but to the number only of a hundred, and does little business, puts off business till the morrow. If the Girondins do not stir out thither, the Girondins are abroad seeking beds. Poor Rabot on the morrow morning, returning to his post with Louvet and some others, through streets all in ferment, wrings his hands, ejaculating, Illa Suprema Dies! It has become Sunday, the second day of June, year 1793 by the old style, by the new style, year one of liberty, equality, fraternity. We have got to the last scene of all that ends this history of the Girondin senatorship. It seems doubtful whether any terrestrial convention had ever met in such circumstances as this national one now does. Toxin is peeling, barriers shut, all Paris is on the gaze or under arms. As many as a hundred thousand under arms they count, national force and the armed volunteers who should have flown to the frontiers in La Vendée but would not, treason being unpunished, and only flew hither and thither. So many, steady under arms, environ the national Tuileries in garden. There are horse, foot, artillery, sappers with beards, the artillery one can see with their camp furnaces in this national garden, heating bullets red and their matches lighted. Onrio in plumes rides amidst a plumed staff. All posts and issues are safe. Reserves lie out as far as the wood of Bologna, the choicest patriots nearest the scene. One other circumstance we will note, that a careful municipality, liberal of camp furnaces, has not forgotten provision cards. No member of the sovereign need now go home to dinner, but can keep rank, plentiful victual circulating unsought. Does not this people understand insurrection? Ye, not uninventive gouaches. Therefore, let a national representation, mandatories of the sovereign, take thought of it. Expulsion of your twenty-two and your commission of twelve. We stand here till it be done. Deputation after deputation, in ever stronger language, comes with that message. Barère proposes a middle course. Will not perhaps the inculpated deputies consent to withdraw voluntarily, to make a generous demission and self-sacrifice for the sake of one's country? Ina, repentant of that search on which Riverbank Paris stood, declares himself ready to demit. Ready also is TDM Fatche, old Dessau of the Bastille, vieux radateur, old dotard, as Marat calls him, is still readier. On the contrary, Langevinet, the Breton, declares that there is one man who never will demit voluntarily, but will protest to the uttermost while a voice is left him. And he, accordingly, goes on protesting, amid rage and clangour, Legendre crying at last, Langevinet, come down from the tribune or I will fling thee down, ou je te jette en bas, for matters are come to extremity. Nay, they do clutch hold of Langevinet, certain zealous mountain men, but cannot fling him down, for he cramps himself on the railing, and his clothes get torn. Brave senator, worthy of pity. Neither will Barbaroux demit. He has sworn to die at his post, and will keep that oath. Whereupon the galleries all rise with explosion, brandishing weapons, some of them, and rush out, saying, Allons, then, we must save our country! 
Such a session as this of Sunday, the 2nd of June. Churches fill over Christian Europe and then empty themselves, but this convention empties not the while. A day of shrieking contention, of agony, humiliation and tearing of coat skirts, illa suprema dies. Round stand Henriot and his hundred thousand, copiously refreshed from tray and basket. Nay, he is distributing five francs apiece. We Girondins saw it with our eyes. Five francs to keep them in heart. And destruction of armed riot encumbers our borders, jangles at our bar. We are prisoners in our own hall. Bishop Gregoire could not get out for a Besswan actuel without four gendarmes to wait on him. What is the character of a national representative become? And now the sunlight falls yellower on western windows and the chimney tops are flinging longer shadows. The refreshed hundred thousand, nor their shadows, stir not. What to resolve on? Motion rises superfluous, one would think, that the convention go forth in a body, ascertain with its own eyes whether it is free or not. Lo, therefore, from the eastern gate of the Tuileries, a distressed convention issuing, handsome Hérault Seychelles at their head, he with hat on, in sign of public calamity, the rest bareheaded, towards the gate of the Carousel, wondrous to see, towards Henriot and his plumed staff. In the name of the National Convention, make way! Not an inch of the way does Henriot make. I receive no orders till the sovereign, yours and mine, has been obeyed. The convention presses on. Henrio prances back with his staff, some fifteen paces. To arms! Cannoneers! To your guns! Flashes out his puissant sword, as the staff all do, and the hussars all do. Cannoneers brandish the lit match. Infantry present arms, alas, in the level way, as if for firing. Hatted Hero leads his distressed flock through their pinfold of a Tuileries again, across the garden to the gate on the opposite side. Here is Foyon's terrace. Alas, there is our old salle de manege, but neither at this gate of the Pont Tournant is there egress. Try the other, and the other. No egress. We wander disconsolate through armed ranks, who indeed salute with Live the Republic, but also with Die the Gironde. Other such sight in the year one of liberty the westering sun never saw. And now, behold, Marat meets us, for he lagged in this suppliant procession of ours. He has got some hundred elect patriots at his heels. He orders us, in the sovereign's name, to return to our place and do as we are bidden and bound. The convention returns. Does not the convention, says Couton, with a singular power of face, see that it is free? None but friends round it. The convention, overflowing with friends and armed sectioneers, proceeds to vote as bidden. Many will not vote, but remain silent. Some one or two protest in words. The mountain has a clear unanimity. Commission of twelve and the denounced twenty-two, to whom we add ex-ministers Clavier and Lebrun. These, with some slight extempore alterations, this or that orator proposing, but Marat disposing, are voted to be under arrestment in their own houses. Brissot, Buzo, Vernio, Guade, Louvre, Jeansonne, Barbaro, La Sauce, Lanjuine, Rabo, thirty two by the tale, all that we have known as Girondins and more than we have known. They, under the safeguard of the French people, by and by, under the safeguard of two gendarmes each, shall dwell peaceably in their own houses as non senators till further order. Herewith ends séance of Sunday, the 2nd of June, 1793. At ten o'clock, under mild stars, the hundred thousand, their work well finished, turn homewards. This same day, Central Insurrection Committee has arrested Madame Roland, imprisoned her in the Abbey. Roland has fled, no one knows whither. Thus fell the Girondins, by insurrection, and became extinct as a party, not without a sigh from most historians. The men were men of parts, of philosophic culture, decent behaviour, not condemnable in that they were pedants and had not better parts, not condemnable but most unfortunate. 
They wanted a republic of the virtues wherein themselves should be head, and they could only get a republic of the strengths wherein others than they were head. For the rest, Paré shall make report of it. The night concludes with a civic promenade by torchlight. Surely the true reign of fraternity is now not far? End of Book 3, Chapter 9